Representatives, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table doc documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet? Not this one. Oh, no, of course there isn't. Uh, I call the clerk. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Now, President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of a private senator's bill as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? No. Our leave is not granted, Senator Birmingham. President, pursuant to contingent notice of motion standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the consideration of the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023. President, it is the case that, uh, that in, as soon as this debate concludes, we will move on to the Australian Greens private senator's time, as scheduled in the normal routine of business. That is private senator's time that has been respected, notwithstanding the variation of hours that was pushed through by the government yesterday. Remarkably, though, in that variation of hours pushed through by the government yesterday, there were actually two different versions of the variation of hours. There was the initially circulated version that also would have preserved the private senator's time for opposition business tomorrow morning, during which time the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill was to be considered. But then, before it came to be voted upon, there was a second version of the government's hours variation that came through. And lo and behold, in that second version, the opposition's private senator's time got knocked out. And so the Greens' private senator's time was preserved for today, but the opposition's private senator's time was eliminated for tomorrow. President, this is not the way in which this Senate chamber should be treated. An important principle of this Senate chamber is that across the chamber there is respect for non-government business having an opportunity to be considered for non-government business to be able to be debated. And that respect should be extended to all non-government parties, not just those whom the government chooses to do deals with. It is one thing for the government to have done its deal on the safeguards legislation right. with the Greens. Of course, we're waiting to see fully the extent of the amendments, substantial amendments, substantial amendments that weren't available last night as we debated the bill right through until after 4 a.m. We still did not get to see what the amendments were that actually delivers that deal. But then they also dealt away the usual proceedings and courtesies of private senators' time in this place. And remarkably, despite reasonable approaches from Senator Rustin and the opposition, they have not agreed to reinstate that. It wouldn't have changed the deadline, the hard marker that actually sees conclusion of the safeguards legislation. That's already established, and the motion before the Senate would not change that deadline. That's right. It would simply reinstate the opportunity for Senator Dunningham's bill, the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023, to be called on in the normal, ordinary routine of business at 9am tomorrow morning to be considered for the normal, ordinary routine, one hour and ten minutes 
tomorrow morning, as private senators' time ordinarily would be. There is nothing but routine in what the opposition is proposing here. And it should not take a suspension of standing orders motion for us to ask for the routine, for us to ask for normal courtesies to be extended. Senator Dunningham's bill is a straightforward one. It deserves to be debated. It deserves even more to be debated in the context of the safeguards mechanism that this chamber is considering, because Senator Dunningham's bill will bring greater transparency to electricity price reporting. It will bring greater scrutiny to the way in which energy markets and electricity prices are considered. And it's a very important proposal, given the other matters that are before this Senate. So, President, I would urge the Greens, who are about to have their one hour and ten minutes of private senators' time this morning, to reflect and provide the same. No, we're not taking their time. They're still going to get one hour and ten minutes, Senator Gallagher. That is, uh, that is the one hour ten minutes guaranteed in the way in which it is established. It's not a hard marker uh, that changes this. The Greens will still get their one hour ten minutes. We were very considerate and actually thought of that before moving the suspension motion. And I urge the Greens to think and to show similar courtesies to other non-government parties. That the Labor Party may not be willing to show those courtesies, but to show similar courtesies to other non-government parties so that we can receive the same opportunity for private senators' time as you are receiving. I would certainly urge those across the crossbench to think about the fact that they ought to provide for this, because at some stage, at some stage it could happen to them, Senator Cash. Uh, and so, uh, indeed, to Senators Lambie and Tyrrell, uh, to Senator David Pocock, uh, to the One Nation Senators Hanson and Roberts, I urge all of them support this motion because it does nothing but ensure the normal thank proceedings you, proceed. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Um, the government won't be supporting this suspension, and I'll work, I'll work through some reasons why. As we've seen this morning, and we saw it last night, this is uh, the big fight for those opposite, and they will do whatever they can to delay getting to safeguards and dealing with that bill. So let's just be very upfront and open about that. You know, we know we know what you're doing. It's been clear. Yeah, we'll all sit all night. We'll all sit all night. That's why we set up the hours motion the way we did, and that's why we sat till quarter past four this morning. So this is a tactic to delay getting to safeguards. Firstly, um, so you've worked out that you can eat in half an hour of time, half an hour of time half an hour of time and then we'll go to private centres business and then we'll get to safeguards and then you'll delay through committee stage. I have no Order. doubt that that's how the day... Order. Yes, yes, there will be questions and there will be delay. So let's be clear on that. On the second one, on, on the, my second point is we tabled... We um, uh, put a motion on the table yesterday. I had no contact and we didn't debate it for three hours. We gave plenty of time. No one from the opposition came and engaged on that motion with us. Um, now that's a decision that you, you obviously took, but well, you had no, you had no um, approach to the government about any, any part of that motion, and so now you don't like what's passed when you didn't engage at all. Now, on the third point, oh dear, uh, Senator Mr. Henderson, please resume your seat, Senator Henderson. Um, uh, um, on a point of order, the standing orders provide that the comments of all senators must be made through the chair. And in making a point of order, I would ask you to ask Senator Gallagher not to reflect on me. Thank you. Uh, I didn't hear a ref any reflection there, Senator Henderson. Um, and Senator Henderson, I'm dealing with your point of order. Please resume your seat. Uh, the minister is making general comments. Uh, all senators, one, need to. One need to listen respectfully and quietly. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. I will note that when your leader was on his feet, there was silence on this side of the chamber. And the minute the minister got up, uh, the noise began, and I already had to call the left of the parliament to order several times. I think the minister is directing her comments to the chair. I will listen carefully, and I thank you for your point of order. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, President. And, and um, you know, 
I deal with a fair level of interjections from those opposites, so thank you for your protection on that. I had noticed that they had been quite disorderly in the, my original uh, remarks, um, but uh, thank you very much for drawing that to their attention. Um, third point. If there is good progress today in committee stage, by the time we get to the end of that today, well, i.e. we have dealt with some amendments, we are very open to giving Private senators, time tomorrow. Order. Most disorderly. I mean, I know we've been all been here, and we're going to be scratchy today. But I've only got a couple of minutes. On if we make good progress, i.e., we are dealing with the amendments, and we're not just having a long filibuster from all of those opposite. Then we are very open to facilitating private senators' time tomorrow morning. But we are not in a position to make that decision now because if we see what uh, we have been advised we will see, you will just take that time tomorrow to delay dealing with safeguards again. So I think it's a very reasonable point. Now that the Senate has expressed a view on the hours motion, which we did when we passed it yesterday, that if we are able to provide that hour tomorrow and still allow people to put their amendments and have, have the debate over those amendments, then we give you our commitment that we will facilitate that as a sign of good faith. But we're not at that position yet because we don't know how today is going to roll. And if last night was any kind of measure of how we're going to do that, it's not looking that crash hot, to be honest. So I would say to those opposite, uh, work with us, even though we accept you oppose the bill and think the sky is going to fall in on all of what we heard last night. Work with us to facilitate the committee stage, and then there is no concern at all about private senators' uh, time being facilitated by the government uh, tomorrow. But the Senate has taken a view on the motion yesterday that we want to prioritise this bill. Uh, we want it through. We had to put some management around it because we know that this was not going to be smoothly facilitated through the parliament. No matter how many hours we put on it, um, we would have been um, seeing the delaying tactics from those opposite. And we, we saw that in the strength of the, of the uh, second reading remarks last night. So if we, as I said, um, you know, engage with us on the hours motion didn't happen. Delaying getting to safeguards today, so it's not a good sign of where we're going to end up. And three, if we get to where we need to get to at a reasonable time tonight, um, then there is no issue. We will absolutely, totally, and very happily facilitate uh, private senators' uh, time for the opposition tomorrow. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we deal with this bill, that everyone has the opportunity to put their amendments, to have their say, and that we are able to deal with that by. Uh, 1 p.m. tomorrow, and I think changing the motion in advance of that will put at risk an orderly passage of that bill. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, uh, on the matter of the suspension, the Greens will not be supporting the suspension. How, however, if you want support, you should be quiet and listen. Um, uh, well, if you, if you want to work with people, you show some respect. Um, order. I don't think so. Uh, Senator Cash, I've just called order and you've continued to interject. Please continue, Senator Hanson. Young. Thank you. Um, the Greens will not be able to support the suspension, but uh, I do uh, accept uh, that uh, in this place we do need to be able to provide space for non-government uh, senators to have a debate on issues that are important to them. And I would urge uh, the Leader of the Opposition and uh, his front bench team to uh, consider the uh, offer from the government to help facilitate in an orderly manner uh, the safeguard uh, committee stage over the next uh, you know, 12 hours. And then uh, hopefully we can get to a position where tomorrow that private member's time can be reinstated. Um, I think it's absolutely uh, essential to ensure that you know, the Senate does have time uh, for private senators' space and debate. It, it's a fundamental part of this chamber. Um, but 
Uh, what I've seen over the last 24 hours is delay after delay after delay uh, tactics to put off the safeguard legislation, um, just like we saw for the last decade uh, when uh, the uh, coalition was in government, delay after delay after delay on taking action on the climate crisis. And we can't continue to put that at risk. Uh, that is why we have put in place uh, in this uh, chamber a, a routine of business, and we should, uh, we should stick to that. Uh, if there is an opportunity to uh, amend for tomorrow morning, I'm very open to it. I'm very open to it, and I'm happy to keep talking with the opposition about that. That's why I won't support the suspension now, but I am happy to consider the motion uh, later in the day. Um, but I would also point this out. Anyone who is listening, if you want to know what the opposition's view is on the world, go back and listen to some of the speeches that were uh, in here at 3 a.m. Uh, this morning, because there's not an awful lot of thought. There's not an awful lot of intellect coming from some people on the benches on this side. Um, all they are doing, and the, the, the sky is falling in, the tinfoil hat brigade is out, and the mouthpiece for the coal and gas industry was in full swing. The lunacy of some of the claims that were being made uh, in the early hours of this morning um, you know, it, in, in some regards, it would be laughable, but we're talking about the survival of the planet. We're talking about the climate and environment crisis that we are in. And rather than taking action, uh, we have uh, members from the other side who, for years, for decades, have held back climate action in this country, still dragging their knuckles along the ground, hoping that someone is listening. Uh, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. And I too rise uh, to support uh, the motion moved by Senator Birmingham. It's a very simple motion. Uh, and uh, I, 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 Genuinely, for those of you who believe in democracy, yeah, right. for those of you who believe in the orderly running of the chamber, yep. for those of you who are not members of the government, that's this right. is all about you. This is all about you, as Senator Birmingham said. This is not about the opposition. Yes, the motion is in relation to our private senator's time tomorrow. But this is not about the opposition. This is about the proper functioning mm. of this chamber. Mm. This is about ensuring that those who are not in government, and that includes the well, I was going to say it includes the Australian Australian Greens, but I, I actually um, I reject what I just said myself. Good God, <laughs> it is currently the green tail wagging the red dog. Um, I withdraw exactly that comment. This is actually about the proper functioning of the chamber. Yep. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about the fact that we are trying to delay the passage of this bill. Let us be very clear, Senator, Birmingham mo Senator Birmingham's motion has nothing to do with the passage of this bill. Mm. We sat until 4.13 a.m. this morning. It is now 9.17 a.m. We were happy to sit all the way through last night and all the way into this morning, President, to ensure that we all had an opportunity, an adequate opportunity, to give a second reader on this. We are more than happy, and in fact, I expect there's a good chance that we will be here tomorrow at this time as we proceed through the committee stage. Yep. Again, this bill will pass. A deal has been done. Yes. But this is an incredibly important bill that deserves to be questioned. But at the same time, that does not mean that you throw out democracy. That does not mean that you just throw away the Senate order of business and say, we'll dispose of that, we'll dispose of that. We won't allow those who are not in government an opportunity to actually raise an issue. It's only a short opportunity, it's only one hour and ten minutes. A short opportunity to raise what is and properly debate what is a very important bill that has been put forward by Senator Dunningham. I challenge anyone in this place to actually say that private senators' time is not an important part of a Senate sitting week. Those of us who care about democracy, and I would hope that is each and every one of us in this place, but I have to say, if Senator Birmingham's motion is not supported, uh, those who are voting no may actually want to question whether or not they do believe that this place should operate in a democratic manner. 
We do need to see adequate time set aside for private senators' business. Yesterday, that appeared to be OK. And then suddenly it all changes. The dirty deal's done. The Greens get what they want. It's OK if it's the Greens' private senator's time. I challenge the Greens. Can you give us your private senator's time today? There you go. And then we'll argue as to whether you want to actually lose your private senator's time tomorrow. Gosh, I bet that wouldn't happen. Why? Because the deal has been done. One of the things that the Australian Parliament does and the Australian Senate does is to make and change laws. The government obviously gets its chance to introduce bills. We debate those bills, sometimes not in a timely fashion, unfortunately, or not with adequate time. But the opposition and those who are not in government they get limited opportunity to bring forward matters that are of importance to them. And that is what private senators' time is all about. And that's why it is not good enough for the government of the day, in conjunction with the green tail wagging the red dog, to ride roughshod over the processes of the Senate. This is all about good process. This is all about ensuring that those who are not in government, excluding the Australian Greens, because technically they are in government, uh, given the fact that they'll jump shortly and they will have an opportunity this morning, one hour and ten minutes, to actually debate a matter that is of importance to them. Now, I may not agree that the matter is of importance to them, but it's private senators' time, and they have a right to debate their business, just as I would have thought any other person not in government has a right that is about to be denied to them to ensure the proper functioning of this place. Senator Cash, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. And I rise to support uh, the suspension motion and the right of every single senator to have their say, for dissenting voices to be expressed in this chamber, and to remind senators on all sides of this chamber that that is supposed to be what the Senate is actually about, where the diversity of the views that exist within our democracy have a space and a place to be expressed. But what you've heard this morning uh, in speaking to this suspension motion is that some voices, some senators, some views are more equal than others under the new regime of the Labor Party and the Greens in government. We accept, obviously, the deal has been done. The legislation will be passed. Uh, we also accept that that means we have to stay up till 4 a.m. in the morning to make those contributions, which senators from the National Party and the Liberal Party did last night, and we're happy to do so, because the views that we bring to the debate on this legislation are important to be reflected, heard and said so that when the implications of this decision are felt in the communities that we've been sent to represent uh, are felt in a very real and tangible way in terms of job losses, in terms of skyrocketing energy prices, particularly in rural and regional Australia, it's important that we've done the right thing by our communities and put that on the, the record. But to come here and that deal to actually mean that democracy doesn't matter anymore in the Senate, that the Greens can have their special place in the sun but other non-government senators and parties can't, is just an absolute flouting of what this chamber was set up to do and provide for our democracy. Behaviour like that is commonplace in the other place. I've got, it's a very blunt instrument. I've got the numbers, you don't, we get to do whatever we like. But this has always been the chamber of negotiation. It has always been the chamber of diversity of views and respecting that no matter how far apart we are on the substantive question, we all have the right and indeed the duty to express that in this place. And what the increasing pattern of behaviour from the government, supported by their coalition partners, the Greens, is to shut down dissent, to silence diversity. So there really is only one view able to be expressed out of the Australian Senate. We have processes in place to facilitate both the passage of bills 
and the expression of the diverse views of the Australian people. And, Minister, your government, enabled by the Greens, has sought to shut those diverse views down when you don't have to. You know, this chamber is now hostage. Hostages. We've been gagged, we've been dragged, and now we're being held to ransom for our views and are being silenced along the way. I am not going to back away, and nor is my team going to back away from bringing questions, very real questions, that Minister Farrell couldn't answer about the impact of this deal on rural and reg regional Australians, on our industries, on the 84 per cent of uh, the companies that are actually going to be impacted by the safeguard mechanism. And we've got a lot of questions to ask, because that is actually our job. We are all on the journey to net zero, but you're kidding yourself if the impact of that decision is going to be felt the same across our country and the same across our communities. And our job on this side of the chamber is to understand the implication of the decision. And by holding us hostage, by gagging, dragging us and ransoming our right as senators and how this chamber has functioned in my entire 12 years here, no matter who has been in government, uh, this is an, uh, uh, a very concerning precedent and pattern of behaviour um, from the Labor Party, a very house of, well, you know, I, I find it hypocritical by half if you actually reflected on their contributions to suspension motions uh, over the last nine years. And I don't think our side of politics behaved in this way. We respected the chamber, we respected people's diversity of views, and we allowed you the time to do it. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, President, private senators' time is not a weapon. It is not to be used to bludgeon people into compliance with a vote in a certain way. It is not a weapon. Democracy requires a voice, and we are elected to be the voice of our constituents. How can we be shut down? This is the end of democracy if we do not support Senator Birmingham's motion. And all, everyone on the crossbench needs to realise that we could be next. So this is a very dangerous precedent, and that's why I will be supporting Senator Birmingham's motion. But I disagree with Senator McKenzie because I don't think that um, the behaviour is always respectful in this place, and I don't think that it's necessarily genuine. There are far too many stunts. Nonetheless, uh, complying with the Labor Party wanting to use this as a weapon is something we will not condone. We will be voting with Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, President. Um, and obviously, I too stand in support of suspension that has been moved by Senator Birmingham because the absolute arrogance of those opposite to think that they can come in here and say to us, if we behave ourselves today, we might be able to get some treats tomorrow oh, and have our private you. senator's time. This is not the way a respectful democracy operates. And it is absolutely shameful that you would be so condescending and yep. so arrogant yep. as to treat this chamber as your toy, your plaything to do with as you please. So to, to Senator Gallagher's contribution about uh, you know, that, that if we, we behave ourselves and we get through the amendments that they're going to put forward, then somehow we're going to get a little treat tomorrow oh. and we're going to be allowed to actually take our rightful yep. place in this chamber tomorrow morning for an hour and ten minutes and discuss a very important piece of uh, legislation put forward by Senator Dunham as his right as a non-government yes. senator to have something that's important to him and important to other people in this chamber to be debated. So um, can I say this is extraordinary stuff, and if this is the pattern of behaviour that we're going to see going forward from the government around their arrogance that they will just gag whatever they like, mm -hmm. and the, the, the ridiculousness of the conversation and the contribution of Senator Gallagher was that somehow we were cutting into time. You guys have put the gag in. You already have the approval of this chamber. You got it. You've got the gag in place. It will be completed tomorrow at one o'clock, no matter what we debate between now and then. So it seems absolutely ridiculous. And as Senator Dunningham just raised, 
You are saying yes. if we consider your amendments, well, it would be really good if you actually let us have a look at your amendments because it's pretty hard to consider them when we don't even know what they are. And I would suggest that the reason that you're not providing us with those amendments now is because you know it's going to expose the full extent of your dirty deal with the Greens to get this bill through this place. And we already know from the conversations we've seen in the paper, the comments by Mr Bant in the other place about the fact that he's going to shut down 116 coal and gas projects that are in the pipeline, and yet Mr Bowen tells us, oh no, there's nothing's going to happen here, it's all going to be fine, this is not going to disrupt everything, this is just a nice little tweak that will mean that we've all of a sudden got our emissions targets met in five minutes. Well, I can tell you that is not the case. But the hypocrisy of the Greens to come in here and dictate to us that somehow no. it's OK for them to have their private yeah. senator's time this morning, but it's not OK for us to have ours no. tomorrow. I mean, reflect on this. I would actually suggest you reflect on this, because the deal you've done with the devil actually makes you part of the devil's clan in this instance, because you've now signed yourself up to saying that it's OK for you to actually take advantage of something but you will deny the rest of the non-government senators in this place. That same privilege um, is absolutely <laughs> outrageous. And the fact that we've once again seen, uh, because we have the numbers and we acknowledge that the numbers exist between the Labor Party and the Greens in their coalition government over there, that you're happy to come in here and trash the processes and the protocols of this chamber. I did the respect uh, to the Greens to ask them if they would support us in having an equitable reinstatement of private um, members' time or private senators' time. Um, I thought I did it in a respectful way, disappointed that Senator Hanson Young would come in here and suggest in some way that I wasn't respectful. I think I've always been respectful in my dealings with you, um, Senator Hanson. But this just goes to the fact—I mean, you are in charge of the time in this chamber. You can manage it respectfully, you can manage it by respecting the protocols and the conventions of this place, or you can come in here and you can trash it at your will. But just remember, you will not always be in government, and what you, the damage that you do to this place and this institution will be on your head for decades to come. So I think this is a very sad indictment on this government, their preparedness to do whatever it takes to get their way. It is shameful. So the question is that the suspension motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is, the suspension order as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I call the clerk. General business order of the day, defence amendment, parliamentary approval of overseas service bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Steele, John. Uh, Ms. Uh, President, could we just wait for people to clear the chamber? Uh, yes. If Senators who are participating in this um, debate, please leave the chamber. Right, lovely. Sorry, do you need us? Senator Steele John. Thank you. In beginning the debate on the Greens Bill to require a vote before our troops are deployed overseas, I want to first acknowledge that we are gathered here in this place on the unceded sovereign lands of the Ngunnawal and of the Ngambri people to pay respect to their elders and to acknowledge that that sovereignty fundamentally has never been ceded. And though unceded, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri share with all First Nations people a continued violation of that sovereignty that began at the moment of invasion, at the moment of the beginning of the war for the conquest of this nation. A war whose battlefront swept from Western Australia and the massacres of Pinjarra through to the black lines of Tasmania. A war whose massacre sites, the war whose battle sites, the war whose internment camps were then turned into holiday destinations for those who declared themselves the victors. The war that sat back and allowed the names of those who participated in it, who perpetrated the massacres, to be elevated to the highest station and to be placed upon the streets and place names that the colonisers then built. This is the first war and the original sin of the colonial Australian nation. And as we begin this debate on matters of war and peace, it is only right to establish this debate in that fundamental foundation. Twenty years on from the war in Iraq and the wars in Afghanistan, fifty years on uh, from the Vietnam War, with the deaths of millions of civilians, overwhelmingly people of colour, 
dead as a result of wars started by rich white men for the purposes of maintaining rich white power. With thousands of Australian Defence Force personnel lost, wounded or struggling to this day with the impact of war. It is only right that Australians are asking why a Prime Minister alone should continue to be allowed to have the sole power to send our forces overseas without first seeking a vote of this Parliament. Now this question is particularly relevant given that again and again we have seen Prime Ministers join in with US wars because it suited their interests. We have seen again and again Prime Ministers lie to the community about what we were really fighting for and whether there was another way. These are important questions for any democracy. Any democracy should be able to ask them and to seek answers to them. Even the most basic commitment to the principle of democracy should lead decision makers to the conclusion that such a significant decision should be subject to a vote, as it is in so many other nations. But in Australia, in Australia this decision is kept close by the leaders of the major parties. In Australia, the Australian Government deliberately keeps this decision as far away from the public as possible to protect those in power from any form of accountability for the decisions they make and the decisions our community have to live with and have to suffer through. Both parties over decades have made use of legal loopholes and flimsy interpretations to wage wars that have led to some of the most severe and devastating humanitarian consequences. The war in Afghanistan, over 200,000 200, dead, including 41 members of the Australian Armed Forces. The illegal and immoral invasion of Iraq, which claimed the life of, lives of half a million people, displaced 1.2 million to this day and created 5 million orphans, as well as taking the lives of four ADF personnel and wounding a further 27. The Vietnam War and the illegal bombing of Laos and Cambodia, resulting in the millions of dead in those nations, including 500 ADF personnel. Our ally, the United States, in that war dropped more bombs on Vietnam, on the tiny country of Vietnam, than it did during the entire Second World War. Each one of these wars has one thing in common. They lacked a clear objective or a strategy, and it was the ordinary people of all nations that suffered. Those responsible for making those decisions were never held accountable nor forced to properly explain or account for their actions. And particularly in the case of Iraq, the, the Australian community was united. 92% of the Australian community was united. We marched together, hundreds of thousands, in capital cities across this ancient continent as part of the largest human protests in the history of our species because we knew we were being lied to. We knew that Howard was lying. We knew that Bush was lying. We knew that Blair was lying. And we did not want to see our children go and die in their war. 
And yet, because in this country, because of the collusion of both major parties, the power to go to war is held solely by the executive, the people gathered in their righteous might were unable to translate that force into a democratic outcome because both of you had worked together for decades to make sure that couldn't happen. And so we were dragged to war based on a lie and we bore the cost and the people of Iraq bore the cost. And ADF, ADF personnel and their families to this day are picking up the pieces. They're trying to put their lives back together while the politicians who sent them to war live lavishly on pensions and are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to give speeches about leadership when they themselves refuse to this day to face the effect of the decisions that they made or to be held accountable. And I would say to this chamber that if a mum has to be worried in bed, kept up all night, worrying about their child, who is to this day deployed in Iraq as part of Operations Okra or Operations Accordion, even though their child isn't old enough to even remember who Saddam Hussein was, then the parliament should be held responsible for sending them there. If mums and dads, family members and friends have to do that stress, bear that burden every single day, never knowing whether that knock at the door, that phone call will be the dreaded phone call, then the least the politicians can do, who send them there, is being willing to vote on that decision, take accountability on that decision, sit on a damn side and declare, I thought this was a good idea. And if you disagree, then you can challenge me, rather than hiding behind the vagaries created by this executive club. It is time that Australia joined the ranks of so many other democracies and gave the right to vote on whether the parliament should go to war to the actual parliament itself so that the parliament and its members can be held responsible for the decision that they make so that the Australian people can hold each and every one of them accountable at the ballot box for the decisions they decide to make. So that if they lie, as they have lied, then they can be challenged by their electorates and voted out of office. Now we live in the 21st century. The challenges of this century are the challenges of climate change. They are the challenges of public health. They are the challenges of ensuring that every human being has access to education, access to health care, access to a roof over their head. They are very different to the challenges of previous times. And yet we see in this place both sides participating in the escalation of tensions, creating a reality in our region where the coming of conflict is more likely. Australia and the Australian community must always work to de-escalate these tensions and above all, prevent those in positions of power putting Australian people at risk because a war suits their political ends. I know that many in the Labour Party support this reform, but are worried about breaking the party line. 
I know that very many members of the Labour Party support this Greens reform and wish that their members of Parliament would be in unity with them and demonstrate the courage that they so dearly wish to see. But to those worried about the impact of breaking the party line this morning, I want to ask you a question. Do you really want to give Peter Dutton the unilateral power to declare war? Do you really think that is a good idea? We can fix this right here, here this morning, by supporting this Greens bill today and stop the risk of another illegal war just 20 years after we engaged in the last one. In closing this debate, I want to say this, because I can hear ticking over in the minds of those who would now come to speak a couple of myths that are fed to you from different PMs and, de and deputy PMs' offices and the opposition leader's office. And I can hear it right now. They're about to say, well, what about in the case of an urgent, unexpected escalation of tension where our waters might be incurred into? So let me just counter that one before you even rattle it off from your speaking notes. Our bill makes specific provision for a circumstance in which our territorial waters were incurred into. In that situation, no vote of the Parliament would be required. This bill deals exclusively with the deployment of Australian ADF personnel beyond our territorial waters. So before you give us that claptrap, I will put that on the record. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you. My name is Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak <clears throat> on this uh, private member's bill today. Um, and in doing so, can I, just, can I just begin by saying from the outset that the tone that the, the mover of this bill brings to this debate diminishes the Senate and our ability to have a really robust, meaningful, important discussion about matters of national security and national defence. And the way that um, members of this place are spoken to and spoken about in relation to this should be above party politics. And I am going to use my time in this chamber to speak in <coughs> an appropriate tone for the level of debate required for this important matter. Um, but the, the tone coming from that end of the chamber is real, diminishes the debate itself and diminishes the mover of this, um, this bill. Um, I just wanted to begin my contribution to this debate, as I'm sure others in the chamber would do, um, by acknowledging all of the Australian Defence Force members who are currently serving overseas um, and uh, acknowledge their families who um, have probably spent um, many nights um, without their loved ones and um, hope to see them come home safe and sound um, and, and acknowledge that nobody in this chamber or in this parliament would seek to send uh, an, a member of the Australian Defence Force into harm's way without justification, without advice, without the... Um, the the rigour of um, uh, questions being asked that is required. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that respectfully, uh, that we care about these men and women, that they play an incredibly important role in our country and in the defence of our country, and we, we owe a debt of gratitude to every single member of the Defence Force that is deployed overseas currently, that has been deployed overseas in the past, and I just want to acknowledge those men and women um, today. Um, the, the, I have a few issues with this bill and this proposal, and there has been um, a, a bill that I think it's fair to say has had many iterations. Um, uh, since, I think, 1985, there's been some sort of form of this bill that's been pushed through um, a debate around uh, by members of the Greens um, or the Democrats. Um, it's something that uh, is 
discussed from time to time in this place. Um, we've had many parliamentary inquiries, uh, and there is a parliamentary inquiry on foot at the moment about um, this very particular issue. Um, so this is something that I think all parliamentarians take very seriously in discussing and, and looking at again and again in the context of the geopolitical circumstances that we find ourselves. Um, and we go back and we, we do have a look and consider this with thought, with care, um, but this is a bill um, that uh, is not supported by the government um, and there are many reasons for that. Um, I just want to address one of the underlying premises in this bill, and um, it goes back to the tone of the debate, but the, there just seems to be this underlying premise that um, the defence force and the decisions that are made by the executive in relation to the deployment of defence force um, is done in secret or there's no accountability to the parliament, that there's some sort of um, you know, covert decision making that um, uh, we don't talk to the public about. That's not true. Um, we know that um, decisions sometimes do need to be made quickly in the interests of the safety of members of the Australian Defence Force and the safety of others overseas. Um, but the, I'm on many parliamentary committees in relation to defence. I know members of the defence diligently come to parliament and sit in front of estimates for hours and hours on end answering questions. Um, they are called before many, many um, inquiries and committees to provide briefings. They provide private briefings to parliamentarians on matters um, that, that we need to understand in our roles. Um, and, and they are accountable um, to the executive, and the executive is accountable to the Australian people. Um, we know that. Um, that is, um, I, I want to dismay, dis, dismiss any um, idea that there is a, a, no accountability for the defence force or for the executive for the decisions that are made and that they're ultimately made in, um, publicly. I also acknowledge that on the occasions where there is a change in posture, uh, and that when deployments do occur, and we saw that um, you know, in the last term of parliament around the evacu evacuation of that, um, uh, uh, people from Afghanistan, whether it's uh, the former government or whether it's uh, our government, I, I think it's fair to say that the executive really does try to communicate that as urgently as possible to the Australian public. Um, that they, they do speak to the, the media about that so they can be asked questions. Um, but sometimes there are some sensitivities <laughs> about making that, that news public before troops are in a safe position. And I just, I, I just want to make that, put that on the record that um, I, I think that the former government made that information very, um, made that public at an appropriate time when the advice was um, given to them, uh, and then it was safe to, to be able to do that. Um, that's because na the nature of deployment, um, the nature of sending people into harm's way, um, the nature of sending people into so-called emergency exits um, are usually in unforeseen circumstances or where things um, need to be dealt with quickly. Uh, and it's very clear that um, we need to make sure that the Defence Force has the, the urgency and the flexibility and the opportunity to, to take these necessary steps. And I think that this bill would prevent that from happening. There's also a number of holes in this, um, this bill. Um, as the, the previous speaker alluded to, there's been some sort of attempt to capture this idea of emergency um, situations, obviously trying to preempt a discussion about the Defence Force needing to be um, uh, uh, agile and effective. Um, but the, the bill I was reading it this morning, and the bill itself sort of has a few holes. Um, there is no definition of emergency exits. Um, there is a pretty loose term of what an emergency exit would be, and I'd be concerned about that. Um, there's n no definition of what it means to be required to serve beyond territorial limits and what that could um, include. Um, and uh, what, what was concerning to me was that um, the process of um, requiring Parliament to sit um, after a proclamation is made through the bill um, would require information to be made public, possibly 
in a, in a window that doesn't serve the purposes of the actual emergency exit. Now, these are, these are kind of te technical terms, but I have, um, have done my homework, I've read the bill, I've really considered this um, in the context of how this um, would affect or how it would practically be provided. Um, but there's just some things that have not been thought through about how this would operate. There's been an attempt to try to say that there's no reason why this bill shouldn't be supported. Well, there's plenty of reasons. There's plenty of holes in this bill. I'm also concerned about one of the subsections um, uh, about um, in this bill, which requires that the minister come back to the parliament every month or the start of every month of a sitting um, and provide information that includes um, the number of people deployed um, uh, and um, uh, information that you know we might not necessarily want <laughs> our enemies and people um, to understand um, at that particular time. Like, like I think there is certainly um, an argument that the Minister for Defence um, at the time, or the Prime Minister particularly, should be asked genuine questions. Um, but I think across the chamber we are respectful that some information at some times needs to be dealt with sensitively, um, and there is no accounting for that in this bill. Um, this is certainly just some of the things I've picked up on a first reading. There's been lots of in uh, parliamentary inquiries into previous um, bills of this nature that have picked up similar issues around unforeseen circumstances. And really that's because we're dealing with a bill that is about you know, a political agenda of a political party. Um, I know that that's something that um, the Greens might not want to hear, um, and I'm sure they'll, sure they'll be very precious about that, but um, the truth is um, this is something that I know many people in the public um, have long memories about, and they remember um, previous deployments and how they may or may not have been treated. Uh, and the Greens political party is seeking to um, campaign on this issue, like campaigning on the deployment of Defence Force personnel um, is uh, something that I think is um, pretty distasteful, but, but this is something that the Greens political party is pushing as a political agenda. And <clears throat> I did want to keep the tone of my contribution pretty respectful, but I don't think there is a more self-indulgent, self-righteous, self-interested group in this, in this Senate chamber who should be so far away from national security decisions, it is not funny. Like, these are people who should never, ever be involved in making national security decisions, and they should never, ever be involved in having some sort of balance in power that decides what we do in the defence of our country. That is, um, that is a, a pretty broad um, explanation, um, but uh, to make it very clear, um, this Senate at times has different compositions, and I know that, the, um, that we are subject to the composition of this Senate to pass legislation. Every form of government is. What I would not want to see is a situation where the Greens prevent action being taken because of a political purpose and because of a campaign and because of seeming to hold the executive to account. There are matters where that should happen and does happen, no matter who is sitting on the government benches. There, there is a purpose to the crossbench and we respect the crossbench and we respect the composition of the Senate. But what I do not want to see is a situation where we have troops about to be deployed to a, an emergency situation or to a situation that involves um, uh, putting people in harm's way and that that decision is held up because of the self-interested political purposes of the Greens' political party. They should be so far removed from national security matters. I think the Australian public would agree with that, and they do. Um, they certainly are not a party of government, and they certainly are not a party who takes these issues seriously enough to be part of the decision-making process. Um, they are not a member of certain committees in this parliament for very good reason, and that's because um, only parties of government, I think it's fair to say, um, take the responsibility of national security seriously 
in a non-partisan way, in a way that we know we have a job to do when we come here, no matter who is in the executive, who the Prime Minister is, we take that role seriously. The members at the end of the chamber in the Greens political party don't take those responsibilities seriously. They should not ever be involved in this decision-making process, um, and that is, that is um, something that I'm very, very passionate about. I have a lot of sympathy, certainly, for some of the um, uh, community members who have personal experience with this and want to come and talk to us about the impacts that deployment have, has had. But what I would prefer the Senate to be doing is to be discussing um, matters relating to how we can improve the lives of veterans who have been deployed. And I think everyone around this chamber would agree that that is something that we should be talking about and we should be considering. The, the Albanese government is working really hard to reduce the DVA backlog. We are delivering 10 veterans family um, hubs and we're also making sure that we have additional payments to veterans in the total permanent and capacity cohort. Um, this is the stuff that we should be talking about when it comes to deployment, how we treat the people that return from overseas with respect and with the care that they deserve. What we shouldn't be doing as a Senate is entertaining the idea that anyone in the Greens political party has any interest in the national security of our country other than their own self-interest and their own politi po political point scoring. That's what this is about. And they can sh shout and scream and call us names and talk in emotive terms and um, uh, you know, call, call people warmongers. It, you know, the stuff that they do around this is pretty distasteful. They can do all of that, but at the end of the day, there's a reason why they're not a party of government. Long may that be the case. And I, I do thank other members of this chamber who are engaging in this debate in a respectful way, because our Australian Defence Force members deserve that respect. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I want to begin by, uh, by starting where Senator Green concluded in the respect for our Defence Force personnel. And I want to acknowledge all of those women and men who have worn uh, the uniform of our Defence Forces, who do wear the uniform of our Defence Forces and who choose to do so in the future. Each of them voluntarily choosing to stand in defence of our nation of our values, of our interests, to do so in the service of our country, but selflessly in terms of what they do um, as individuals, but also to acknowledge very much their families and the support that they provide. Uh, I want to acknowledge Senator Green's contribution, a very thoughtful contribution and considered contribution in terms of the details of this bill, the principles of this bill, and yes, uh, the important principles in terms of the consideration of national security and defence in strategic matters for our nation, and the importance that the way in which we go about consideration of those defence and security issues requires us uh, to bring a calm and considered approach, requires us uh, to be able to handle matters with the utmost of confidence and sensitivity, uh, to respond in relation uh, to, um, to sensitive and difficult matters. Uh, with information uh, that is sourced from a variety of locations, some of it highly confidential, but all of it important to reaching firm and clear conclusions. Acting Deputy President, I have sat around the National Security Committee uh, of Cabinet, uh, and it is a solemn responsibility to do so, uh, to find yourself in a situation where you are briefed routinely uh, about activities and threats uh, to our nation, to our interests, uh, to those uh, of other nations, partners, friends, allies, neighbours and the challenges that, uh, that we face in the world. Equally, you are briefed about the challenges of natural disaster, uh, of peacekeeping operations, of a range of different factors and, uh, and done so uh, with information sourced from a variety of different um, uh, countries, platforms and, uh, and intelligence means. That solemn responsibility is one where you make critical decisions about the future interest of the nation. And I sat there as we made some of those decisions, not in deploying our troops to war, but certainly in deploying our troops 
in support of international policing operations and of deploying our AFP officers to undertake those international policing operations. I said there is a member when we made decisions to deploy our troops in circumstances for the evacuation of Australian personnel, potentially dangerous circumstances and life-threatening circumstances. And through all of those or decisions to continue and to provide support in places like Iraq, where we have had uh, troops placed for some period of time, and whilst their operations today are very difficult, are very different uh, to the operations. They're difficult as well, but very different to the operations uh, from when they were first deployed there. Uh, all of those decisions weigh heavily upon you, as they should, as should the sensitive security briefings that are provided, uh, as should uh, the difficult decisions to be made uh, about um, our defence investment positioning, force posture, all such factors uh, require you to weigh the advice before you, assess the advice that you're receiving uh, and give careful consideration uh, to the actions you're taking. And to do so mindful of the fact that there are human lives at the end of it, uh, that there are the human lives of the Australian Defence Force personnel there are the lives of their families, there are the lives of the people they serve alongside, uh, there are the lives, of course, uh, of those uh, where it comes to it uh, that they fight against, uh, and there are uh, the lives of many civilians and other innocent bystanders uh, in any such situation. Weighing all of those issues is something that anybody, I would hope, tasked with those responsibilities would undertake. This bill and the approach that Senator Stiljohn takes in his argument has a fundamental failure in its thesis and application, and that is that it ignores the reality uh, that I previously, as a member of the National Security Committee of Cabinet, or those ministers in the current government who serve in the NSC are, under our system of government, ultimately accountable. They are members of the executive because, under our system of government, they are first and foremost members of this parliament. They are members of the executive because, under our system of government, they are part of a government that commands a majority support in the House of Representatives. There is within this bill and this approach advocated, a seeming perception that the executive sits over here and the parliament sits over there. And yes, we talk about the separation of powers, but there is an intrinsic link within our Westminster system of government, an intrinsic link that you do not get to be an executive without the support of the parliament. And you do not get to remain a member of the executive without the support of the parliament. The reason I stand on this side of the chamber and not on the other side of the chamber is because my party no longer commands the support of the parliament uh, for me to be a member of the executive. And so the premise that every decision of the executive when it comes to deployment of troops ought to be verified by the parliament is one that does not require the type of legislative intervention or the type of approach that Senator Steelejohn advocates for. Because if, if the majority of the parliament did not support that deployment, then ultimately the consequence of that would potentially be the fall of that government. Now, that then goes to the argument of, but what about scrutiny? What about accountability? Well, that, of course, Acting Deputy President, is precisely what the parliament is for. And there is no shortage of scrutiny and accountability when it comes to any of the big decisions that government takes. This chamber upholds, through its various 
important committee structures, through its estimates proceedings, uh, through debates such as the one we're having right now, through question time processes and a range of other opportunities for senators, the right to scrutinise, the right to argue, the right to contest. And these are all rights that we have to be very conscious of defending. Indeed, the defence of those rights is part of the reason why we have a defence force to be able to undertake those approaches. And so, Acting Deputy President, the conscious decision that the founders of the Commonwealth of Australia took to put Section 68 of the Constitution in place, providing that the command of naval and military forces is vested in the Governor-General and therefore in the executive of government is one that recognises that the direct command is an important principle for the effective operation of our defence forces. The ability of executive government to make decisions in critical times is an important thing. The ability of executive government to make those decisions, having been fully informed of all of the available information, evidence and analysis, including that which, for sensitive reasons of national security, sensitive reasons that could jeopardise or threaten the life of military personnel, may not all be able to be made public, means that there is a logic there. But none of that logic in terms of the executive government having those powers vested in it means in any way, shape or form that we should overlook the reality that the executive is accountable to this place. For those reasons, Acting Deputy President, the Coalition does not support this bill, as we have not supported previous versions of this bill, which have been considered and debated over some period of time. We do believe that, consistent with the way our Constitution was written and has operated now uh, for more than 120 years, the decision to deploy Australian Defence Force personnel should remain at the discretion of the executive. That the executive should have that ability to act in a timely manner and to do so in the best interests of our national security. That, of course, the executive must always remain accountable to this place and those decisions, whether they be to send and deploy troops into combat operations or peacekeeping operations or other supportive operations around the world, should nonetheless not be subordinated to the parliament, but, of course, that the executive in making those decisions should be, must be firmly accountable to the parliament. Now, this bill, having its origins in previous bills, has been considered uh, by the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee uh, in various guises before. And that committee has upheld in a bipartisan way, as indeed the debate ensuing here in this chamber does today, uh, that the powers ought to remain with the executive. Uh, whilst acknowledging the critical importance of parliamentary debate, the committee has previously stopped short in accepting the requirement for the Houses of Parliament to, to approve the deployment of Australian troops. It's acknowledged in terms of arguments as to why we should maintain the current long-standing constitutional practices that the disclosure of classified or sensitive intelligence may compromise the operation or the safety uh, of Australian forces or those who they serve alongside. That committee in its reports and work has also made the point uh, that if in order to protect our forces uh, or our allies, classified information had to be withheld from the parliament, uh, then those critical decisions about deployment would not be fully informed. And that is a point of tension I appreciate. Uh, and the parliament itself seeks to resolve that in part uh, through the establishment of different committees and procedures for the sharing of classified information. And of course, at times in the nations and in the history of democratic governments and Westminster governments, we have even seen uh, in critical times the formation of war cabinets uh, or the approach that really does bring the parties of government together. 
to ensure that all are informed. At present, around intelligence and security matters, we do that through uh, the, uh, the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security uh, that brings together the parties of government uh, to receive the most sensitive of briefings and to understand and engage with our security agencies around the risks we face. We also do it in other means, and I acknowledge that uh, Senator Wong, uh, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs, you know, is routinely uh, generous in offering and providing relevant, sensitive security briefings to myself, as the government is to the Shadow Minister for Defence as well, ensuring that we are versed and understanding of some of the difficult and sensitive issues that the government is dealing with, uh, and that whilst not all of the intelligence can be shared publicly, it helps to inform our understanding of the decisions that government is making. It's the parliamentary democracy working at its best, recognising real-world realities around what can and cannot be made public, but finding means to accommodate those uh, so that uh, executive government can function, can make its decisions, can be held accountable, but in that accountability process can also know uh, that all information is being weighed. Now, Senator Steelejohn spoke about other nations. In reality, if we take a look across uh, our Five Eyes partners, for example, overwhelmingly similar practices exist. Some have chosen to bring debates to the floor of their parliament, but that does not remove the right of their executives to make necessary decisions and to exercise that right. And that's why uh, we should maintain a practice uh, that for more than 120 years has served our defence personnel, has served governments of the day who may not get every decision absolutely right, but each of them are absolutely, must absolutely be accountable to this place, and that's the best way to uphold the integrity of our system. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And also rise to make a contribution um, relating to the Defence Amendment, Parliamentary Approval of Overseas Service Bill that is before the Senate this morning. And as uh, many in this place have articulated, uh, both the government and the opposition are certainly not supporting this bill. And those who have been in and around or observing the Senate for an extended period of time would hardly be surprised to hear. Um, a Labor senator, either in opposition or in government, say such words in response to a bill of this nature. And this is because the bill is hardly novel to this chamber. In fact, I think it's important uh, we have a bit of a, a look at the history. It's become almost a tradition uh, from some to, to introduce such a bill in this chamber. In, in many respects, the bill that we have before us is a carbon copy of a bill that was introduced by former Senator Colin Mason of the Australian Democrats back in 1985. A carbon copy of a bill that was introduced by Senator McLean, also the Democrats, in 1988. The same bill that was brought to the chamber again in 1993, in 1996 and in 2003 by Senators Bartlett, Dr Spoyer and Senator Ludlam in 2008. So it's certainly a one that has made the rounds here in the Senate. But, President, um, today the, the decision to, um, to, to send Australian Defence Force personnel into harm's way is not a decision that's ever taken lightly. And uh, as we heard contributions from my uh, colleague Senator Green and, and, and um, from those opposite, you know, we have had uh, a privilege, I guess, to, to share part of the, uh, the ADF's um, program uh, here in Parliament House through the parliamentary program that's been offered through the Department of Defence. And I myself have seen firsthand uh, and the dedication of our service men and women, uh, of the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Army and the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, and the role that they have in advancing our national interests and defending our sovereignty. And just last year I travelled to um, exercise uh, Rim of the Pacific. Uh, over in Hawaii, and that was consistent with previous interactions uh, with our defence personnel. And I was really struck by the patriotism that was shown uh, when I and other members of the parliamentary program uh, were there. 
Uh, it's fair to say the ADF personnel were very generous to the parliamentarians that participated in the exercise, and I want to thank them again for their time and dedication to Australia and its peoples. Now, this dedication is admirable, and it should never be tested without deep, deep consideration. And although I disagree with the provisions of the bill, the rationale behind it, uh, I can't fault the moral conviction of those who seek to advance it. Um, it certainly is a place here in Parliament to have the debates about going to war. And I, I don't think you'll find, and you know, we heard from Senator Birmingham, um, you know, I think it is fair that the Parliament should have the debate, but the decision to send our troops to war should rest with the government of the day. Indeed, I believe um, and appreciate the significance of the decision. It's not one that is always taken lightly to send Australians to war because of the appreciation that we have for our ADF personnel. Uh, but it's also important to note too, um, Acting Deputy President, in the Westminster systems of government, like we have here in Australia, it is within the purview of the executive to make decisions regarding the commitment of forces to engagements, be that within our borders uh, or overseas. Uh, it is that way because um, the way our constitution is written, uh, the Governor-General, as a representative of His Majesty the King, Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Defence Force, is constitutionally vested with this responsibility. Such is the effect of section 61 of the Australian Constitution. Acting exclusively on the advice of the Prime Minister and other responsible ministers of the government, the Governor-General gives effect to the decisions of the government of the day, which is responsible to the parliament here in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, and through our parliamentary processes, which obviously extend to the Australian people. The Albanese government supports the continuation of current arrangements that govern the deployment of Australian Defence Force to overseas engagements. And we do so because it is essential that decisions of this type are taken and are able to be taken swiftly in response to international events. Indeed, we have seen in recent years with open conflict once more on the European continent. How important is it that there exists a legal framework to support the sudden defence of the national interest in the manner only the Australian Defence Force can? Now, whilst this may be so, it would be a mistake to suggest that there is not a role for the parliament at all. At all. Uh, on this side of the chamber, we have also um, support the notion that such decisions of the executive be made with the appropriate level of parliamentary and public scrutiny. And it is only with such transparency that the Australian community can have faith that these decisions are made on behalf and are being made in keeping in their, in their and with their expectations. It is because of this commitment that the Australian Labor Party took to the election a policy to establish an inquiry into Australia's armed conflict decision making. Uh, and this is a policy that was and since been acted upon with the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence, Richard Miles, making reference to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on September 28 of last year. And I'm also a member of this committee. I note that it has so far received 113 submissions. And I also note that the committee is still yet to finalise its report to the parliament. So it is disappointing that this bill has been brought on for debate before that report has been considered or tabled by the parliament. And I say disappointing because despite the many iterations of this bill and the frequency with which it appears before the chamber, it retains many uh, I think deficiencies that have been previously been identified through inquiries and debates. Because of the seriousness of the matters this bill would seek to amend, it is of the utmost importance that this legislation is deeply considered and comprehensive. When dealing with matters that will put Australian lives on the line, nothing should be left to chance. Successive committee inquiries have highlighted that the provisions of this and very similar earlier bills leave too much to chance and fail to address the concerns of unintended consequences arising should its passage through the parliament be allowed. In its 2021 report on this bill, the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade stated that it was left with concerns about how certain provisions of this bill would operate in practice and about unintended or unforeseen consequences. The report stated that concerns exist about the disclosure of classified or sensitive information 
that was necessary to inform decision making would be made available for parliamentary debate without compromising Australia or its allies. It stated also that the bill would reduce flexibility needed in Australia's complex and uncertain strategic environment. And I think it's important to note, uh, Acting Deputy President, that our environment has only become more complex and uncertain since the, this report was produced. Lastly, and rightly appropriate, the committee noted that the geographical limitations that the bill would place on parliamentary approval of overseas service did not account for the increasingly important conflict that occurs in space and cyberspace. The ALP has always had concerns with previous iterations of this bill around placing constraints on government's capacity and its ability to respond to situations requiring urgency. The urgency required in these situations, situations that we, of course, hope never, never eventuate, but to make it necessary for the function of committing Australian forces to engagements to sit within the executive. So the reasons why the government opposes the bill are consistent with the reasons that Labor has opposed similar bills dating right back to 1985. And that is another reason why it is disappointing that the bill has come before the chamber today. But instead of um, you know, the, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade to have finalised its report, and I really would urge um, senators, once that report is tabled, to obviously have another uh, discussion here in this place, <clears throat> but really make a contribution and get involved in the processes uh, with that Joint Standing Committee's inquiry. The facts and arguments upon which um, the government has formed its view of this legislation have not changed, except noting that our strategic environment is even more fraught and uncertain than when we previously considered a similar bill. And I'm sure the same is true of other parties around the chamber. The bill does not address the concerns that have been raised with previous iterations. Instead, it, it appears that proponents of the bill have just hoped that maybe the Senate has changed its mind or the numbers have shifted. But I really do want to applaud the moral convictions of those who have put this bill, and Senator Stiljano is very passionate, uh, rightly, about these issues of concern. And you know, quite frankly, this is the appropriate place to have those debates. Um, but I really would urge uh, you know, Senator Stiljohn to, to reconsider the, 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 the consequences of, of maybe delaying decisions and the, the role the executive has. But ensuring that there is still accountability in this place, the Parliament has to have accountability on the executive regardless of which side of politics is in power. So I know um, there are many convictions that we probably share, but I really do feel that um, what is important here is about ensuring that the government of the day has the right uh, amount of information, has the right time and has the ability to, uh, to be able to support our men and women in uniform when the time comes. But I do um, also, um, before I conclude, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, just make the point too that um, you know it, it is important that um, that we are mindful the functions of of the executive remain as they have been. No decision made by government is a consequential important as the decision as the decision is to deploy Australian Defence Force into combat. But we must also consider that in what may be rapidly changing security situation, that the decision to not deploy ADF also has consequences, as does any delay in decisions being made. So any proposal to alter that decision-making process and who is responsible for it must be subject to scrutiny. And now this chamber has gone through that scrutiny process on bills many times before. And any changes to our national security arrangements must be deeply, deeply considered. And as our concerns, concerns about legal and operational and unforeseen uh, consequences of the, of the bill have not been addressed, the, go the government is not in, in a position to support this bill. But I do look forward to the report from the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade being finalised after proper consideration of the 113 submissions before it. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I ask that the question be put. Uh, the question is that the question be put. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. 
No. Those against say no. No. I think. No. Division required. Ring the bells. Set the clock for four minutes. Um. Lock the doors. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a second time. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the eyes and Senator O'Sullivan for the nose.
ये सब ये There being 12 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats? And you're already seated. I call the clerk. Government business order for day number one, safeguard mechanism crediting amendment bill 2022 Questions on the second reading. And then I just say, right. So the first question is the second reading amendment on sheet 1894 rev revised, moved by Senator Thorpe. All those in favour say aye. There will be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so the question is that the amendment, second reading amendment, moved by Senator Thorpe on sheet 1894 revised, be accepted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
Let's wait. I won't pinch. Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes.
order, there being 31 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, there is another amendment, but uh, the mover will have to seek leave. Otherwise, I'm moving on. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move uh, amendment number 1890 circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Uh, I need to hear it. Yes. Uh, leave is granted, Senator Pocock. Mr. President, I move the amendment. So the question is that the amendment on sheet 1890, as moved by Senator Pocock, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. Uh, the noes have it. I think that completes the second reading amendments. So the question now is that the second reading as amended, as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading, um, uh, as amended, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 31 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to emissions reductions and for related purposes. I believe we're in committee stage. Senator Hanson. Well, all I can say is. Uh, Senator Hanson, I haven't read. The, I haven't uh, actually kicked off committee. Um, I was just organising my papers. Is it the wish that the committee? Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister, and then I'll give you the call, Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Senator Hanson. Well, all I can say is here we go again. Labor and the Greens have again sacrificed Australian prosperity on the altar of climate change. Labor and Greens have again colluded to make everything that matters more expensive for Australians already struggling with the rising cost of living. Labor and Greens have again schemed to create more crippling energy shortages in Australia. Labor and Greens have again acted together to put the brakes on Australia's economic growth and then put it in reverse. Labor has shown it cannot stand against the climate extremism of the Greens. 
Anthony Albanese, our PM, and Chris Bowen have capitulated to Adam Bant's hypocrisy. Even if you accept the stupid idea that cutting Australia's human carbon dioxide emissions is necessary, and I certainly don't accept it, restricting gas supply is just about the worst thing you can do. Increasing gas supply is absolutely crucial to shoring up unreliable renewable energy. Even the Europeans understand this. The European Union has reclassified natural gas as a clean, green source of energy because they've learned at great cost to their economies they can't rely solely on intermittent wind and solar power. That's why they're firing up gas power plants and even restoring coal power plants. What the Greens and Labor won't tell you is that forcing Australian companies to cut carbon dioxide emissions as part of a global effort is utterly futile. Even if Australia's CO2 were cut to zero overnight, CO2 increases in China alone won't negate this cut within a year. This is where Greens' hypocrisy is at its very worst. They work to cripple Australia with CO2 cuts but don't condemn China for contributing 30 per cent of the world's human CO2 emissions. They are happy to accept China's solar panels and steel for wind turbines made with Australian iron and Australian coal, but won't condemn China for its plans to add 2 billion tonnes to its annual emissions of 12 billion tonnes. The Greens will condemn Australia for buying a new few nuclear power submarines, but not China for expanding its arsenal of, nu of nuclear weapons. They will criticise Australia over human rights, but not China's communist regime for its much worse human rights violations. Hypocrisy. The Greens' insistence that CO2 is a pollution is a lie. <laughs> They're lying to us. There would be virtually no life on earth without carbon dioxide. No plant life, no animal life, no green senator or no useful idiots to vote for them. <laughs> CO2 is a natural part of life, and it's an undeniable scientific that fact that human-caused CO2 is only about 3 per cent, if that, of all the CO2 in our atmosphere and oceans. We cannot and never will be able to control or change the 97 per cent of CO2 from natural sources. Even one of the Greens, oh, this is their favourite prophets of doom, Tim Flannery. Remember that man, Tim Flannery? Right? Our dams will never be full again, will never rain, will be in drought. This same man, right? They hold him up there on his, on his statue, his platform. But this is what he said. If the world as a whole cut all emissions tomorrow, the average temperature of the planet is not going to drop in several hundred years, perhaps as much as a thousand years. So why all the panic? Why all the scaremongering? Why going on as if you're destroying the planet? Because that's what it is, scaremongering. You've got nothing to back it up with. And even that holier than thou, Tim Flannery, that you quote and you hold up there, he actually, that was his words. Cutting all emissions tomorrow, the average temperature of the planet is not going to drop in several hundred years, perhaps as much as a thousand years. So you're prepared to destroy our industries, our jobs, our manufacturing and the people at the cost of living. You're prepared to do that. This is Labor. This is the Greens. This is what people voted for. Well, it's until the people of this country start hurting, really hurting, will you understand the impact of all this stupid bloody policies going through this parliament is going to um, maybe change your minds and wake people up in this country. Forcing co companies to cut CO2 or otherwise offset them will only increase their costs, forcing them to cut Australian jobs and eventually take their business somewhere else, but not before they're forced to pass on these enormous costs to Australian consumers. Australian consumers, you're going to pay for it. This legislation is nothing more than a carbon tax in disguise, along with a direct attack on the gas industry, crippling supplies with, when energy shortages demand will in, we increase them. This makes absolutely no sense. In fact, this attack on the gas industry places Labor government's own CO2 reduction targets in jeopardy. 
because there are no renew renewables without reliable natural gas supplies. There is no economic hydrogen production without natural gas. There is no fertiliser for our farmers without natural gas. And the Greens want to end natural gas production. They want to get rid of it. Their economic and scientific illiteracy is almost as stunning as their hypocrisy. And Labor has rolled over and given in to them. It will be interesting to find out just what else is in this deal Labor has done with their Greens devil. It will be interesting to see what else this legislation will do as it plays out in the economy. It doesn't define what a safeguard mechanism credit actually is or what it's supposedly worth. It invests incredible power in the hands of the minister to personally decide if Australian companies have done enough to meet CO2 reduction demands and to punish those who haven't. There is no, so much wrong with this legislation, not least that once again Labor is ramming it through the Senate with the help of the Greens and rookie Senator David Pocock. One Nation puts Australia and Australians first, and so we cannot possibly support a bill that worsens our cost of living crisis, costs Australian jobs and cripples what is left of Australian industry and manufacturing. And, and, and I will also add that if we do not address the gas that we have off the northwest shelf that is in Commonwealth waters and the deals that have been done to allow Western Australia to take 15 per cent of that domestic gas supply that belongs to the Australian people, this is in Commonwealth waters. And now Santos is going to put another gas field off the shores of Darwin in Commonwealth waters that we are going to get nothing for. The Labor Party talks about the fact of um, you know, how are we going to fund the $368 billion for the nuclear subs? And I'll go on about it again. We have a, a resource there that we can make so much money out of for the country, and yet no one's prepared to do it. The Prime Minister said we should get rid of the um, petroleum rent resource tax. No one's done anything about it. The coalition did nothing about it. You're giving them an uplift factor of 15 per cent. They're making billions out of it to the fact is that they've got over $400 billion in tax credits that belong to the Australian people. But no, you keep giving them a 15 per cent uplift factor every year on their investment and it just accumulates to the credit of $400 billion. And we see about around about 77 or $80 billion worth of gas just going out of the country and we get nothing for it. What fools, what fools the people in this place are that you haven't done anything about it and you're reluctant to do it. Why? Is there deals done with these multinational companies? Why are you making the people of Australia so um, reliant? You know, what I mean to say is People in Australia and companies and business here are struggling to get the gas supply and needs that, that they want to run their houses. And you come up with the policy now that you're going to get rid, rid of the gas in Australian homes and replace it with electricity. How the hell are you going to do that when you can't even get enough for electricity now? The plants are shutting down because of the reliable supply, which we don't go through solar and, and wind. Yet you're prepared to actually get rid of gas and telling everyone they've got to go. Um, to, to electricity. At whose cost? Who's going to pay for all this? And we have the resource, the most resource rich, one of the most resource rich countries in the world, and you are not going to deal with this. Why? I don't understand why you're not addressing this. This gas belongs to the Australian people, and we should be taking the money from it. Make them pay for it. Get rid of the PRRT. You can do it tomorrow. But you keep giving them more and more leases, opening up. Let's see what you do about Santos. Let's see if you're going to make them pay for the gas. Tell the Australian people, you know what? You're not going to. And that's my understanding of it. How pathetic you really are. You don't care about the Australian people. People living in the homes, not enough housing. Bring in another million people plus, oh, this next year about 650,000. Disgusting. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I thought it might be worth making some opening remarks. My last contribution, I think, was around four o'clock this morning, uh, and I elected at that time to keep my remarks brief so as not to detain the Senate. But uh, the business before the Senate today is important. Uh, today we are a step closer to reaching net zero by 2050, and it's my hope that by the time this debate is concluded, uh, we have established 
important and enduring arrangements to assist Australia in this transformation. And the assistance and, and what we seek to establish is not just the steps that will take us towards meeting the target, but also the steps that will ensure that our economy is geared up to take advantage of the opportunities, the economic opportunities that will come with it. So the bill before the parliament this morning will deliver 205 million tonnes of emissions reductions by 2030. That's equivalent to taking two thirds of Australia's cars off the road. And I make this point, these reforms are long overdue. They are sensible reforms and they are designed to ensure that Australia's largest emitters remain competitive in a global economy that is decarbonising. They follow eight months and three rounds of extensive consultation with industry and covered facilities, consultation with the broader public and consultation in the parliament. And I thank this morning those parliamentarians who have constructively engaged with that process, and regrettably that is not all of the parliamentarians in this place. The reforms before us deliver the investment certainty that is required for the included businesses and the final changes, the amendments before the parliament today will strengthen the scheme for strategic industries and for climate. They include providing improved flexibility and support for strategic industries and strengthening accountability, transparency and integrity. I understand that there are a range of senators who have general questions uh, to put, so I don't intend to immediately move the government amendments that have been circulated, but I do indicate to the chamber that I do seek to do so uh, relatively quickly so that the Senate may engage with the substance of what's before them. People understand the history. The safeguard mechanism was put in place by the previous government. And it was supposedly to keep a lid on the emissions of Australia's biggest emitters. But unfortunately, under the previous government, emissions were increasing. The reforms before us received wide support. It includes support from the Business Council of Australia, from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Industry Group. And the reason they support them is because these reforms finally deliver the policy certainty that's necessary to allow businesses to make investments, investments in their future competitiveness, investments that will allow them to meet their corporate net zero commitments that most of the covered facilities already have. 80 per cent, 80 per cent of the safeguard facilities and 85 per cent of the safeguard emissions are covered by corporate commitments to net zero. We thank the people who have been involved in the consultation process. We thank the people who drafted submissions, hundreds of submissions, and we thank the people who attended the roundtables around the country and engaged closely with industry and climate groups. And we thank the people in the parliament who engaged in this in good faith. It is past time that we did this. We have had 10 years without a settled climate policy and as a consequence we have had 10 years without a settled energy policy and that has real consequences for Australians. The reforms before us protect our climate and they protect our economy. And these reforms should have bipartisan support. I look forward to the debate across the chamber. Yeah. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, um, uh, before I get into my general questions and general remarks, I do want to place on record the thanks to the staff and attendants of the Senate that uh, so patiently yeah. supported the operations of this chamber last night. It was a long debate, ending, concluding about 4.30, I think, as Senator McAllister, the minister, said. So I very much want to put on record my thanks, including to Hansard and all of the other support uh, that we receive in this place. Um, it's an unusual workplace and it can give rise to unusual settings like that, but it's important to recognise indeed the um, support that we are provided at strange hours of the day. I do want to, in uh, commencing my consideration and on behalf of the coalition, our consideration of this legislation that's before us, by uh, re-examining the pathway to where we are today um, and in doing so acknowledging that only a mere few minutes ago did we receive the amendments that we are going to be considering, the amendments that 
are the fruit of the deal that's been done between Labor and the Greens. And I think it's important to acknowledge that for proper debate and scrutiny to occur on these things, we need time to deliberate. Now, I'm pleased, as I understand it, the government are going to allow debate on this bill to uh, go on until it's exhausted. Uh, that is, until the guillotine falls on the debate of this bill at one o'clock tomorrow, uh, including, of course, all of the intervening items of business this Senate will consider. Uh, but um, there is a lot to unpack here as a result of this murky deal that's been done. Um, and I do want to revisit on one element of that that concerns me most, and that was this what now appears to have been feigned concern from the Australian Greens around the modelling that the Australian government would not provide in relation to this legislation. Uh, there was a public interest immunity claim lodged um, by the government in relation to the modelling that the Senate Environment and Communications Committee sought, uh, and they said, no, you can't have it. This modelling uh, relating to uh, Australian, carbon credit, Australian carbon credit units was cabinet in confidence at the first instance, and then, of course, the excuse under public interest immunity claims changed to market sensitivities down the track. Now, whatever the reason might be, they were determined not to provide it to us. Why? We don't know. My hunch is it does show a lot of what we're talking about here is not actually underpinned by solid modelling and it's all bunkum, uh, but we'll never know. Uh, the most concerning part was not the fact that the Australian government refused to provide transparency, refused to provide the information that I would have thought senators in this place would benefit from seeing to make an informed decision. You know, the people in here are intelligent people, committed to their communities, committed to the people who work and live in their states. They would benefit from this information. Uh, but instead, the government have hidden it. They'll keep it secret. That's fine. That's what they've done. The most concerning part, though, was this false concern the Australian uh, Greens had um, in indicating to us that they wanted this modelling too. They put down their own motion. At the same time, we put ours down and we said, no, you can't deal with this bill until we see the modelling. And I think that's fair. If there's nothing to hide, why hide it? Indeed, they wouldn't reveal it. The Greens put down a similar motion, suggesting, well, uh, we'd love to see it too, but we're not going to stop debate on the bill until we change our minds. Uh, and so the thing is, and another worthy interjection from Senator Pratt there, I'm grateful for that brilliant intervention. But the point is, the Greens weren't ever actually interested in seeing this modelling. They were interested in buying enough time to do a deal. Because while this motion was on the books, while we were having our Senate committee, there was a smoke-filled room somewhere in this building where Greens and Labor senators, the minister and the Greens spokesperson on energy, were sitting down to work out exactly what it was they were going to be agreeing on, what parts of the economy they were going to be sacrificing, what jobs they determined weren't worthy that they shouldn't be looking after, what parts of Australia can be sold out in the name of political expediency. The Greens sold out. and We know, of course, that there are members, elements of the Greens that aren't happy. I read out in the second reading debate, of course, a tweet from our colleague Senator McKim, uh, which was quite inflammatory, I thought. I'm not going to read it out here again for those interested. Go and have a look at Hansard or perhaps uh, have a trawl through Senator McKim's Twitter feed. But I also remarked on former Senator Bob Brown's resignation as a foundation life member of the Australian Conservation Foundation. Clearly, clearly, the committed environmentalists in this country are looking at what the Australian Greens are doing now, and as I've already said, they're selling out. They're uh, compromising on their values. And I made the point, uh, former Senator Brown and I agree on not many things other than Tasmania is a great place. And, uh, but one thing I can say of him is he's a man of conviction, and one must respect that. And that continues to this day. From well beyond the bounds of this chamber, he continues to let the world know what it is he believes, advocating for it, standing for it, and making sure that uh, people understand what real Greens are. And he, I believe, is one of those. Sadly, though, what we see today is not a replication of that. We see a Greens party that, of course, has decided, well, you know, let's just do a deal. Let's deal ourselves into the game, get what we can, no matter what the cost. So, Murky deals, backroom discussions, Labor-Green power-sharing agreement, 
whatever name you want to give it, that's what we're dealing with here now. And of course, we saw an element of that this morning, where you know the, the Australian government, the Labor Party, decided we're going to punish the coalition for not just signing up to our policy, even though at the election we told them we wouldn't, and we told the people of Australia we wouldn't, by denying us the capacity to debate our private senator's bill on Thursday. Now, willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, although I think that may be a little too generous. And that private senator's bill, I might just add, was about developing a mechanism so the people of Australia can actually see across the country what power prices are doing and from what source energy was being generated—renewable, fossil fuels, you name it, every quarter. I'm looking forward to debating that when we get the chance, if the Australian government sees sense and allows us to do that. But I want to come to these amendments that were cooked up in secret as the result of this dirty, dodgy deal. I want to know uh, from the government when drafting instructions were first issued for these amendments. When were the relevant officials tasked with designing these amendments? Because I think that's important to understand. We were given these amendments today at the commencement of debate, in effect. Not a long time to thumb through the 16-, 17-page additional supplementary rather explanatory memorandum to understand the far-reaching impacts that these changes will have, let alone the bill that we've been looking at. What consultation, what scrutiny has occurred? I'd love to know who out there in the business community, in the ENGO part of the universe, have had a look at these. I'd love to know, because if the Senate that is being asked to vote on these bills, or this bill, I would love to know what level of consultation has occurred, what input into the backroom, backroom deal that has been done here occurred. So fundamentally, a date, a time, and uh, by whom to whom were these drafting instructions issued? Um, and as a supplementary question, perhaps, Chair, I might also ask, in addition to first drafting instructions, when final drafting instructions were issued, when the amendments that we now have before us at the 11th hour as part of this sneaky deal and you can clothe it up as whatever you like, but that's what it is. Just chucked it on the table today in the hope that no one will notice. It will just rush through this week and we can all forget about it. But I tell you what, the big reminder is going to come in just a few months' time. In the depths of winter, when Australian households and businesses are opening their power bills and they're not going to be any less than they were as a result of this or any other legislation that's been introduced by this government. And we've got to remember, of course, colleagues, it was this government that before the election said 97 times that they would reduce power bills by $275. And it's also important to remember it's this government that can't actually say that number now at all. at all. Even in answer to a question that was asked last week by my good friend Senator O'Sullivan, who's not here now, he asked the minister, can you say the number 275? He refused to say it. That's how allergic to keeping promises this crowd are. And as a result, power prices are going to go up. We have bills like this driving up power prices. Bizarrely, in the same week that we have this bill that we passed yesterday, the National Reconstruction Fund, which is supposed to vitalise, revitalise our manufacturing sector and create jobs, but we're going to strangle the same sector by driving up the cost of doing business. And one thing I'll disagree with Senator Hanson on. She said it was a carbon tax in disguise. It's not in disguise. It's on full view. It is a carbon tax. So when were drafting instructions issued? First, and then when they were finally issued as well. Senator, Senator Cox, or Minister, if you wish to respond to that, well then I'll give the call we'll go to Senator Cox. Uh, thanks, um, Chair. Look, it's no secret that the government has sought to consult on the implementation of our reforms to the safeguard mechanism. Uh, and I can step um, Senator Dunningham through the timetable if it is of assistance. So, uh, in 2021, on the 3rd of December, we announced very publicly that we would reform the safeguard mechanism uh, as part of the Powering Australia plan. On the 1st of July, having formed a government, uh, we appointed an independent panel to review the integrity of ACUS. On the 8th of August uh, 2022, uh, we initiated consultation on the safeguard mechanism reform, and there's a paper that's still available on the website if you would like to review it. On the 10th of October 2022, uh, we opened consultation on the safeguard mechanism 
crediting bill. On the 30th of November 2022, we introduced that bill into the parliament. On the 9th of January, re January we released uh, the independent review of ACUS that was undertaken by Professor Chubb. Uh, on the 10th of January, we released um, again a, a further paper which outlined the proposed reforms which form the substance of the bill before you. Uh, and on the 27th of March, following uh, discussions with a range of stakeholders, we released updated reforms. Now, those consultations were extensive, as I've indicated in the con contribution I made before, and they covered businesses, other community stakeholders and parliamentarians, as you would expect them to do. I find it surprising that the opposition objects to a government that is willing to work across the parliament to seek support for reforms. The very great shame, I think, for the opposition is that they dealt themselves out of this process from the very beginning, said no before they even saw the legislation which has become the hallmark of the opposition under Mr Dutton. And so we're not really going to take lectures about processes of engagement because this is an opposition that has essentially refused to engage with a very significant economic reform. Chosen not to engage, uh, said no. We've taken the responsible route to engage all those stakeholders across the chamber who have an interest and all those stakeholders outside of the parliament. And the arrangements that were made very publicly uh, by Minister Boehm uh, on the 27th of March reflect that very broad consultation. I'm going to give the call to Senator Cox, who had indicated. Senator Thank Cox. you, Chair. Um, I rise to uh, contribute to this debate on the state guard mechanism. And coal and gas have taken a huge hit, and it's no mistake. You only have to read the papers over the last few days. We have stopped nearly half of the 116 new fossil fuel projects that are currently in the pipeline. And by doing what we have, we have ensured that, in fact, pollution will go down as part of these amendments. We have derailed the Beedaloo and the Barossa projects. And we've negotiated amendments, not dirty deals as, uh, as the opposition have alluded to, and I think that's pretty rich coming from their side, that we've prevented more public money from being sucked into coal and gas projects in this country, unlike their gas-led recovery that they did during COVID. So I want to be really clear that this is actually a very huge win. It's a huge win for the planet. But there's still lots of work to do. And currently, there are lots of industry-based grant funds that are currently being given, funded through the climate crisis, to fossil fuel projects. And this is absolutely unacceptable. Our amendments will ensure that the grants under the Industry Research and Development Act 1986 are not given to any more coal and gas projects in this country. There is now one less pocket of public money that's going to these greedy corporations to dip into. And that should be a good win for the public interest. That's what this place represents. We know that 47 per cent of the current emissions covered by this scheme come from fossil fuel companies. That is no mistake. It's not something we over here at the Greens have made up. It's actually the science. And it's important to note that this is the current emissions. This does not actually account for new entrants, the ones that are also in the pipeline, ready to be approved. From the outset, from the outset it's already posed that there's a significant uh, problem that the government have identified, and the Greens agree. The Greens agree that this is a problem in relation to our emissions. In the middle of a climate crisis, the Labor government will continue to still look at these projects, and we over here at the Greens will still fight ferociously for the rest of those projects in the pipeline to be shut down. And the safeguard mechanism before the Greens secured these wins would have allowed that to happen. We've put the handbrake on this, and we're not ashamed to say that. Our amendments include a hard cap on emissions, 
meaning real pollution will come down and the coal and gas corporations can't buy their way out of the cap with offsets, the dodgy offsets, by the way, that complement and also to complement this change, there will also be a pollution trigger, which will now require new coal and gas projects to be assessed against the hard cap and can be stopped based on their impact on the climate. How hard is that? It's not rocket science. If you don't meet the hard cap, you cannot continue. You should not proceed to your final investment decision in these projects. So this will be the first time since the safeguard mechanism was established under Tony Abbott that we can be confident, have confidence, that pollution will actually come down in this country. Now, abating emissions on site should be a priority for industries across this country that are captured under this mechanism. Now, we understand that reductions can't happen overnight. That is a reality. So some of the offsets will, offsets will be needed. However, they should in fact be the last resort. And in cases where either emissions cannot be abated on site or there still needs to be a small buffer while there is technology being developed and implemented, this is the only time we should see offsets used. Now, there's been significant concerns raised about the integrity of these dodgy offsets, particularly with the uh, human-induced regeneration uh, by the ACCU's um, uh, issue. And the Greens have also heard these con uh, concerns. So we've secured a pause on these credits. Um, we secured this pause until they're actually going through an independent audit. And we think that's important. So this could take up to a quarter of these future offsets off the table, which will force companies to cut pollution on site. That is what it's meant to do. We are in a climate crisis. This is urgent. We're not in a casual walk towards climate action. We should be in a sprint. That is what was said last week in the IPCC report. Climate action is needed, and it's needed now. Further companies will have to report on and justify the use of their offsets to ensure, um, which will help prevent greenwashing. The greenwashing that we have seen presented to us in this chamber in the last 18 months that I've represented the resources portfolio here on behalf of the Australian Greens, I've seen more greenwashing than I have in my lifetime. So we have to ensure that we are addressing that. Fracking in the Beedaloo and the development of the Barossa gas field have been derailed. They are now having to justify to their investors why this is still a viable option. Tamboran, who are the proponents for Beedaloo project, will be forced to offset all of its emissions from day one, adding an estimated $1 billion a year. And Santos, who are the proponents for the Barossa gas field, will be forced to offset all of its CO2 emissions. Now, this is a big day for the Greens movement as we continue to work alongside the government, but an even bigger day for traditional owners, First Nations people who never gave their free, prior and informed consent. And we have challenged that. They have challenged that in the Beedaloo and in the Barossa gas fields. And I've stood in solidarity with some of those traditional owners and campaigners and what gr great grassroots campaigns they have run. And they've run these against what are the gas giants in this country, and they've taken the challenge right up to them. And I want to congratulate the eight Tiwi clan groups led by the Manupi clan in the Tiwi Islands. And this is a moment they can share in. And last night I had a wonderful conversation because they are now seeing a glimmer of light, another opportunity of hope for them to make sure that in land and sea country across this country is not being destroyed by the state capture of the two major parties in this place to continue to fund fossil fuel projects in this country. And we know that the Beedaloo and the Barossa gas fields are not the only threats to our climate. Traditional owners from Narrabri, Otway, um, and in my home state of the Scarborough project up on uh, the Burrup Peninsula and in the Kimberley, where the fight continues. But the Barossa and the Beedaloo are some of the biggest and closest to production. They had the biggest targets, and, um, <clears throat> which is why we focused our negotiation on them. 
Both of these are climate bombs, and they are equally, equally linked to, funnily enough, the dirty middle arm hub that's proposed in Larrakia country in Darwin. So the impacts on these projects will flow on to middle arm. And we all remember the debate we had about middle arm, where the government and the opposition sat together against us trying to ask for information about why middle arm was even approved. In question time, where I asked uh, Minister Watt about the use of petrochemicals uh, in the wording, the greenwashing that was put out by the Northern Territory and the federal governments. But rest assured, the Greens are still here fighting. We're fighting for Scarborough, we're fighting for Narrabri, we're fighting for the Browse Basin, fracking in the Kimberley and so many others. We will continue to fight. And indeed, we may have already wiped out some of these with the hard cap, and that's a great move and a great start. And I'm so proud of the work that's gone into these negotiations. And the opposition can cry and paint that up any way you want. But um, we are proud that we've been able to negotiate these with the government. And we know that the people are with us. We are in solidarity with First Nations people across this country. We are in solidarity with climate scientists, our Pacific Island neighbours and the majority of people who should and do believe that the, we are in a climate crisis. We should be shutting down coal and gas projects across this country and particularly not opening up any new ones. So this shows that we can work with the government around much needed improvements and labour safeguard now is better because of the work that we have been able to collaborate on. I'm sorry that the opposition is sitting there blank faced not wanting to hear that, um, Chair, but we will keep pushing, we will keep campaigning on the ground with people and we will create a movement that is serious about climate action and we will continue to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister, did you want the call? Well, I'm conscious that, that there are more general contributions, but it happens that Senator Cox has canvassed a range of matters which actually are contained in the amendment. So I thought perhaps I might take the opportunity to move the government amendment and then the debate can flow from there. Um, so I seek leave to move uh, the amendments one to four on sheet SK147 uh, together. One to four or one to fourteen? Oh, fourteen. Okay, yeah. thank you. So the question uh, before the chamber is that we move government amendments one to fourteen on sheet SK one four seven, and the motion is that the amendments be agreed to. All of those in favour, say aye. 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 Oh. Uh, Sorry, I was a little too quickly. I think I may require leave to move these together. Is, that, is leave granted for the 1 to 14 to be moved together? Is leave granted? Leave is granted, said Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, so today the government is moving amendments uh, to amend the objects of the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act to specify that net covered emissions from safeguard facilities decline consistent with Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and that covered emissions decline over time, that each facility has a material incentive to reduce emissions and that the competitiveness of trade exposed industries is appropriately supported as Australia and its regions seize the opportunities to move to a global net zero economy. These amendments also require public advice from the Climate Change Authority on how emissions are tracking against the carbon budget. Importantly, they add a requirement to make changes to subordinate legislation if the budget is not on track or to take other steps to address that problem. To inform this advice, the Environment Minister would be required to provide information about emissions from proposed actions that are likely to result in a new facility being covered by the safeguard mechanism or a safeguard facility increasing its emissions after approving the action under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. This advice would be provided to the Climate Change Authority and to the Minister responsible for the Climate Change Act. And in the coming weeks, the Minister will be releasing associated rules which are required to enable these changes. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunningham. 
Thank you, uh, Chair. And look, I um, appreciate the acknowledgement from the minister that we, there's a lot more general that we need to cover with regard to this, uh, despite having moved into the government amendments. And look, it is in relation to those amendments, as I said before, that came to the table uh, not that long ago that we are still working our way through. Yes, there's been a lot of public commentary. Um, there was a couple of second reading speeches given last night that gave voice to what it was that the amendments that have, or the agreement that's been reached, uh, what effect they would have. A few areas of conflict over the extent to which these amendments would um, reach. But uh, we'll, we'll come to that a little later on. I just want to go back to the question I didn't really get an answer to, because I asked for a specific date uh, and time from the minister about when drafting instructions were issued for the amendments that we now have, that we were only provided not long ago, within the last hour or so, uh, and of course the uh, supplementary explanatory memorandum. So I'll ask that question again, but also I'd be interested to know, in addition to that, when uh, the uh, drafted amendments were first seen by the government and those that they are doing this deal with, the Australian Greens and anyone else on the Crossbench, and just in doing that, I, you know, I took great uh, interest in the timeline of the path to uh, where we are today, and the announcement that was made on the 27th of March, as you said, Minister, post discussions with a range of stakeholders, including, uh, as I understand it, members of the Crossbench. What I was interested in is a series of amendments have been moved; they have material effect. They alter what was announced. Uh, as part of your election package. They change what was taken to the election. They also change what was consulted on uh, at around August. 8th of August was the date you provided. Um, the consultation on the Safeguard Mechanism Credit Scheme on the 10th of October. They change what was introduced in November. So I'm just interested uh, in post all of that, and you reference discussions um, that culminated in the announcement on the 27th of March. What public consultation around the detail of what we're talking about here? Because, and that's why I'm asking these questions about when were instructions issued for drafting? When were they seen? Who by? Because this is important to understand how much sunlight has been shone on the deal that's been done with the Greens. Um, while we try and get our head around this, and I continue to ask these questions between now and when the Labor Party in partnership with the Greens will guillotine debate tomorrow on one of the most uh, serious laws and the impact it will have on the economy, that will all be guillotined. We won't get a chance beyond one o'clock tomorrow to discuss this further and it will be left to the people of Australia to make a decision about whether this was good or not. And I do have to uh, take issue with some of the points that uh, Senator Cox made. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I appreciate anyone who comes into this place with strong conviction, uh, but I tell you who we stand in the corner of, and that is in the corner of the consumer, mm -hmm. the household that's paying more for electricity, for fuel, for food, more on their mortgage. The consumer, the household, the business that were all promised before the last election that these things would go down, but they're not. And we will come to exactly how this legislation is going to put downward pressure, as Senator Farrell has said innumerable times this week on the cost of living, because I'd be interested in how this fits into this narrative the government has got running. How does the safeguard mechanism—and you don't have to answer this now, we'll have a lot of time to answer this—drive down the cost of living for Australian households? But back to the question at hand. When were drafting instructions issued? By whom? When were drafts returned? Who saw them? Uh, as a lead-in to us now having a debate in the Senate on amendments that were only circulated for us to consider and vote on today, perhaps into tomorrow morning, um, yeah, post some extensive second reading speeches. You'd think if there was a capacity for uh, these things to be uh, considered in a you know, good faith discussion around this, and yes, you know what, we are opposed to what this uh, bill establishes and sets out to do, because it is a new tax. It is not going to deliver the environmental outcomes that the government claim it will. It's going to make things worse, because we are part of a thing called the world. When you tax businesses out of existence here in Australia, you know what they're going to do? And I, I think Senator Rice might benefit from a bit of education here, because uh, the thing is, if it's more expensive to do business here, like, I don't know, manufacture cement, aluminium, 
or indeed engage in native forestry in this place, you're going to do it somewhere else where those jurisdictions, those countries, do not care about the impact on the environment. It's called offshoring. And it, it counts when it comes to emissions as well, as Senator Cadell says. Uh, so by tidying up our own backyard and forcing some of these businesses offshore, because I don't believe there are assurances to keep these businesses here and minimise their impact on the environment uh, and work with those businesses to do so, not only are we offshoring the emissions, we're also offshoring their jobs and the economic value to the community. So again, huge changes proposed in these last-minute amendments, part of the dodgy deal between this one group of people. Go by different names, Labor, Green, one team, always are, always will be. That's the kind of thing they do. Team up to shut down the economy, to pick on regional Australia. Um, but yes, some more detail around those timelines would be very helpful because we all know this is leading to one thing, and that is economic Armageddon. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Senator Han oh, Minister. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Chair. Um, uh, it's a curious way to characterise what I consider a very straightforward process of public consultation. And I won't go through the timeline again, but the government has taken um, the approach of consulting very, very widely with a very wide range of stakeholders over an extended period of time in arriving at this point. And so, Senator Dunningham, you are quite right that uh, the position paper released on the 8th of August asked a series of questions. The position paper released in January this year, uh, I should say 8th of August 22, asked a series of questions and sought feedback on that. The position paper released on the 10th of January this year um, similarly sought um, feedback on a range of more detailed propositions and consultation on the detail that is before the parliament and the detail that is proposed to be placed into the associated um, subordinate legislation has been very wide-ranging indeed. And that not only is that not unusual from a government committed to a proper policy process, it's actually necessary. And so a very large range of people have been engaged in discussions. Um, I'm not personally privy to every one of them, um, but I am conscious that both the department um, and the minister have been engaged with a range of stakeholders in bringing this together. Um, the specific questions around drafting, I'll see what information I can provide to you, but of course, drafting is the end product of a policy process, and the policy process has been very public indeed. Senator Hanson. Well, as an independent member of this uh, Senate, and I have to agree with the coalition with regards to this, because I'm absolutely disgusted that in less than an hour ago I was given your amendments to this bill. You have disregarded my position in this place, and it's either um, incompetency or sheer arrogance that you bring this amendment on into this chamber at such a late date, and you intend to guillotine this debate. So you have no regard for my position or my colleagues' positions or anyone else in this place other than yourself and the Greens and David Pocock. I don't know what deals you've done with Jackie Lambie or uh, what, uh, because if they're supporting this bill, but you have no regard. This is not the first time this has happened. It happened with the IR bill as well, that I got the final documents on the Wednesday night to my office at 9.30 and it was guillotined and pushed through on the Thursday in this place. I spoke to the Prime Minister about this, that I was not happy with not getting information. I'm not getting briefed by the ministers. I have not had one oh yes, I'm sorry I have. Murray Watt did come to my office one time to discuss the dairy bill to me, but that's the only one. Labor does not contact my office to actually give me briefings or to explain to me about their bills. Nothing. I have to, and, and apart from that, you cut back my staff so that I can't get across all this legislation that's rammed through this place, but it's OK for David Pocock. He had the legislation, the IR bill, on the Sunday. He made it up his mind he was going to support it on the Sunday. We had no idea till the following Wednesday. So this is absolutely atrocious and disgusting on behalf of this government. I've been in Parliament 
uh, in this place in 1996. So I've worked with the coalition government at that time. I've worked here under the Turnbull government. I've worked here under the, um, the Morrison government. And this is the worst government I have ever come across to work with in this place that rams this legislation through, disregards the disdain that you have for other members in this chamber is unbelievable, sheer arrogance. And by doing that, my place is here because of the people of Queensland voted for me. Voted for me. I have every right to be here and I have every right to actually be paid the respect and to get um, this legislation in enough time that I can revise it. Now, you say consultation with the businesses. Well, I, I don't agree with you on that. I don't believe there has been enough consultation because you just have come up with your policies. And I've spoken to businesses as well who are not happy with this. Minister, I just want to ask you a couple of questions because in this, in this bill here that you've put up, um, this is SK 147. You say in the first paragraph three, it says um, net total net safeguard emissions for all of the financial years between the 1st of July 2020 and the 30th of June 2030 do not exceed a total of 1,233 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. Can you tell me what emissions have been used um, to date? Minister. Senator Hanson, I was listening uh, to your question, but what was the start date that you uh, were seeking to reference? But here in your uh, paper, SK 147, um, number three, schedule 1B. So it says that the years between the 1st of July 2020 and the 30th of June 2030 that the safeguard emissions do not exceed a total of 1,233 million tonnes. So I want to know what your emissions to date have been so far. Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson, it's a very specific question. I will seek advice um, on it. Um, and I'll come back to you, if I, if I can, uh, at some point in the debate. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Um, because you know these businesses have the next seven years then to actually you know <laughs> find out how many emissions they're in t they're unable to uh, to put out there and running their businesses and companies before they get taxed by you, um, Minister. You've actually going to increase your immigration into the country quite considerably. Actually, the article said the highest immigration intake in the history of this nation. Can you tell me um, how much a single person um, emits in carbon uh, emissions in a, in a single year, please? Minister. Uh, Senator Hanson, it's highly subjective, um, but perhaps what I can say is that when um, the Australian government considers its emissions projections, one of the things it contemplates is the level of economic activity. And of course, population size is a feature um, of uh, projections for economic activity. I might uh, indicate also that I have some advice that between the period in relation to your question about the emissions um, in, in the period you referenced. Uh, it is an approximation, but between the 1st of July 2020 and the 1st of July 2023, around 140 million tonnes. Sorry? 420 million tonnes, my apologies. Senator Hanson. Right. OK, I'll go back to the immigration one. You, you, by the year 2030, so the people of Australia know what's, what uh, you're doing here. You're increasing the immigration to the country, and by 2030, it's estimated around about two million, probably even two million more. That's just per, that's people coming to live here to Australia, migrants. Let alone the students, let alone tourists, let alone everyone else. But for those two million or more people, I'll tell you. Do you have? No, I'll ask you. We'll see if you've done your sums. How much emissions will these two million new migrants up to 2030 is going to? Um, release in Australia of their CO2? Minister. 
Senator Hanson, Young, oh, Senator Hanson, my apologies. I, I think I have already answered your question, both by indicating that it's highly dependent, both on the individual but also the technologies that are in place in the Australian economy at that time. Uh, I've also indicated that in thinking about our projections, uh, in preparing our projections for emissions, the level of economic activity is contemplated, and that includes population projections. Uh, so I think. Senator Hanson, I have probably answered your question, um, uh, although perhaps not in terms that you would like. Senator Hanson. Um, no, Minister, you haven't answered my question because if you actually are going to um, penalise these companies from trying to actually um, industries and manufacturing, and you've just um, passed a bill to get industri industries and manufacturing going in Australia, and that's what you purport, but under this bill you're basically going to penalise them. But what I'm saying here is that you're increasing your immigration by about nearly two million people into Australia. Forget about the impact it's going to have on housing, hospitals, infrastructure, water, everything else. We're talking about this whole bill is purely about CO2. So I'll tell you something that you don't know. By the immigrants coming into nearly two million people in the country by 2030, you're going to have 45 and a half million tons, million tons, 45 and a half million tons of CO2 extra into it. Tell me, Minister, is the government to buy? Is the government going to buy carbon credits for their emissions, Minister? Um, Senator Hanson. I'm not sure about the source of um, your information, but I think uh, that the question you're asking uh, fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the policy proposals before the chamber. Senator, I'm sorry, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, no, you're avoiding the question. It's, got, it's very relevant because we're talking about carbon emissions in this country, and you're actually pulling back to, um, in many, many areas, and especially carbon. So when you're bringing migrants in the country that emit that much emissions, you are avoiding the question. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't done your research. That's felt the consultation hasn't gone forward. You cannot answer the Australian people with regards to this. Another thing I want to ask you, Minister, is. Um, Adam Bant put out on a tweet, he said, fossil fuel shares fell yesterday after the Greens secured a limit on coal and gas expanding. To those wanting to open new coal, mine, coal and gas mines, your days of wrecking the climate for profit are numbered. Minister, are you aware that there are many um, millions of Australians who, under their super rate, super rate, Annuation have shares in this coal and gas. Do you, are you proud of the fact now that you have destroyed a lot of their future superannuation that they need for the future? Minister. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Senator Hanson. Um, uh, there are uh, with respect um, to the statement that you referenced, um, I'd start by thanking the Greens for the constructive way that they have approached discussions. Um, that particular characterisation of the effect of the amendments is not one that we would agree. Uh, I, I appreciate that this is a, a talking point, but this was not part of the government's negotiations. So the safeguard reforms actually take into account likely new entrants. Uh, and they still deliver 205 million tonnes of abatement. Um, the scheme is actually about ensuring that our biggest emitters can thrive in a net zero world by investing in technology that brings their emissions down. So uh, I think many of the premises in your question uh, are not entirely accurate, um, but I thank you for the question. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, in the vein of not having any questions answered, uh, and I acknowledge there was a public consultation process on everything except the amendments that we have before us, I'm just going to give up on seeking the information I was after there. And just in relation to some of these things that have been agreed to between the Greens and the Labor Party about imposing this new taxation system on emitters, um, what I do want to know is. How much of what is going to be set up will be done by subordinate 
legislation, you referenced some in an earlier answer, of what's been agreed to. What are we dealing with here of what's been agreed to and what will be dealt with by way of delegated legislation? Uh, because I think that is in the same vein as the complaint Senator Hanson made around uh, the complete disdain for anyone who wasn't part of your negotiation, um, any party or grouping of uh, senators that didn't sign up to safeguard at the last election has um, you know, been characterised as saying no. Well, you tell, I'll tell you what, we do say no to higher taxes. We do say no to offshoring emissions. We do say no to uh, driving up the cost of electricity. We do say no to penalising hardworking Australians with bad policy which will not deliver the outcomes the government say it will. So I'd be interested to understand how much hidden uh, legislation there will be. That sure, we'll get to have a look at it uh, because it is disallowable um, by its nature. But if it's part of the agreement, and we're here voting on this legislation today, again pointing out the fact that uh, amendments, which um, are a very important part of any proper democratic debate on legislation, uh, and notwithstanding the long period of time between the election and when the policy was announced prior to the election and the tabling of the first uh, round of um, draft laws, uh, a lot has changed. And to sort of point to that front end of the process being very important and uh, to minimise this end, which is actually where we make laws, where we are voting on behalf of the people we represent about what is good, what is bad, uh, will it have the effect the government says it will? This is what we're interrogating now. It's important to also understand uh, what of this will be tucked away and hidden in delegated legislation um, and uh, what effects those changes might be. Um, additionally, too, I'm, I'm very interested, and we will come back to this, this difference of opinion between the government and the Greens over uh, the nature and effect of the agreement that's been reached here. I, I will interrogate that a bit later on, so i just uh, flag that now, because I think this is important uh, for the people of Australia, who obviously have heard all the talking points uh, through the various interviews that have been conducted, doorstops by Mr Bant and others around the success they've had at um, strangling the fossil fuel sector. Um, but a very different take on things here from you, Minister, so I'll be interested to interrogate that. But the basic question I have here is uh, what of uh, the changes to what was put on the table originally is going to be found in delegated legislation? Has anything been drafted yet uh, in terms of the delegated legislation? Um, if it's commenced but not yet completed, what stage are we at? Who's being consulted on that? Is it the same group of people that had the broad conversations you referenced with the culmination of the 27th of March announcement? Um, and I suppose I'd be interested to understand whether the Australian Greens are helping you draft these uh, pieces of delegated legislation. Uh, and will there be a public discussion about these things before they're tabled here in the Senate? Minister. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Dunningham. Um, as I indicated, the government undertook an extensive process of consultation, including in the earliest parts of this year, following the release of, the detailed, of our detailed discussion paper about the approach that we wanted to take. And uh, a couple of days ago, on the 27th, Minister Bowen made an announcement about some of the changes we proposed in response to representations from a range of different stakeholders. Um, and there are a number of changes, some of which are being dealt with in the amendment that's before you, and it's a single amendment, and I think the impact of that amendment is, is clear to you. Um, but there are some others that will be dealt with through different means. So one of which um, is that uh, we have made clear publicly that there will be additional funding available for the manufacturing sector and for trade-exposed industries through the Powering Your Region Fund. Uh, there will also be a change in the approach uh, and some specific treatment for hard-to-abate value-added manufacturing, uh, including a different threshold for manufacturers to qualify for a discount on their decline rate. And that reflects the particular characteristics of this sector as a value-adding industry. Uh, those changes uh, would be reflected in the rules rather than in the core legislation, and that's consistent with the overall architecture of the legislation before the chamber. Um, the government has also committed to commissioning a review to examine the feasibility of an Australian carbon border adjustment mechanism. And we've um, 
that's obviously been the source of some discussion and an area of some interest for the industries we're engaged with. Um, most of the remaining changes are dealt with through the legislation. Uh, perhaps only to say this, that we have of course emphasised um, that the Chubb review remains an area of focus uh, and the government will continue with implementation of the Chubb review to ensure integrity in the carbon market. Um, I'm conscious, um, Senator Dunningham, um, of trying to provide a balance between uh, what is quite a, a level of detail that will be contained in the rules um, and material that you know, we can engage with in the debate this morning. But those are the main points um, and those are the ways that we intend to progress them. Thank, thank you, Minister. Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Chair. And uh, thank you, Minister, for being able to sort of break those things out. Uh, that is interesting and we will come back to those um, specific elements that will find their way into delegated legislation later on in the committee stage. Uh, what I do want to know is what modelling the government has done uh, on the impact, the financial impact on businesses and households of the changes that have been agreed to with the Greens. Um, because noting you did indicate that most of the changes as set out in the proposed amendments to legislation are clear. Uh, yes, they are, I'm sure, once we get through reading the document, which was only an hour ago uh, that it was provided to us, it will become clear. But uh, what is important as we do move forward, and we will have to vote on these things no later than one o'clock tomorrow, uh, I want to know what modelling has been done about the impact on power prices, the cost of fuel and other sources of energy that households and businesses would have, inputs to manufacturing processes like fertiliser, for example, any modelling that has been done on the way through as part of these discussions, which culminated in the 27th of March decision, because any good government would go and model requests from a party like the Greens to understand whether it was indeed good for the economy or bad. In the absence of modelling of these changes, I'm very concerned that we've just signed up for an expedient political deal. So I'm hopeful you'll be able to tell me that modelling has been done, uh, that it's uh, rather thorough, and perhaps you might provide it to us. Additionally, one further question on the issue of modelling. The modelling that was hidden from the Australian Senate by way of PII claim. Uh, was that at any point shown to the Australian Greens as part of the discussions that occurred in the lead up to the agreement around the announcement on the 27th of March? That modelling that we sought, was it shown to any member of the Australian Greens, any member of their staff or anyone associated with them uh, when it was hidden from the committee of the Senate and indeed the coalition? Thanks, Chair. Um, the issue around modelling has been canvassed in Senate estimates, it's been canvassed in the Senate committee, and I think you know the government's response, which is that um, general equal. Perhaps Senator Hughes would like the call. Senator Hughes. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, just to reiterate the point that Senator Dunning has made, uh, has the Greens been showing the modelling that was refused to the coalition to Senator Hanson? And why, if the modelling reflects so positively on this legislation, will you not share it with those decision makers in this Senate? Minister. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, look, these issues were canvassed in Senate estimates. They are also canvassed, as I understand it, in the Senate inquiry that took place into the legislation we're now debating. Um, I think the answer uh, there are two answers. One is that I think Treasury provided advice that they didn't do modelling on the impact on the overall economy. Modelling was undertaken uh, in the potential for on-site abatement at safeguard facilities and implications for the carbon market. And as the minister has said and has been discussed in this place, uh, this is not only cabinet in confidence, but it is price sensitive information as the Commonwealth is the largest purchaser of ACUs. Um, the answer to the question about whether or not uh, 
the members of the Greens uh, or staff have been shown this modelling, I'm advised that the answer is no. Senator Dunningham. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll uh, take the government at their word that they did not share with the Greens the modelling that they so desperately sought originally in this debate, and somehow that desire for transparency and um, you know understanding what underpinned the government's uh, proposal here suddenly just evaporated. Anyway, uh, let that speak for itself. Uh, so there was. I just want to unpack that answer around modelling of the impacts of the changes arising out of the agreement with the Greens and others. Uh, I just would like to understand from your answer. So Treasury did some analysis of on-site abatement, I think you said, uh, and I'm sure you have a chance to respond when we come back in the afternoon, because we're about to suspend, I understand. Uh, but was there any analysis taken by any department or any minister's office, any third party outside of government around what these changes that have been agreed to with the Australian Greens would have on, for example, power prices, um, fuel costs, uh, inputs into the manufacturing process like in industries like the fertilising, uh, fertiliser manufacturing sector? I think it's important to understand that in the government who went through a very lengthy consultation process publicly and presented a bill, one yes we disagreed with, uh, but you, you highlighted the importance of getting it right. How, I just wonder whether you can indicate to the Senate whether you've gone through the same level of in-depth analysis to assure yourselves that what you're signing up to here to get a bill through isn't going to have a negative impact, given you've put so much work into making sure that this thing actually works in the way that the Australian government said it uh, should before the election. Um, again, I disagree with the assessment the government is uh, putting forward here that it will improve environmental outcomes and improve economic outcomes. I think it will, in fact, be disastrous on both counts. Mm. But I would just love to, when we do come back to the debate a little later on today, get an assurance from you that you haven't sold us up the creek uh, with no modelling on their proposals that you have agreed to. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, as it is uh, now 12.15 pm, the committee will report to the Senate. Uh, the committee reports progress pursuant to order. I now call on Senator Statements and I call Senator Stell. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And with the five minutes I have, I want to put some uh, happiness into what was a dire situation in January this year up at Fitzroy Crossing in the Kimberley in WA. And we all know the damage that was done. We know this once in 100 year flood. We've seen the, 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 the wreckage of what, what once was the uh, bridge across the mighty Fitzroy River. It's gone. And we also know that 92 homes have been destroyed. And those of us who do work in that part of the world, Senator the yourself, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, when we talk 92 homes, we're talking a lot of people that have been put out. So I'm happy to say that the state government has uh, been able to uh, access um, a camp that was donated. That's now being put in place. I'm working with the state government and the people of Fitzroy because what I do, as most people would know, I cut um, the second-hand furniture. It's all been donated up to Fitzroy Crossing in Kununurra. So I'm working closely with the community up there. But I just want to acknowledge that at the end of April, but that's the time when we can get the furniture up there, um, that uh, there are some fantastically generous people. I also throw this invitation to Senator O'Sullivan and Senator Cox. If you are around Fitzroy Crossing at the end of April, please pop in, because this has always been with me. No blue, no red, no green. We're all Team WA on this sort of stuff. But I want to acknowledge some very, very, very dear friends of mine. Don Bantock from Bedshed in uh, Osmond Park and uh, Midland, and of course the Greater Bedshed Company, particularly through the stores of Joondalup and Coburn, have donated for the people of Fitzroy 120 king and queen size mattresses. I'd like to, but Don does this year in, year out, twice a year between Kununurra as well. I'd like to acknowledge Sleep Easy. So Sleep Easy have donated 100 double mattresses. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some wonderful people I met just recently, Peter and Faye Lynch from Tent City in Victoria Park. They were closing down and they've donated 100 camper beds, 50 stretcher beds and 50 stackable chairs. 
I can't thank my dear friend Nick Dadamo from Keys Moving Solutions enough. Nick and I have been mates for, uh, oh, well, it would be uh, 40 years now I started Nick in the transport industry because I was a ripe old age of 20 and he was 19. Uh, and uh, he went on to uh, now own the largest removal company in WA. Nick's been a great partner on our Waste to Wages program up into Kununurra, Wyndham and Warman, but he's also been fantastically supportive of what we do in Fitzroy Crossing. Nick throws his, one of his uh, removal vans at me and I run around and go pick up all the donated furniture. We have a warehouse in Myaree that is uh, Marawarra Warras, and we filled the uh, uh, we filled the warehouse with donated furniture, which will be going up at a later date on another run. I'd also like to acknowledge a very, very, very dear friend of mine as well, Justin Kadachi, Centurion Transport for us West Aussies, Queenslanders, Northern Territorians. Centurion Transport is no stranger to the massive task that they perform carting freight throughout this nation. Justin donates to me one of the latest prime movers, and I have to be honest, I get a bit sooky. I always end up with a Camworth. He throws three trailers at me. He throws two dollies at me. He also gives me a fuel card and says, knock yourself out whatever you need. And I just want to put some perspective around that. So when my mates in the trucking industry, thank you, Justin, throw all this gear at me, not only does it take that prime mover, those three trailers, those two dollies out of their circuit for, for the eight days that I do the run, but they also give me a fuel card. Think about this. Diesel fuels at $2.30 plus in WA. And my round trip to Fitzroy and back is no less than 5,000 kilometres. And at $2.50 per litre, at 5,000 kilometres, rule of thumb, the triple road train uses a kilometre a litre. We do the sums very quickly and you will see that there are three zeros. Well, there's four zeros because it's about a 10. Donation on top of that plus Justin and Centurion provide the three trailers. Not only they do that, but they run the three trailers out to the depot with their other drivers and other prime movers while we load them all up, run it all back to the depot. I have to go. They don't, I, don't, I won't know off that easy. I've still got to hook the road train up. You'd think they'd do that for me now at the age of 63, but they do get the third trailer up to Woburn for me. So I cannot thank them enough for that, everyone involved, but also the Motor Trades Association in Fitzroy Crossing, Fitzroy Motors, as we all know, lost everything in the flooding. They could not get insurance because they're on a floodplain. The Motor Trades Association and Steve Moyer and his members have stepped up to the plate and they have do donated thousands of dollars worth of tools that I'll be taking up as well. So I thank them all for their generous support. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Today I'm delighted to talk about Friends of Dementia. We had a, an event here in uh, the Parliament House this morning. It's hard to believe, but that friendship group has been going for 20 years. That's a significant amount of time that uh, Dementia Australia has been driving uh, education and awareness programs through Parliament. So I'm delighted to be the co-convener of that friendship group with uh, Noel and Marina. So I just want to give a big shout out to uh, Professor Graham Samuel, AC, for his leadership as the chair, and of course, Marie McCabe as the CEO of Dementia Australia, but to all the staff that helped put this showcase around technology today say thank you very much because every single day that I get the opportunity to talk about dementia and to, to raise uh, awareness around dementia, then I will continue to do that. It is quickly becoming the biggest killer of Australians. That's the reality. At the moment, it's the uh, biggest killer of women in this country, but it will overtake heart disease. So it's very significant. And I've had the experience of a family member having early onset uh, dementia and how that impacts that family, how it impacts the economy and the support that is needed. But this week, thank you to uh, Senator Marielle Smith. She brought um, some wonderful speakers talking to us uh, last night in relation to childhood dementia. I mean, there wasn't a, a dry eye in that room. When you hear a mother talking about um, her two children, her daughter and her son, they, she showed us a, a beautiful video of the two children uh, the day after they had received their diagnosis. Well, her daughter is now 14. She's got uh, the body and strength of a 14-year-old. 
but her mind and her capacity is that of an 18-month-old child. She has lost her ability to speak. And then, having gone through this thus far, and she knows what the end will be because the life expectancy is normally only your, your late teens, is she will watch her son. She will watch her son go down that same path. So part of my responsibility as being uh, the co-convener of Friends of Dementia is to raise awareness. And technology is an additive that will help people on that journey lead a better life. But we have to educate our nurses, our GPs, our AMBOs, people in accident and emergency who are all are wonderful professionals. But the reality is people who are going into residential aged care or providing that care in people's homes need to have a greater understanding of what that journey is all about, how confusing it can be. Well, I can tell you this morning I tried out the new goggles that they have. There's a, they're always being updated. It's a, it's a wonderful experience to put those goggles on and the earphones and then try and navigate your way out of a, in a virtual reality of being in a bedroom trying to find your way to the bathroom. You will see the impact that uh, pattern carpet will have. When you're looking through these goggles, because this is what people who have dementia experience, you see that floor coming up at you and there's all these bugs crawling around. When you go into a bathroom, if you ma I did manage to get to the bathroom. I thought I was, but I was actually in the laundry. But what, what you need to do is be able to distinguish between the hand basin and the toilet. Now, some years ago, I went uh, to Scotland and I went to Stirling University. And over there then, they actually had uh, a room set up with all the additional things we should be providing to people who are still living at home uh, with dementia. And that is, you, don't, you need to have a glass door for the refrigerator so they can see that. You need to have proper lighting so you're not actually creating shadows. You, you need to be able to distinguish, as I said, between the toilet and the hand basin. And the colours that you use in that bathroom or mats on the floor where somebody with dementia will see a, what we would see as a dark colour mat, but in fact they see that as a whole. So we have to continue to raise awareness. So I encourage uh, all those who are listening to this and are in the chamber to reach out to, Dent to Dementia Australia, take that journey and have that experience. It will give you a greater understanding and I'm sure more empathy, but we need more money in the budget as well. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator's statements is a, is a great time to be able to hear from senators and the issues that they really care about. And I'm following on from Two very good presentations here to the Senate. Uh, firstly, Senator Polly, that was an outstanding uh, contribution yeah. that you've just made, and, and the, uh, I just want to commend you for the work that you do in highlighting uh, the impact of dementia and your support for people that are suffering dementia, not just them, the patients, but, but of course their families as well. Yeah, yeah. I recently gave a contribution on this subject uh, recently. Uh, a good um, family friend of mine tragically passed away, and. Uh, um, you know, I've seen the, the ravages of, uh, of dementia on their family and, and indeed in my own family, and so uh, I thank you. And, uh, and Deputy President, Senator Still, uh, your, your work in the, uh, across the, the Kimberley uh, and your presentation before was, was outstanding. Uh, you didn't do it just to um, brag about the work that you do, while you, know, you, were, you would be within your rights to do that because it's commendable work, but you did it to highlight the support that you've received in, uh, in, in providing all those mattresses and, and providing that support to a community that, that desperately needs support. And uh, I commend you for it. But, uh, for those that don't know, Senator Stirl and I are co-patrons of the Men's Shed up in Fitzroy Crossing. And uh, Senator Stirl, I think we're going to miss each other by a couple of days. You're up there uh, later in April and I'm there just maybe at the beginning of that week. So we might just miss each other, but maybe I'll see you on the road train as you although I might be in the air. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so look, uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm wanting to speak today about the, the cashless debit card, an issue that, that is um, uh, a contested policy space in this place, and uh, I, I want to uh, deal with that here today, because we're, we're seeing some big impacts 
of the cash debit card or the abolition of the cash debit card in communities across uh, across Australia where the CDC has been in operation. Now, the government uh, did flag its intention uh, to abolish the cash debit card in, as part of their campaign leading up to the election, and they will tell you that they received a mandate from the Australian people to. Uh, to abolish the CDC. I, I beg to differ because uh, the locations where the CDC is in operation, uh, those members of parliament uh, comfortably won their seat and they're all either national or, or, or liberal uh, members of parliament. Um, but that, that putting that aside, uh, the fact is that the Labor Party uh, demonised the cashless debit card as part of their campaign. Uh, they wanted to run a lie uh, throughout the campaign, saying that the coalition were going to put uh, age pensioners onto the CDC. It was an atrocious lie, because it was not something we would do. It was something I'd personally cross the floor on. I would never want to see uh, that happen, because the CDC was only ever aimed at supporting people uh, that were vulnerable, supporting people that needed the assistance, and certainly age pensioners uh, you know, have paid taxes all their lives, uh, you know, just going about their lives. They, they, there, was, there was practically no benefit for the CDC uh, for them, unless, of course, they chose to want to be on it themselves. Uh, that was a, a voluntary thing that they could do. But you know, the Labor Party ran a, uh, a scare campaign on this, and they, in order to make that scare campaign true, they had to double down on, the, uh, on, on, their, uh, on, on their resistance to the cashless debit card and they uh, sadly made the decision to take it away from communities that were getting some real benefit. Now, the interesting thing is with the CDC is, uh, you know, while the CDC was in operation, I guess we didn't have the counterfactual. We kept hearing from people saying, "Oh, the, the cash debit card doesn't work. It, it doesn't help. It doesn't help." Uh, and you know, I'd get up here and I would say something like, well, you know, you needed to have gone to the communities like I have to have seen what they were like before. Uh, you'd see that there actually has been a change. And, you know, the, uh, there'd be many uh, things thrown back and, and dismissal of that argument. Well, now we actually do have the counterfactual because we know, I certainly know what these communities were like because I you know, spent a lot of time across all of the CDC communities. And and I saw the difference that it made once it was implemented. You know, in Kununurra and the East Kimberley, Wyndham had a really—it really—it worked particularly well in Wyndham for some reason. You know, there's, there's varied degrees of, of success of the program. It worked particularly well in Wyndham. It worked particularly well in the Northern Gold Fields and in Sojourner. Uh, you know, a little marginal in other parts. I, I'm happy to—well, not happy, but I'll, I'm prepared to admit that. You know, in, in some other places it maybe wasn't implemented as well as it could have, but it was having a real impact. Well, now that the CDC has been removed, we've got that counterfactual. We see the devastating impact of its removal, just like we said it would do. And I think it's a, a, a real shame. And sadly, the government is, is dismissing those concerns. Uh, their treatment of people that speak up in these communities is frankly um, you know, very, very disappointing. Uh, we've had uh, people like Pat Hill, the mayor or the shire president of, of Laverton, uh, dismissed by Minister Elliott as, as, being, uh, uh, as being disingenuous when he talks about the difference that it's made in his community. Now, this is a, 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 a member that's lived all his life in that community. He, he was elected onto the Shire in 1992, and he's been for most of those years the Shire president, elected by his own community to be in that. And uh, uh, Shire President Hill came to uh, Parliament this week with uh, uh, others uh, from around that area, from from Leonora as well, and there were councillors that were here, and and then we had uh, we had people comment on their appearance here. As you're saying, oh, it's just a bunch of white fellas that are here. Well, Marty Sealand is Aboriginal. Like he's he's born and bred uh, Wongatha, I think it is up, up that way, uh, up in the northern gold fields. Uh, you know, yeah, he's, he's got grey hair now. You know, so he's silver, silver coloured hair. 
And so people are racially profiling people on, the, on their appearance, basically, by saying, oh, well, what, what would they know? Well, Marty Sealander, it's his community, and he talks about the impact that it was having uh, before, and he talked about the impact that it's now having, that, it, that it's gone. And, uh, you know, Pat Hill, the Shire president, was, uh, was in the papers recently, and he said that, it, uh, that it's been going downhill since they took the cash debit card cash debit card away, and it's just getting worse and worse. He said the cash debit card, it needed to be improved. He, he, he wasn't gilding the lily there. He wasn't trying to shy away from the fact that there were some ways that it could be improved. And I was really proud to be part of, uh, uh, I led a, 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 a working group. Uh, I was appointed by Senator Ann Rustin, minister at the time, to help uh, bring together the, the the, the technology providers, the, the banks and the retailers, to actually work to improve the card. Because we heard that there was some stigma attached to being on the card, that you know, you've got this card and every time you go to pay for goods there was an inconvenience in how you uh, uh, used that technology and it was a little bit clunky in how it was used, but it was also a bit of a uh, you know, stigma attached because the card did look a little bit different to the other cards that people normally use, and so there was, a, there was an issue there. So we worked hard to make sure we resolved that, and we brought the banks together, all of them, the big ones, the big ones together, the, the big retailers, the Coles and Woolies and the service stations, the BPs and Shells and Australia Post, that the, the, the would make up probably 90 per cent of the transactions that, that people would use. And we worked to improve that technology. And, 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 and so you know, we recognised that it wasn't a perfect solution. There were originally trials, but we've through that work, we were able to see that technology improve. And Pat, and Pat Hill uh, spoke about that in, in, the, in, the, in his paper up there in the Northern Goldfields. He said, you know, that keeping domestic violence and alcohol abuse under control was the aim. Something has to be done because we won't, uh, because we won't have anyone living in our town if things keep going the way that they are. And so this government, sadly, has been tinnied to, to these... Uh, to these communities calling out for it to come back. And I really hope, for the sake of these communities, for the sake of uh, the East Kimberley, for the sake of the Northern Goldfields and Sejuna, you know, on the, the Australian had an article just this weekend saying crime rates were up over summer. And again, was dismissed by the government, saying, oh, it's just because people seasonally come in and out. Well, guess what? They come in, seasonally come in and out all the time and were for the last four or five years. And we didn't see those big sort of spikes. The only difference is that the CDC is not there anymore. So look, I get it, it would be egg on your face, but government, will you please uh, listen to these communities, listen to the voices of the local people who want to see it returned. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Norman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Often in this place, I feel the weight of our duty, our duty to our kids, to young people in our community, like those sitting up in the gallery, our duty to future generations. We're nearing the end of March and we're barrelling through 2023, and there are only a few sitting weeks between now and the end of the year. That's one year closer to 2030, one less year we have to dramatically reverse our fortunes and prevent 1.5 degrees of warming. Every minute, day and week that we waste in this place tightens the noose around our collective futures. Unfortunately, wasting time is exactly what Labor seems to be doing. The Labor Party have made their priorities clear. Keep their heads down, don't rock the boat too much, and try to small target their way to another election win. Climate change and the impending crisis is not and never has been one of their priorities. Labor is completely and hopelessly in the thrall of big business. They are addicted to the millions fossil fuel companies pour into their re-election campaigns, enamoured by the sweet six-figure jobs that they stroll into after politics and terrified of getting on their bad side. No longer championing the Australian people, the Labor Party are now timid receptionists for the CEOs of Woodside and BHP tasked with making sure that the real concerns and worries of the Australian people never make it past the boss's door. It is a pathetic state of affairs when a party that is in government federally and in every single mainland state and territory is still too scared to stick a toe out of line against their bosses at Apia and the Minerals Council. 
People say that the Greens negotiated with Labor on the safeguard mechanism, but that's not actually the case. We were negotiating with Santos and Woodside and Glencore and Chevron and every other corporate lobbyist with all access passes and ministers on speed dial. While the country burns and drowns, these corporations will bleed the Australian petrostate for every cent that they can. The truth is the Labor government does not care about reducing emissions. It may care about appearing to care, but we shouldn't confuse virtue signalling with intent. How do we know they don't care about reducing emissions? Because if they cared about reducing emissions, they would have in introduced legislation that actually reduced emissions. Instead, we got a reheated and barely tweaked coalition policy that had literally been designed to fail. Think about that. In the face of looming climate collapse, when the fate of the human race hangs in the balance, Labor's keystone legislative response in the wake of the climate election was to regurgitate a bad plan from a terrible government. We're out of time. Yet Labor is acting like we have all the time in the world, that we can keep strolling along to their electoral timeline rather than scientific reality. They will obfuscate, prevaricate and vacillate until the Torres Strait Islands are underwater and our farming land is arid and the Great Barrier Reef is just a story we tell our grandkids. The politics of this situation are clear. Labor will not do what needs to be done to dramatically lower emissions unless we force them to. And I don't just mean the Greens. Our power in parliament is only as great as the movements that support us outside this building. While Labor has the entire fossil fuel industry and its vast infrastructure of wealth and influence behind it, the movement standing behind the Greens is built on people and mass organising. Rallies, protests, strikes, civil disobedience. That's what we need to fundamentally change the power of the duopoly and break the stranglehold the fossil fuel industry has over parliament. Our message is that the fight has only started. This isn't a climate war, it's the apocalypse. And we have hope because we know that the people know this and they won't stop fighting either. We promise we will keep fighting tooth and nail to drag this parliament into taking climate action. We dragged the safeguard into actual operation, with emissions likely to go down now rather than up by taking a guillotine to Labor's 116 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline. By hook or by crook, we will continue the fight for no new coal and gas. There is no alternative. We fight because we have to. Because when I look into the eyes of my grandchildren, Billy and Esther, I know that is the only choice we have. Senator Shelton. Uh, thank you. Uh, like many in this place, I'm a very strong supporter of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to the parliament. That's pretty simple in my mind. Should Indigenous Australians be recognised in the Constitution? Well, that's a resounding yes. Should Indigenous Australians be consulted on matters that directly impact them? Again, yes. Now, doing these two straightforward things doesn't diminish anyone else. It doesn't come at anyone else's expense. They're matters of common sense and common decency. Consulting people who are impacted by policy will always result in better informed policies and better informed decision making. When people have a voice, not only does it deliver better outcomes for those people, but it also tends to deliver better outcomes for the community at large. And now, I'm, I'm not only talking about in the, co the context of the voice to parliament. I'm also talking about people, all people, having a voice at work. That means having a voice and having a say over your pay and conditions. I put a very simple question to all senators in this chamber. Should working Australians have a voice at their workplace? I would hope that every person in this place regardless of political affiliation, would say yes. Now, if we can all agree that all Australians deserve a voice at work, then I'm sure we can also agree 
that that voice must actually be heard and respected. A voice that can, be, can, that can just be silenced or ignored without reason or consequence is no voice at all. And I hope that we would all agree on that very obvious point. Now, I know there are many employers that agree with that proposition, but unfortunately, there are some that don't. Some have made very, very, very clear through their actions that they have no respect whatsoever for the right of their workforce to have a voice. Now, take Woodside, one of the largest and most profitable companies in Australia. Eight months ago, a majority of Woodside workforce at its northwest shelf offshore platforms voted to bargain collectively through the Australian Workers' Union and the Maritime Union of Australia. Rather than respect that decision of their workforce, Woodforce, Woodside launched 11 legal challenges which dragged their workforce through the Fair Work Commission for eight months. Each one of these legal challenges more ridiculous than the last, and every single challenge was thrown out. Now let's take Qantas which illegally sacked 1,700 people because, as the federal court found, Qantas did not want their workforce exercising their workplace voice. Qantas has also been prosecuted for safe work for sacking Theo, a cabin cleaner and health and safety rep, because he used his workplace voice to speak out about Qantas' unsafe work practices. Then again, let's take Aldi, the most profitable supermarket in this country. Unlike Coles and Woolworths, Aldi refuses to commit to safe and sustainable standards for their truck drivers and their supply chain. When Aldi drivers and the union representatives spoke out about this, Aldi tried to silence them through the federal court. Thankfully, Aldi failed to silence their workforce and the court threw their claim out. Or take Amazon, the wealthiest company on the planet, a company with a reputation around the world of spying on its workforce, as detailed in the Amazon report by Uni Global, a company that has invested heavily in intimidating its workforce into not having a voice, including in Australia where they had been caught red-handed spying on workers talking to the shop distributor of Allied Employees Union. Amazon is a world leader in silencing its workforce. But even they have been borrowing a few tricks from the former Prime Minister, John Howard. Because I've seen, wheeling out the ex I've seen them wheeling out the exact same line that Liberal Party hacks have been wheeling out since the Howard government. The line I'm talking about is how important it is, apparently, is to protect the right of people not to join a union, rather than protecting the right of people to join a union. And we need to call this ridiculous phrase out for what it is. It's a dog whistle to employers like Amazon, Aldi, Qantas and Woodside to crack down on their workforce's voice. When we talk about people having a right to be paid to paid leave, we don't talk about ensuring people have a right to not have paid leave. When we talk about ensuring people have a right to superannuation. We don't talk about having a right not to have superannuation of course, unless you're Senator Bragg, when we talk about people having a right to the minimum wage, we don't talk about ensuring people have a right not to earn the minimum wage. Well, except from when those opposite defend the right of gig workers to not get a minimum wage, of course. Because the way you hear those opposite talk, you'd think there was a crisis in this country of people everywhere being forced to join a union. I shudder to think what that would look like. For starters, according to the ABS union, members earn 32 per cent more than non-union members. That's a gap of $350 per week. Imagine being forced to earn $350 more per week. Last time I checked, our problem isn't that too many Australians are benefiting from high and highly paid, secure, unionised jobs. The problem is that we had a decade of the worst wages and job security decline in the history of this country. And thanks in large part to those opposite, encouraging companies like Amazon and Qantas and Woodside to vigorously and often illegally engage in union busting. Now, what the data actually tells us 
is that 34 per cent of non-union employees would join a union if they were able to do so. That was the finding of the Australian Workplace Representation Survey just recently. That means there are three and a half million Australians who are being deprived from their desire to join a union and to have a real voice at work. Three and a half million Australians deprived of their voice. And as is often the case, the reality is actually the complete inverse of what those opposite are saying. Now, the concept of protecting the right to not join a union is an Orwellian doublespeak. But this complete nonsense is now so deeply ingrained in the psyche of those opposite that they've lost the capacity to think about these issues rationally. Now, I don't want to single out Senator Hume, who I'm sure is a smart and is a smart and competent person who legitimately believes she is in this place to help working Australians. But her comments to me at the recent public hearing of the Cost of Living Committee was astonishing. At this hearing on the 1st of March, I asked a panel of major supermarkets a series of questions about the rates of pay their workforce receives. These are literally the largest private employers in Australia. And Senator Hume, who is the chair, turned around and admonished me because apparently my questions were irrelevant to the cost of living inquiry. In her mind, and I'm sure she was being genuine, the question of wages, the question of how much money you take home is irrelevant to the cost of living. She said that they were industrial relations issues and not relevant to the cost of living. It really does boggle the mind, especially when considering Senator Hume as the shadow finance minister. You might think she would appreciate that when you look at a budget, whether it's a government budget or a household budget, that the amount of revenue coming in is pretty relevant. But over that side, ideology now trumpets reality. All they know is that unions are bad, bargaining power is made up, a made up construct, you can't have a pay rise when inflation is high because it's inflationary, you can't have a pay rise when inflation is low because businesses can't afford it. And a former Senator Stoker told me at estimates last year, if you're, if you're getting exploited at work, it's your own fault because you made the choice to work there. Now, I don't worry about the free market and, of course, don't worry because the free market will fix everything. That's their post-truth world. But over here, in the real world, we actually need to work urgently on how we can restore a voice for people at work. That means ensuring that loopholes that some employers use to get around collective agreements are closed. That means ensuring that unions have the right of entry of powers to enter work sites. And that means ensuring that three and a half million Australians who want to join a union but can't have an ability to do so. We need to get back to protecting the right of people to have a voice at work. And we need to get back to protecting the right of people to join a union. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator McKenzie. Thank you. The former coalition government had an ambitious infrastructure investment agenda. We were delivering a $120 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline of projects, providing certainty to help industry with workforce planning and investment. We committed to more than 1,200 major land transport infrastructure projects, and we'd completed more than 500 and more than 300 had started construction. Under the Coalition Infrastructure Investment, that was part of our economic strategy, part of our plan to boost overall national productivity. We invested to build infrastructure in areas ignored by state Labor governments, our regions, our congested outer suburbs and across northern Australia. Unfortunately, in their last budget, Labor cut infrastructure investment by $9.6 billion. This was the wrong call at a time of high inflation and high cost of living. 36 infra infrastructure projects were cancelled and many more delayed with funding pushed out way beyond the forward estimates, begging the question of whether they'll ever be started. Of course, many of these delayed projects were for regional infrastructure intended to enhance freight efficiency, supporting delivery of products to ports and markets. Often, because it is the nature of rural electorates, 
They are often in coalition seats. Labor also cut road safety programs in the budget. With $60 million stripped from the Black Spot Road Safety Program over the forward estimates, and more than $280 million in road safety program funding originally scheduled for this year, deferred by the Labor Party. They talk a big game when it comes to infrastructure, transport and road safety, but the numbers don't lie. That is the fact out of their first budget in October. These road safety cuts come at a time when road fatalities are continuing to rise and the Australian Automobile Association is calling on the government to urgently act. Last week, the Minister released the legislation to amend the Infrastructure Australia <coughs> Act 2008, and the bill confirms Labor's intention to shrink the infrastructure priority list. Minister King has made it clear she plans to hollow out or streamline the list of infrastructure projects. And I said last week we can expect a further partisan purge of planned road and rail upgrades which were funded under the previous coalition government. The minister was critical of our government's increase in nationally funded projects on the infrastructure list during her speech to the CEDA Infrastructure Conference last Friday. She wants to do less. The minister is softening up the public and industry leaders for further savage cuts to infrastructure projects and potentially road safety funding in the upcoming May budget. Further, Minister King's reforms seem designated to shackle Infrastructure Australia to endorsing projects that are proposed by Labor governments around the states. And it might suit them, but it's not a good sign for communities wanting to see Commonwealth driving the states to deliver more infrastructure, particularly when it's the Commonwealth taxpayer who's funding the majority of the bill, not the states. And they want to see these projects delivered in a timely and cost-effective manner. The further we push these projects out, the more they're going to cost. And as we're seeing with some of the regional project um, funding, they're having to be re-scoped or councils are actually giving back the money because they cannot afford the increases in costs. Through her consultations with state governments ahead of the October budget, the minister delivered significant project cancellations, cuts and delays. In Victoria, she agreed with Daniel Andrews that there was $1.1 billion in projects cancelled and a further $1.6 billion in cuts and delays to projects over the forward estimates right across Melbourne right across regional Victoria. In New South Wales, there were $300 million in projects cancelled and a further $2 billion in cuts and delays to projects across the forward estimates. In Queensland, the Palaszczuk government agreed that there'd be $2 billion of cuts and delays to road and rail projects, including the $200 million cut to the Sunshine Coast Rail Project. In here in Canberra, there were almost $86 million in cancelled projects, and in Western Australia, there were $539 million in cuts and delays to road projects. One of the key critical road projects cut in WA was pushing out the upgrade to the Tanami <coughs> into the long grass. Now, if you want to talk to the trucking industry in WA, if you want to talk to the Kimberley group of councils, which I had the privilege to sit down with, um, this week as they came to Canberra. That is their number one request of this government in the upcoming May budget. Instead of kicking out that funding of that upgrade, of that critical road, which will make it safer for truckies, less maintenance so they make more, and ensure the freight task into the rural and remote areas of the NT and WA is serviced, that is a critical project that needs to be brought forward. So we'll see if Minister King uh, can actually convince the Treasurer that this is a critical project, because when they last had the chance, they cut it. Continually cutting back on infrastructure projects will be a handbrake on economic growth and a barrier to driving national efficiencies that are actually needed for budget repair and tackling inflation. At the very time, the government's budget repair strategy should be to invest in productivity enhancing capital and cut back on unnecessary recurrent expenditure. Labor seemed determined to do the opposite and dooming our nation to a very long and slow and painful recovery. Labor's lack of infrastructure ambition represents a plan for gridlocked city streets, 
unsafe regional freight routes and less family time at home for both our transport industry workers and commuters. Indeed, it seems the only infrastructure the government is interested in are the white elephant projects of state Labor premiers, whether it is the massively underfunded suburban rail loop in Melbourne for Daniel Andrews or a $2.5 billion live music venue in Brisbane for Anastasia Palaszczuk. The coalition also made significant investments in regional airports, such as the Regional Airports Program, and funding to support security and screening infrastructure and operations. There is every indication in this upcoming May budget that these programs will also be cut. No new money. The former coalition government saw the importance to the economy, a bold infrastructure agenda, investing in future growth and tackling decades of underinvestment by state governments in the infrastructure needed to support the population growth. We have seen this week the government lean in a forward manner towards increasing our population significantly. Well, you cannot pour hundreds of thousands of more people into our capital cities without pouring hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into critical road projects to support that population growth. It doesn't make sense. We saw the Productivity Commission hand down uh, a report into uh, infrastructure, and we know that whilst the industry is stretched, inflationary pressures are placing tremendous pressures on project delivery. These pressures, combined with a lack of direction from the federal government, is leading to project slippage. And as I said, we've got a 40 per cent rise in the cost of reinforcing steel and structural timber. And if the Greens have their way, we won't have Australian timber with which to. Um, using the construction industry in Australia that isn't from overseas. Industry surveys and interviews indicate that the cost of construction materials has risen on average 24 per cent over the last 12 months. And Labor, the workforce, they're seeing wage increases in, in excess of 17 per cent in the last 12 months. The cost of labour within public infrastructure has grown by that much over the last 12 months. The importance of infrastructure to the Australian economy was highlighted by the Productivity Commission. 13 of the 71 recommendations of that report are directly related to the infrastructure portfolio or transport, uh, tangentially or directly. And Jim Chalmers, the Treasurer, dismissing, dismissing that report out of hand uh, shows that they're not really interested in investing in productivity enhancing infrastructure. They're more interested in cuts and delays, which will cost our uh, economy over the future. The Albanese government appears bereft of ambition or vision, lacking the understanding of the contribution that infrastructure can make to our economy and building a stronger, safer, more sustainable and more prosperous Australia. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The $4.5 billion per year National Indigenous Australians Agency has been quick to deny it's been developing demands to be made by the voice to parliament revealed in a letter sent to my office last week. I remind the Senate what some of these demands were. Aborigines paying only 50 per cent of the rate of income tax, Aboriginal groups owning beaches and national parks and charging the rest of us to use them, 10 per cent of all judges, magistrates, police officers, ADF officers, vice-chancellors and ambassadors to be Aboriginal, no entry tests and no fees for Aborigines going to university, 50 per cent discounts for Aborigines going to sport and music events on public land, Aborigines to have first claim on all public housing in Australia, reduced age of eligibility for the aged pension for Aborigines, rivers and streams to be owned by local Aborigines who will charge the rest of us for water consumption, the same for mining royalties, all new liquor licences to be vetted by The Voice and The Voice office being the same size and having the same budget as the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. As I said, the NIAA has been quick to deny this action list for The Voice, and no wonder. If any of these demands were met, 97 per cent of Australians would be made second-class citizens barely based solely on race. 
However, minutes of government organisations meetings with Aboriginal groups around the country obtained through a freedom of information request show these sorts of demands are being discussed. These include exclusive sovereignty for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over land waters, creating a new Aboriginal state from land under native title with its own constitution, a treaty or treaties recognised in the Australian constitution, racially exclusive designated seats in parliament reserved only for Aborigines, Aborigines to receive a fixed percentage of all Australian gross national product, Aborigines to be exempted from paying land tax, funding for the voice to parliament to be generated from percentages of land and water taxes, funding for Aboriginal bodies and programs to be linked to reparations for theft of land, creation of a black parliament, a race-based rent tax from an open checkbook, race-based inherent rights for Aboriginal people in the Australian constitution, renaming more towns and landmarks after Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the creation of the sovereign wealth exclusively for Aborigines, Australian taxpayers to fund the preservation of Aboriginal languages, changing the Australian flag because it symbolises the injustices of colonisation, tearing down statues of explorers, enshrining Aboriginal traditional ways of life in the constitution, changing the curriculum in all schools for non-Indigenous Australians, decolonising Australia, and fee-free access for Aborigines to sport and recreation, including free sporting equipment. Like the demands contained in the letter sent to me, many of these would also make Australians, most Australians, second-class citizens in our own country. The $4.5 billion NIAA has been actively discussing them with Aboriginal groups for years. These are the dangers of putting the voice in Parliament in the Constitution. For these and many other reasons, it's why Australians must vote no in the Prime Minister Labor's Anthony Albanese's racist referendum. What I need to also say here. You know, I've read out a lot of these claims, and a lot of people would identify with some of these demands because they're already happening. Um, we've, you know, it's tearing down of statues. Um, the, uh, you know, welcome to country. I'm sick to death of hearing about it, and I refuse to actually acknowledge it. And a lot of Australians tell me, why should I be welcome to my own country? That in itself is ridiculous. Aboriginal names, we can see the changes that have happened over the years, and they're still changing, and um, wanting to, for it to change. And to fly the Aboriginal flag in this place, it was, wasn't put to the Australian people at all. We've just accepted this flag that was just brought about in the 1970s with no authority from the Australian people and to fly it here in this parliament. I think without this, with the vote from the Australian people is appalling. So I'll tell the Australians, get ready for a very rocky, racist way of life that we will be experienced if the voice gets up. Here, here. Senator Green. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, as a member of uh, the previous opposition, um, I was very passionate about housing policy in this country. I spoke many times in this chamber about the need to invest in social and affordable housing. And that's why, as a member of the Al Albanese Labor government, I'm so incredibly proud of the policy that we have to deliver the Housing Future Fund to Australians, to make sure that we can have more affordable and social housing and investment in the housing that we really need across the country for vulnerable Australians. But the one thing standing in the way of us delivering the Housing Australia Fund is the Greens party, political party of this country standing in the way of this sensible, important investment. We've seen the politics of this issue uh, on display this week, and we know that the, those opposite in the opposition in the Liberal National Party, again, have dealt themselves out of the negotiations. So we are seeking uh, to get agreement to this legislation. Uh, but the Greens political party uh, is standing in the way of investment into housing and social housing for everyday Australians. Now, let me explain what this legislation does. 
It is the single biggest investment in affordable and social housing in more than a decade. That is what the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will do. Now, in addition to the 30,000 social and affordable homes that will be built over the next five years from this fund alone, there is additional funding here for really important things that matter, and this is what the Greens are standing in the way of. We have, from this investment, $200 million for repairs in remote Indigenous communities and Indigenous housing, something that is desperately needed and has been called on by people in those communities for years now, and that is the investment that the Greens are standing in the way of. We know that part of this investment includes $100 million for crisis housing for women fleeing domestic violence. I don't know how the Greens have managed to justify standing in the way of $100 million of crisis accommodation funding, but that is what they are saying to the Australian people that they don't support. Now, it also includes $30 million, $30 million for veterans' housing, which is incredibly important at this juncture in time when we do have pressures in our housing system that we take care of the people that have taken care of us. $30 million for veterans' housing, that is what, that is what the Greens political party is seeking to block when they stand in front of this legislation. But the thing that really really is astounding about the position that has been taken by the member for Griffith in the other place, but also Green senators in here, to stand in the way of this legislation is that it is supported by the housing and homelessness sector. They are ignoring the pleas of the very people that are dealing with the housing crisis right now. When this announcement was made, there were people who came out and supported this uh, announcement. We had Anglicare Australia, Mission Australia, St Vincent's de Paul, the Australian Council of Social Services and, of course, the Community Housing Industry Association. They all said when we announced this policy in opposition that this was an important step forward that needed to be delivered. But now we have the National Shelter Homelessness Australia, Community Housing Industry Australia and the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Association of Housing also calling, also calling for this bill to be passed by the Senate. They are pleading, pleading with the Greens to put down their political weapons, to stop making their memes for social media, to find something else to campaign on because this is too important to stop. This is too important to stop. And we know, we know that if you want to support, if you want more funding for affordable and social housing, well, the worst thing you could do is block more funding for social and affordable housing. That's exactly what the member for Griffith is doing uh, in his calls to his members in here in the Senate to stop that. The Greens political party is stopping investment in housing. Now, I don't know what the personal positions of other people in this House are, but I have spoken very personally about the fact that we, as a, as a young person, having left a domestic violence situation, was homeless with my mum, and I am here to stand up for those people that need housing and need homelessness, and the Greens are not. Your time has expired. Senator Colbeck, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, before I begin my substantive contribution today, can I acknowledge the statement made by Senator Polly earlier in the uh, Senator's statement section uh, in her role as co-chair of Parliamentary Friends of Dementia and the work that Dementia Australia is doing, and particularly the display that they have in the building today uh, relating to technology at the risk of uh, invoking the ire of the Acting Deputy President, I will um, hold up a prop, which Senator is the Colbert. Brain Track no, um, card for Dementia Australia, and I can commend the, the Brain Check uh, app from Dementia Australia to anyone who's interested. Um, it is a new piece of technology. It has already helped diagnose people with dementia, uh, and I think um, uh, a great piece of work uh, by Dementia Australia, and I do want to endorse the words of uh, Senator Polly. Um, uh, and demonstrate a clear bipartisanship in support for the work of Dementia Australia, which is really important. Uh, the, the issue that I do want to talk about today, uh, and it was my intention in taking uh, this position, was 
uh, in relation to business of the Senate notice of motion, uh, formal motion number one, which is a reference to the Finance and Public Administration uh, References Committee. It's in my name and in the name of a number of colleagues um, uh, in relation to uh, a reference into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative organisations. I think this is a really very important reference and I would have preferred to have been able to debate it later, but the fact is that the change in the way that the Chamber is operating today means that that's not possible, so I take this opportunity now. first question I ask, rhetorically I suppose, is how does this motion come about? Um, it came about due to some appearances of some of these organisations at Senate Estimates prior to Christmas, very concerning. Uh, performance at Senate Estimates. The committee offered some training to those organisations and I have to say they took that training up and uh, the, con the resultant process was very good. But at the subsequent Senate Estimates we had OREC come in and place some information on the table in their opening statement that I think is genuinely very concerning. And that goes to just their reporting process. And one of the things that we do in estimates is we scrutinise the spending of Australian taxpayers' money. And so this is what the opening statement said. Reporting compliance across Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations is unacceptably low, with 28 per cent of organisations who have failed to meet their reporting obligations for two years in a row. I mean, how is that, how, how is that acceptable? OREC works with these organisations to remind them um, the reporting obligations are not necessarily burdensome. They're catered to the organisations themselves. They have 371 corporations that are currently being deregistered. But then the opening statement goes on to say 999 corporations have failed to lodge annual reports for both 2021 and 22. 829 corporations not lodged and your reports for 21-22. I mean, if there's not a red flag in that, I don't know what is. Um, this, this is a serious reference, um, and I don't understand why this can't be dealt with immediately. We have crises in our Indigenous communities. We see it on our televisions every day, and I have to say, it is beyond me. It is tragic. It is tragic that we appear, because the government doesn't want to have a look at this, to be able to deal with it. Why can't we be looking at the real problems? And I'm not saying the voice is not real, don't get me wrong. I think it's a very important debate for this country. But why is it not possible for us to start looking at and dealing with and fixing the problems that are in clearly through the ORIC report, opening statement? in Indigenous communities across this country to ensure that the taxpayers' money that's being provided to those organisations by Australians is doing the things that it needs to be doing. Why is it not possible to do that? And I think it's completely and utterly lamentable that we'd be in a position this afternoon uh, when the vote comes that we not be permitted uh, to undertake what I think is a very, very important piece of work for this Senate to undertake. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I wish to speak about the ongoing horrors of police violence and brutality in this country. The police are an armed branch of this racist colonial project who have persecuted First Nations people and queer and trans people of all skin colours since colonisation. They have been carrying out the genocide against First Nations people for 250 years, a genocide which continues to this day. The police don't care about the safety of First Nations people or the safety of trans people. They care far more about upholding colonial systems of control and oppression as they uphold the illegal and violent occupation of land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Yet we still march alongside them at pride marches 
accept their continually increasing presence in First Nations communities and turned a blind eye to the ongoing brutality and violence committed against marginalised groups. The first Pride marches were born out of the Stonewall riots that protested against colonial laws that tried to force the queer community into corners. It was led by black, brown and white activists from across the LGBTIQ plus community and was protesting against the ongoing violence being perpetrated by this system. The first Sydney Mardi Gras in 1978 was a march in solidarity with these protests and was met with significant resistance and violence from the New South Wales police. Despite police intimidation and brutality, the 78ers took to the streets to demand equal rights and to stand united in a show of love and peace for all. Mardi Gras has now become completely corporatised and lost sight of those origins. And I stand with those in the queer community who are calling for no cops in Pride. I disagree with the police marching in Pride and do not accept their presence in the name of diversity as they continue to lock up First Nations people, murder our people in custody, steal our children and prosecute queer and trans people. This is a genocide that has never ended in this country. Such behaviour is not welcome in LGBTIQ plus communities. It's not welcome in black and brown communities, and it should not be welcome in this country. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up 3 per cent of the national population, yet we are the most incarcerated people on this planet. This is no accident. The over-policing of our communities has continued since colonisation, and our people continue to die at the hands of police and corrections, a genocide that never ended. Every change for our community, every win, has come through protest. We would not be where we are today without the courage and commitment of the 78ers and other black and queer activists who have risked their safety to demand equal rights and an end to ongoing systemic violence. The recent anti-protest laws in New South Wales work to silence us and uphold the colonial systems of control and oppression. These laws are a breach of our basic democratic right to protest and our fundamental civil liberties and aim to uphold existing power structures and silence grassroots activists fighting against this violent and oppressive colonial system. We will not be silenced. Our people have fought for justice since colonisation and I will continue to fight for an end to the ongoing systemic violence and discrimination perpetrated Order. against Your First time Nations has people. Expired. Senator Babette. Thank you. While Australians are closely watching the Reserve Bank's movements on interest rates each and every month, there is another activity of the Reserve Bank that demands our close inspection. In August of 2022, the RBA quietly announced a year-long study of central bank digital currency. This should concern every single Australian who values freedom. Under the guise of improving efficiency, the RBA study of a centralised digital currency is in fact a study on how to better regulate and control the lives of ordinary Australians. It is a study on how the state can replace cash in free citizens' pockets with a digital currency that is completely controlled by the state. 
Now, although similar to the money that you have in your net bank right now, one of the key differences is that this currency is based off blockchain technology and as such is programmable. A more accurate way of thinking about this currency is a digital voucher or a coupon. The state can decide where you can spend your money, on what you can spend it on, set an expiry date on your money and a whole lot more. The fact that the CCP is excited by the potential for central bank digital currency is a huge hint that, it, that this is not something that Australia should be pursuing. So why are we contemplating this? The World Economic Forum, under the leadership of the unelected Bond villainesque Klaus Schwab, have already declared their intention to provide citizens with a carbon allowance. We need to be given a carbon allowance, you see, in order to save the planet. How convenient. A central bank digital currency in, is the way in which such an allowance could be enforced upon every person on the planet. We are rapidly coming to a time where the state will, will replace people's cash, money citizens can spend as they wish, when they wish, on whatever they wish, with a digital currency that can be spent only as a state-controlled central bank will allow. Why would we contemplate a world in which governments could freeze your spending on certain items because you have potentially reached what they deem is a safe carbon allowance for the planet? Why would we contemplate a world in which the state can determine how you may spend and what you may spend on at all? If you don't have the freedom to buy and sell as you wish, then you don't have any freedom at all. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that governments declaring that they, may, that they must tackle some sort of financial crisis, demand that you spend your money in your account within a certain period of time before it expires. Remember Klaus Schwab promising that in the not too distant future we will own nothing and be happy he wasn't joking. Anyone who doubts that the World Economic Forum intention or the reach of their tentacles into governments around the world uh, have not been paying attention. Klaus Schwab, after all, did say that he has penetrated the cabinets, as are his words. A central bank digital currency would allow the state increased control, uh, would allow increasing levels of control uh, over our nation by globalist organisations to program our money to literally disappear if not used within a certain time frame, thus ensuring we are unable to save and therefore unable to build generational wealth. A central bank digital currency, as right now being considered by our very own RBA, is a high-tech way of turning citizens into slaves of the system. Eventually, cash may be banned, and there will be no buying or selling without the express permission of the government. No true freedom at all. It was a dark day in 1932 when our nation's currency departed the gold standard. This began a process of reducing our trust in our own currency. CBDCs will make it easier for the reserve banks to create and to control money, and it will undermine our trust even further. Now, if my parliamentary colleagues here in this place are serious, are serious about representing their electorates rather than merely waving through a very clear globalist agenda that robs people of their freedoms, then they should and must oppose the idea of a central bank digital currency with every fibre of their being. Some will say that this is a conspiracy theory, but it is not a conspiracy theory. The RBA is very closely examining this right now. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I just wish to bring to the attention of the Senate uh, some commentary recently and even as recent as in the Senator's statements uh, on The Voice uh, and also in the other House. And I'd remind senators and members of parliament that words matter and that the commentary and the hysteria uh, that's being shown towards First Nations people and in this instance, most recently, by Senator Hanson in terms of the uh, NIAA is uncalled for and totally wrong. I, I think it's really important that here we have an opportunity in the Senate uh, to call for evidence-based issues and documents to come forward. And a lot of the accusations that uh, I've certainly heard in the Senate today uh, are, are completely disgraceful. 
and I reject outright uh, the hard work uh, that uh, certainly the, the, the words of the Senator for starters, but I would say this for the staff who work uh, in the NIAA, you keep doing your job for the people of Australia. We have a significant moment in this country to do what we can to improve uh, the lives of First Nations people. And the government is following a path that we took to the election. And this kind of uh, slurs and allegations against the staff of the NIAA is not on and is most unbecoming of a senator in this place. Bring forward your evidence. Bring forward your allegations in the appropriate manner, instead of casting aspersions against the credibility <clears throat> of those who work in the public service for this parliament, for this government. And I would say to the, the Senate, the hysteria that I've heard uh, does not help uh, Australians in this country, and I would expect better of senators and parliamentarians to lead in a manner with the most respect. We do not have to agree, but we can certainly have our conversations in a manner that does not scare everyone else in this country. And I'd remind Senator Hanson that the world will not cave in, the sky will not fall down. I remember having this conversation with you over the closure of the climb at Uluru and invited you to Uluru when that decision was made, and that was made by the Uluru Karajuta Board, a comprehensive vote by those board members and the Anangu people to close that climb in 2017. And in 2019, when it did occur, I accept that you went there, but I want to remind you that this journey towards the voice and towards the referendum is also a similar journey. Do not be afraid. You know, the sky will not cave in. We can have conversations here without denigrating people, without rubbishing people, without scaring people, right. and without, certainly without making allegations that are unfounded and untrue and causing hate and horror to fester and flow. You know, that's not what this is about, and that's not what this Senate should be about. And I would just remind senators and the members of the other house that we have a fair way to go. You know, the Prime Minister said that that referendum would occur between October and December. Let's conduct ourselves in a most dignified way. And as I said, we don't have to agree, but we can certainly put our points in a much more appropriate way. Senator Ciccone. Very much, um, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's second report of 2023. Senator Dean Smith, it's being 1.30. We're now moving to two-minute statements. Thank Senator you Smith. very much. This week, campaigners for Save Sorry Business have come to their national parliament. The Save Sorry business campaigners are a small group of people in number, but they are the voice for more than 13,000 Aboriginal policyholders of the failed ACBF UPLA funeral fund. Senators will recall that the Aboriginal Community Funeral Benefit Fund collapsed in March 2022, leaving more than 13,000 Aboriginal people from across our country, some of them elderly and in palliative care, without the means, without the financial means to pay for family funerals. The Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund, which was not Aboriginal controlled or run, sold junk funeral insurance plans to Indigenous people across Australia for more than 30 years. Innocent people choosing to make responsible financial planning decisions for themselves have been let down by financial regulations and by financial regulators in Australia. And some people have not lost a little bit of money. They have lost up to $40,000 of their savings. The Save Sorry Business says, 
Tens of thousands of people are now living in debt, shame or torment, knowing that their children and family members will have to pay for their sorry business. Today, I met Vanessa Polina from Broome. Her story is a terrible one, but I committed to Vanessa in the same way that I've committed to Veronica Johnson, who I've communicated with on email, that as a West Australian senator, I'll stand with them so that they can secure Thank the you, justice senator they deserve. Smith. Senator Brown. Uh, Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Earlier this afternoon, Senator Mackenzie continued to spread mistruths about supposed cuts to road safety funding and road safety spending. Acting Deputy President, I'm so tired of the Liberals and Nationals' attempts to politicise road safety. So I will once again, in the hope that Senator Mackenzie may be listening, say that there have been no cuts to the Black Spot program because this government takes road safety seriously. The Albanese government is continuing the precedent of budgeting $110 million towards the Black, Stop, Black Spot program each year. Any unspent funds are simply rolled over into the following year's program on top of, on top of the $110 million, um, $110 million um, allocation. I would hope that as a former minister with, within the infrastructure portfolio, Senator Mackenzie would know that. In the Albanese Labor government, the first budget in October last year, the government committed $9.6 billion in infrastructure spending across the country. The Black Spot program is just one of the fantastic and meaningful infrastructure initiatives funded by the Australian government to curb deaths and trauma on our roads. It is disappointing, but hardly surprising, that Senator Mackenzie has chosen to spread fake news instead of working collaboratively in supporting regional communities, yes. communities who have been a political football for the coalition for far too long. The Black Spot program targets road locations where crashes are occurring and shouldn't be used as a political football. Thank you, Senator. Senator Fariki. Over the weekend, my friend Jonathan Sriranganathan announced he would step down as councillor for Brisbane's Gabba Ward. Jono was elected in 2016 as Queensland's first Greens councillor and the first of Sri Lankan Tamil heritage. He's a musician, a rapper, writer and former youth worker. But I've known Jono first and foremost as an activist, shaking up the system, telling it like it is, asking questions that no one else would dare ask and challenging you to think really deep and hard about so many issues. He is a radical, unwavering voice for the community he serves and for the social, environmental and racial injustices we face, one that refuses to back down no matter what the hurdles. I am in awe of Jono's courage to put his security and his body on the line to protect others and for what he believes in. Politics needs more people like that. He achieved so much positive change for a more sustainable and equitable city. But Jono's influence has been much wider than Brisbane. He set an example for what meaningful grassroots engagement is and played a pivotal role in transforming the Queensland Greens into the powerful movement for change. The 2022 Green Slide owes so much to him. Jono's departure is a big loss, but thankfully the amazing Trina Massey is stepping in. She will be the first openly queer woman of colour ever to hold public office at any level of government in Queensland. Representation is important, and I can't wait to, to see Trina in action. I'm looking forward to your next adventures, Jono. Thank you for your extraordinary work. Thank you for being such a good friend and such a staunch ally for people of colour. Please keep asking the hard questions. You truly are one of a kind. Senator Antic. Thank you. Last week, a group of brave women in Victoria gathered to protest men using their bathrooms and dominating their sports. And as sure as night turns to day, the activist media and the leftist political hacks of this nation described it as an ugly, evil, harmful gathering, never even seeking 
to distinguish between the nitwits who showed up in black from the genuine female protesters. Now, this is just emotional manipulation designed once again to shut down the debate. And if the left actually cared, they'd consider the reasons for the higher rates of mental health problems rather than using it as a threat to shut down and silence women. Have they ever entertained the possibility that telling children that they can change their genders might be dangerous to their mental health? These people claim to care about safety but care nothing about the harms being caused to women and children, with increasing reports of women being sexually abused by men who identify as women in prisons across the world. Where's the outrage for them? Where's the outrage from the left, from the biological man who rushed the stage at the New Zealand Let Women Speak event and threw tomato, tomato juice at Kelly J Keane? Where's the outrage from the left at the church shooting in Nashville, where a radical trans activist am shot, amongst others, a three-year-old girl and murdered her? Pay close attention to the way in which the term harm is weaponised. The activist state and their allies in the censorship industrial complex are gaslighting you. It's time the sycophants of the left started to consider the impact this is having on women and on people who are trying to raise their kids without the activist state trying to divide families and sexualise our children. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Acting President. Australia's official development assistance program is our nation's primary source of financing for Australia's contribution to international development aid. Our ODA funding has the potential to improve the lives of millions of people in developing countries. Our government, the Albanese government, recognises this potential and the impact of a strong ODA program, not just to deliver life-saving assistance and economic development, but to directly contribute to the stability and resilience of our own nation. That's why, under the Albanese government, we have already begun rebuilding Australia's official development assistance program. On top of existing funding, we've expanded our Pacific Step Up commitment with an additional $314 million. This is in stark contrast to the previous government whose failed Pacific Step Up program was funded by gutting funding in every other area. This resulted in more than $11 billion being slashed from our ODA budget and contributed, frankly, to the strategic setbacks in the region and strategic challenges that we've had in competing for influence and contributing to stability. We've also lost specialist skills and knowledge on mass as a result of the last government's decision to merge DFAT and AusAid. I'm really proud of what our ODA funding is now focused on poverty reduction, education, humanitarian crises, economic and infrastructure development, empowerment of women and ultimately DFAT's capability to deliver life-saving assistance. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Australia is in serious trouble. We have an unprecedented housing and rental crisis. We don't have enough homes for everyone in Australia. Rental vacancy rates are lower than 1 per cent in our major cities. In my home state of Queensland, homelessness has increased 22 per cent in only five years. Increasing numbers of Australian families are living in tents, in sheds, in caravans and on the street. And we have a Labor government which refuses to do something to fix this crisis and which is actually making it so much worse. Today's edition of the Australian newspaper reports that we are experiencing the biggest two-year population surge in our history. The Albanese Labor government is allowing 650,000 new immigrants into Australia this financial year and the next. That is more than the entire populations of Canberra and Darwin combined. Australia cannot accommodate all of these new people. Australia cannot contain these record numbers. Australia is bursting at the seams. Australia is full, and so are our hospitals and schools. We already have a shortfall of almost 700,000 homes for the people who are already here. Labor's pathetic housing future fund, if it even gets up, will make absolutely no difference. 30,000 new homes in five years. What a sad joke. Labor is deliberately making the housing crisis even worse. 
Labor's record high immigration is literally forcing Australian families to live on the streets, and winter is coming. The, nero, the net zero we must be prioritising in Australia is net zero immigration, not net zero carbon dioxide. We must stop this flood or we will all drown. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Act Deputy President. Uh, well, I too was shocked uh, to hear the news this morning that uh, uh, 650,000 new people would be uh, coming to Australia this financial year. That's, that's more than double what we would typically consider a, uh, a big number of migrants into our country. We typically would used to say that 300,000 was a huge amount of migration. And I want to be very clear, I support migration. We, uh, we should and have a long history of welcoming people from other countries. Uh, I myself am the product of that. But we've got to put Australians first. We've got to put Australians first. And we don't have enough housing for people who live here today. So why, why is this Labor government, why is this Labor government uh, running migration levels at double, at double the amount that what would be a high number when we do not have enough housing for Australians? This Labor government came to power saying they wanted to increase wages. They wanted to help workers get a better deal. Well, how is that going to happen when we're importing all of this cheap labour from overseas, competing against those that are the poorest in our society and keeping wages under, under control or under pressure and not keeping up with inflation? And inflation will only get worse if we uh, take in more and more people without having adequate services to provide for them, because we'll have more competition for the scarce amount of goods, and that will push up prices, pushing up down real wages. How is this Labor government allowed this to happen? This was totally against what they promised the Australian people. We didn't hear any of this. Did anyone hear Anthony Albanese say that he would double our migration levels in his first year in office? He said he'd lower our power bills by $275. I heard him say that 97 times. I didn't hear him say once that he would double migration levels in this country, and now the housing crisis that we are all seeing in front of our eyes is a direct result of the mismanagement of our borders uh, from this Labor government. This Labor government has to get in control of our borders and make sure they put Australians first and make sure we decide how many people come to this country and how, who, who, when they come, uh, because it is our nation and we should look after Australians first. Senator Sheldon. This week we've had a very special guest here in this building. Yavuz is the uncle of Dur uh, Burak Dogan, a 30-year-old food delivery rider who was tragically killed on the job on the 2nd of April 2020. Barack is one of the 11 food delivery riders who have been killed since 2017. Now I'll use the rest of this, my time to share Yavuz's words. It was one of the most difficult jobs of my life to inform the family of Barack's death. Barack was an engineer. He was a hard-working man. He came to study in Australia to improve his English so that he could get a better position at work. He had six months to go and finish his study. He was killed by a big truck, very tragically. We had to wrap him up in, a plast in plastic to keep his body all in one piece, to send it to his family. We have been contacting Uber and the insurance companies. The insurance company said Barack finished his last job at 11 minutes after the 15 minutes insurance cover time, so they were not liable for anything. Then Uber made a comment after the investigation finalised. They were not liable for anything because Barack was not working for them at the time of his death. But Uber sent their records of his logins to the police. They were trying to give him job offers at the same time as his death. Most likely he was looking at when he went under the truck. When he was dying, they sent another message three or four minutes later. That's the attitude of the company. What we would like to see is justice. We hope Parliament is going to do something about this injustice. This is all the family is asking for. Now I say this. Stop Uncle Sam's sweatshops here killing Australian drivers. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to talk about a mega fracker that is currently on its way from the US to Australia. This is one of five mega frackers that Tamboran intends to use to frack the Beedaloo Basin against the wishes of traditional owners. GetUp have estimated that it could arrive as, uh, in late April and be in use by the second half of this year. 
This is, of course, if Tamboran can gather the extra $1 billion a year that they will need to offset their emissions from day one, which has been one of the great wins of the, the Greens have secured in the safeguard mechanism. This mega fracker has the capacity to drill for more than four kilometres in multiple directions at once. This is nothing like we've seen here in Australia, and in fact, this piece of machinery has the capacity two to four times of anything that is currently approved in Australia. This means that the impacts of climate, water, the environment and cultural heritage are greater too. The Northern Territory and federal governments need to complete an independent assessment of these increased risks of this mega fracker because, indeed, they are outstanding recommendations of the Pepper Inquiry that have not been implemented, and the use of this machinery will ruin any chance of some of these inquiries' recommendations actually being met. The import and use of these rigs must not be permitted in Australia. This sets a da dangerous and unacceptable precedence that we cannot, cannot afford to do in the middle of a climate crisis. And at this time, we need to be moving away from the fossil fuel industry. S Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Something is different in my home state of Victoria this week. There is a sense of calm and order as the Victorian people go about their everyday lives. The media is silent. If I don't know what to say, what's different? Our Premier has gone on a little holiday to visit, for the seventh time, his good friends to the north. Premier Andrews has not truly disclosed the purpose of his travel to the People's Republic of China. It has been left to us to speculate on his itinerary. I, for one, hope that our dear Premier has taken it upon himself to personally investigate the origins of the Wuhan virus, or maybe to negotiate the release of the persecuted, persecuted Uyghurs from re-education camps. Or maybe he could be sta standing up for hard-working Australian wine and barley exporters suffering from, br from brutal tariffs. Now, the cynics say he could be looking to rekindle the failed Belt and Road deal, or maybe he's seeking to prop up our heavily indebted state, projected to reach around $170 billion of debt in just the next few years. More debt than Queensland, New South Wales and Tasmania combined. Not one Australian journalist was invited to accompany the Premier, but I'm sure the state-run Chinese Communist Party press will do their best to reveal the truth. I believe that the Premier should leave international diplomacy to our federal government. It's not his job. And, it, and when it comes to previous experience, there is no one more competent at international travel than our own Prime Minister, Anthony Airbus Albanese. The people of Victoria are left to pray that our dear leader will return safely, having not sold us out to the communists again. Senator Nampajimpa Price. Thank you. Uh, I rise today to acknowledge and remember the life of another great uh, Territorian, Alison Hunt, who was also a family member of my own, who sadly lost her life to cancer earlier this month. Alison was born in Arionga, west of Alice Springs, in 1948, and after her mother sadly passed away, was adopted by Wilfred and Lucy Swift and their daughters, Alison's sisters, Audrey and Amy. She remained grateful to her family her entire life. She grew up in Arionga and Hermansburg, enjoying her childhood surrounded by friends and family. Alison was a much-loved grandmother and auntie. She had committed her life to Johnny and to her three children, Julianne, Kathleen and Stephen, who sadly passed away in 2020. She was a real leader in her community and was described by her, by her family as a fierce, outspoken woman who was not afraid to fight for what she believed in. Alison's life was about bringing people together. An excellent communicator, she dedicated her life to helping people understand each other in closing the gap and inviting people from all walks of life to understand her culture. Alison was civically engaged her whole life and took a keen interest in politics, understanding the need of community to work together to improve the, live, 
lives of all Australians. She was a big supporter of the Country Liberal Party and worked for the CLP leader and former Northern Territory Chief Minister Marshall Perrin. When she passed away, Alison was surrounded by her family, exactly how she would have wanted it. She will be remembered and missed by all. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You know, as interest rates soar, families are struggling to put food on the table. Just about every person who has stopped me on the streets in Lonnie has mentioned how tough things are at the moment. One in two Tasmanians are facing food insecurity right now. One in five Tasmanians are regularly skipping meals and going hungry. And it's only getting worse. Last week I visited Loaves and Fishers in Devonport. They're a food bank who feed 17,000 Tasmanians every single week. They give food to public schools so kids can have a hot, healthy meal. They give food to the neighbourhood houses all over the state. They provide food to homeless shelters. Loaves and Fishers help a lot of people across Tasmania, but they're feeling the cost of living pressures as much as anybody else. Their electricity prices are through the roof, and that means less money for food. The cost of fuel for food delivery just keeps going up. And guess what? That means less money for food. The cost of each meal they make has skyrocketed from 80 cents per meal to $4 per meal. And this means they're not getting as many meals out the door. And as the number of meals they make decreases, the demand for them only increases. They're feeding more people with less money. I'd like to see the Tasmanian and federal governments do more to support food banks like Loaves and Fishers. The work they do is so important, and in the current housing crisis, we need them more than ever. We could also be doing a lot more to minimise food waste. If charities, schools and governments work together alongside supermarkets, farmers and restaurants, I think we'd be amazed at what we can do. We need to hit the ground running to make sure support gets to where it's needed most. I don't want to see anyone left without a meal because food bank resources are stretched too thin. And if we're not helping people, what are we here for? Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Just an hour ago, I spoke about police violence. Last weekend, tragically, police violence got completely out of hand in Mariba, where a First Nations man, Aubrey Donahue, who was just in his 20s, was shot dead by police. My thoughts are with his family and community. I know your pain, your questions, your anger and your desperation. Another one of our young people's lives taken at the hands of police, at the hands of this racist system. We all know that police are much more likely to use violence against blackfellas than others, yet they never, ever have been held accountable. The police are supposed to be your friend and helper, yet to our communities, police intervention is not helpful at all. Most of the time, they do nothing but cause more harm. Aubrey's community is demanding to know what happened. Why shoot to kill? There are many other ways to de-escalate a situation. We need to hold police accountable and not let them get away without consequences. Black lives matter. What happened to Aubrey is yet another sign of this country being in a death in custody crisis and again underlines the need after 32 years to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody so that the underlying factors of this crisis can be addressed. We cannot allow for any more lives to be lost. This government can act, but it just won't. Senator Brockman. Thank you. I rise today to speak directly to the many millions of Australians who support the Liberal Party, the National Party, the LNP, the CLP, right across this Australia. Australia. And I remind them that sometimes it can be tough. We see wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments across Australia with their alliance partners, the Green, and we all suffer from the, the hubris they now represent, the arrogance, the overreach we're seeing from Labor-Green alliance governments right across Australia. But I want to remind those supporters of the Liberal Party, the Coalition, the National Party, the CLP, the LNP, that the tide does turn. 
I'll take them back to 2007, to the loss of government by the Howard uh, uh, Prime Ministership. And, uh, we saw wall-to-wall -wall labour right across Australia, and we saw the same hubris, the same arrogance, the same overreach. And with a very short, within a very short period of time, and Senator Stirl, you'll remember this very well. Within a very short period of time, in WA, we saw one of those arrogant, overreaching, hubristic Labor governments go to a sneaky election during the Olympics and against all the polling, against all the odds, we saw the Barnett Liberal government be the first domino, the first domino to fall in a return of Liberal, National, LNP, CLP governments across this Australia. So I say to those opposite, I say to those opposite, opposite Rumours of our death are greatly exaggerated, and I say to all our supporters out there, the Liberal Party will come back and we will get rid of this arrogant, hubristic government at the next election. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I wanted to talk about something positive, but I can't let that one go, Senator Brotman. What a crack up. What an absolute crack up. You got two seats back there in WA last time I looked. Two seats out of 59. Maybe what the Liberal Party of Australia need to do, think about this. Maybe they should get on the phone to, is it Paris or Brussels? Where's the leader of the Klan? Where would we find the leader? Maybe you need a Klan in every state. Would that fix it? Ah, I've got better things to talk about anyway. I want to just talk about today in Canberra. Listen, this you lot, you might learn something, you ignoramuses. Today there is a delegation of workers from the transport industry here in Canberra. They are being uh, led around by, uh, led with the Transport Workers Union, with state transport organisations, with employers, big employers, and they've all come together to tell the story of the danger that, that we are facing in the transport industry in Australia called the gig economy. Now, so far they've had 38 meetings, and gig economy workers have had the ability to share their stories with members of parliament and with the crossbench. I don't know if anyone on that side has actually taken the uh, opportunity to go and talk to these people who have been injured with no compensation because of the greed of the gig economies. And I've got to tell you now, they're here, the industry is united. I can't wait till the time when the bill comes through this chamber, when you lot over there will be held to, to account, when you lot over there will be challenged to stand up with the united transport industry. And let me tell you this, calling for reform, calling for safety, calling for minimum enforceable standards. Now, I'm going to keep an eye on a lot of you. But I'm going to challenge you, Senator McKenzie, because I want to know where you stand. Because you are following me around the nation, uh, speaking up a real big fight on how good you're going to be, you lot over there, for transport. When I read speeches, or when I make speeches, deliver speeches, when I talk to the road transport industry, I don't have bits of paper in front of me written by someone else. I don't need that. I actually know what I'm talking about. So I really, really cannot wait to see you squirm under that desk when you follow those major corporations who donate to you, when you give the middle finger to the United uh, uh, Front of the Australian Transport Industry. Thank you, and Senator the Australian Sell. Truck and Your time has expired. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move to question time. And I'm calling Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the minister representing the Treasurer, I should say, Senator Gallagher. How are you? Uh, that's good. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, given the higher than expected inflation rate announced today, will the government commit to limiting spending growth below inflation? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. and uh, I thank Senator Bragg for the question and for remembering there's other people in the chamber, other ministers that can answer questions. Um, yes, uh, look, uh, I've just been looking at the um, inflation figures that have uh, been released today, the monthly inflation figures, and um, uh, the rate of 6.8 per cent in the f month of February, which is uh, lower than the 7.4 per cent rate reported in January 2023. But I don't think it's any surprise, and I've been saying for some time in this chamber, that one of the significant challenges facing uh, the budget and the decisions that we are taking in relation to the budget is um, how we uh, deal with the inflation challenge, uh, how we provide sensible cost of living relief where we can without adding to the inflation challenge across the economy. Um, and that requires us to show some restraint. Um, 
where we've got uh, revenue upgrades to look at how we um, bank those upgrades. And as um, you know, in October, we banked 99 per cent of those upgrades in the first two years, and I think it was 92 per cent over the four years. So that gives you an indication of the fiscally responsible way that we will go about uh, making these decisions. Uh, and we're doing that against a backdrop of increasing pressures on the budget, whether it be from defence, uh, from the NDIS, uh, from health, from aged care, from some of the terminating measures, the cleaning up the mess that uh, we are also working through and have been talking about in this uh, chamber this week. So um, you know, you'll see the budget when it's released, but the question that Senator Bragg uh, asked of me is uh, certainly front and centre of the mind of all of all of us who participate through the ERC process. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, Following the tenth consecutive interest rate rise, the government has committed $45 billion in off-budget spending. How much of this will be spent in the next financial year? Minister. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Well, those uh, provisions were made in the October budget um, and have been uh, factored into the figures that were released uh, as part of the economic forecast for the October budget. Uh, obviously, we uh, in relation to the NRF, um, that has passed the parliament um, with rewiring the nation. Uh, we are moving on that through the Powering the Regions Fund, uh, when the Housing Australia Fund hasn't passed the parliament, um, and uh, so we won't be in a position uh, to establish that fund um, over, you know, until that passes the parliament. Uh, there will be some expenditure, I would imagine, once those funds are up and running. Um, I'm, I'm, we'll report that in the normal way, uh, as you would expect, uh, once those decisions have been taken. But I would say that the actual um, provision for those has been factored into the budget and the economic forecasts outlined in October. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. Thanks very much. Uh, Minister, did the International Monetary Fund find that off-budget spending items like the National Reconstruction Fund fuel inflation and should be avoided? Why won't the government follow the IMF's advice? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. I don't have the IMF uh, uh, report in front of me, but I think those opposite have um, well, I don't want to say they've verbaled the, um, the IMF, but I think they have used the IMF report for political, to, to try selectively for political purposes. Uh, I think my recollection of the IMF's, um, from the IMF's um, report was that they talked about um, being mindful of the impact of establishing funds and being cautious about the use of them, and that's exactly what we were, we were doing. Uh, and in fact, if we go back and have a look, um, when you were in government, you established quite a number of, of those funds uh, in a similar way that we are doing now, and we are using them to drive a common good, whether it be in housing, whether it be in manufacturing jobs, or actually ensuring we've got an energy grid that actually works um, for the renewable energy future that Australia will uh, have to you, have. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Yesterday, members of the government and the crossbench came together to support the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill in this place. It was a great win for manufacturing. Can the minister outline how the passage of the NRF will support Australian manufacturing? Minister Farrell. Thanks, sir. Uh, <coughs> thanks, sir. Uh, President, and it's good to get some questions, at least from my own side. Um, the, other, the other side seemed to have given up on me. But, um, you outlasted them, Don. I know you've you got a great. I know, I know, I know you've got a great interest great in uh, rebuilding Don manufacturing uh, in this uh, in this country. And last <laughs> night, the Senate passed the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill. And this is one of the largest investments in manufacturing in Australia's history. Uh, this is the Albanese Labor government's first step in rebuilding Australia's industrial ca capability. And I was pleased to see uh, Senator Colbeck uh, last night picking up on this very point and making it on a number of occasions uh, so that we can be a country that makes things again. 
Australia should be a country that makes things. Australia must be a country that makes things, because making things here will help secure Australia's future prosperity and drive sustainable economic growth. The National Reconstruction Fund will leverage Australia's natural and competitive strengths by providing finance to projects in priority areas. It will make investments in projects that will support, diversify and transform Australia's industry in agriculture, forestry and fisheries, in resources, in transport, in medical science, in renewable and low uh, emissions technology, in defence capability and enabling uh, um, capabilities. The uh, National uh, Reconstruction Fund will revitalise and strengthen our local supply chains yeah. to ensure that we have our own industrial and manufacturing capabilities. It will invest in businesses so that they can invest in their workers developing the skills that we need now and into the future. Uh, we got to this point by working together with the crossbench, and I congratulate them, because when the coalition stepped back, the crossbench I uh, thank you, Minister. Up. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Our government actively engaged with the Greens and the crossbench on the legislation. And following this engagement, the Senate agreed to a number of amendments to the bill. How will the amendments to the bill help create a stronger future for Australian industry? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Um, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Stewart once again for her uh, very salient uh, question. Uh, the amendments the government uh, made to the bill addressed a number of other important matters that have informed our design of the National Reconstruction Fund, fund from the outset. Uh, attracting private sector investment, not crowding it out. Achieving Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reductions target and decarbonisation. Creating secure jobs and a skilled and adaptable workforce. Enhancing resilience in Australia's supply chains and, of course, encouraging the commercialisation of Australian innovation and technology. In making these amendments, the government reaffirms that one of our um, most important outcomes of the National uh, Reconstruction Fund will be the creation of secure, well-paid jobs in key industries that build on our national strengths. Uh, Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Labor is actively working with industry and workers to rectify the economic mess left by the former government. How will the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill help create secure jobs in this country? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Senator Stewart, again for your uh, prescient uh, question there. Uh, when we uh, proposed the uh, National Reconstruction Fund in March 2021, Labor said we were going to do this to rebuild secure work. Because uh, we know a strong domestic manufacturing industry provides opportunities for Australians to make a meaningful, high-skilled contribution to our nation's future. Nearly 85 per cent of jobs in manufacturing are full-time, and it's a shame that the uh, coalition didn't get this message. They were opposed to creating new jobs in their communities. Yep. They were opposed to local manufacturers, just like they were opposed to the car industry in, uh, in this country. <clears throat> the only jobs they're ever interested in are jobs for their mates. Uh, with the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund, the Albanese Labor government will create job, uh, job communities uh, can be built around, especially in regional, remote and you, outer Minister. suburban the time Australia. Has expired. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The October budget forecast a 56 per cent increase in electricity bills for Australian households over the next two years. Does the government believe the actual increase will be higher or lower than forecast? Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we will update, we will update the figures. Um, we will update the figures uh, in the budget in the normal way, as we do. Uh, they were released in October. They will be updated uh, in May. Uh, and uh, I would remind the chamber that the efforts that we put in place to reduce yep. those unacceptable increases in electricity prices caused by a decade of delay, dysfunction and failure to land 22 oh, yeah. energy policies 
22, released them all, didn't land one of them. So after creating the problem, then hiding the problem before the election, we're now in the world Order. where you stand in the way of any solution to this. Indeed, in, October, in December, when we did bring forward, I've already answered your question. Oh. Um, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Colbeck. It, it was a point of order on direct relevance. Does the government believe the actual increase will be higher or lower? Um, Senator Colbeck, uh, the minister is being relevant to your question. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Uh, thank you. And uh, I answered the question, um, President, when I I did. I answered the question when I said those figures will be updated in the normal way. Senator Colbeck obviously wasn't listening when I directly answered his question when I first got to my feet. But I would also say that the efforts we took in recalling the parliament based on those, um, on those results in the October budget to put downward pressure on those increases was opposed by those opposite. So the gall of you to come in here and say and, and feign concern over electricity prices when you oppose the Order. legislation Order. that put in place the parameters that put Order. downward pressure on those prices. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have called the chamber to order three times and you kept interjecting extremely loudly. That is disrespectful and disorderly. When I call the chamber to order, it includes every single person in this place. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. I must say I am finding the level of interjections towards me quite confronting uh, this question time. Uh, I, feel, I feel very affronted by it. Uh, so thank you for your protection. Uh, but the gall, the gall of these people. Oh, Senator order. Henderson, is that you yelling at me? Uh, oh, Minister, the gosh. time has expired. Order. Uh, Senator Henderson. Senator Watt. Order across the chamber. Uh, Senator Colbeck, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Why did the government break its promise made on no, at least 97 occasions prior to the 2022 election to cut, the, to cut electricity bills by $275? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, the government uh, is getting on with implementing the Powering the Nation plan, which we took to the election. The legislation that is currently before the chamber and has been debated uh, into the early hours of this morning and, and through the day is part of that. Uh, that is about dealing with the significant challenges we have in transitioning to a renewable energy uh, superpower, that we would like to be, uh, which we will do without your help. Uh, to ensure that we are moving to renewables, that we're rewiring the grid, that we're supporting households with the transition, that we're supporting jobs in the transition, that we're supporting regions in the transition, that it's an orderly transition, or as orderly as it can be after a decade of delay and dysfunction from those opposite. That's what we're doing. We're doing exactly what we said we would do. And where we're dealing with the challenges of the day, like a war in Ukraine that's increased uh, prices around the world. We're dealing with that despite the opposition from you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Colbeck, second supplementary. Thank you. I'll try again. Why did the government break its promise, made at least 97 occasions prior to the 2000, uh, 20, 2022 election, to reduce electricity bills by $275? Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister. Senator Colbeck refers to the Powering Australia plan, which we are implementing. So I reject uh, the assertion being put forward by Senator Colbeck. And I would similarly say to those opposite, why did you hide the electricity increase before the election? What was that about? Was it because you didn't want to tell Order. people? Was it because the member for Hume actually didn't want people to know that under your watch, with, with um, all of the energy leaving the system and not enough being replaced, that when you got confronted with the news that there was going to be a significant increase in electricity prices, what did the member for Hume do? Well, he hid it. He hid it until a few days after the election. We are being upfront with the Australian people where there are challenges, and we've seen them, and we saw them in December, we saw them in the budget. We responded responsibly and carefully. And all you did, all those opposite did, was oppose it, just like they oppose everything else we do. 
Thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi. My question is to Minister Watt, representing the Minister for Education. Minister, every week I hear heartbreaking stories about students struggling to put food on the table, pay for medicine, afford a train or a bus ticket, pay bills, or to pay rent. One 19-year-old Queensland University of Technology student says she has not eaten fresh fruit and vegetables for at least a month and relies on instant noodles. She struggles to afford period products. At UNSW, hundreds of students are lining up in queues for free food. This is causing intolerable financial stress and mental health impacts for students. Can you look these students in the eye and tell them that you can spare $254 billion for, for the wealthy and $368 billion for war machines and nothing for them? Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Well, I reject the suggestion that our government is doing nothing to assist students or low-income earners generally. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't that long ago that we came, brought the parliament back uh, to uh, support legislation, for instance, to support uh, price caps on uh, coal and gas uh, prices and provide energy price relief for low-income earners, including the very students that we're talking about. Um, we also, of course, the Albanese government, delivered cheaper medicines uh, starting on the 1st of January this year, which students, among others, would benefit from, St pensioners, uh, many others would benefit from. As I recall, it was the first reduction in PBS uh, uh, um, prices that people were paying, uh, if not ever, in Australian history, then certainly for a very long time. Uh, and that is in addition to a much broader range of cost of living relief uh, that the government is providing. Now, one of the things that you pointed out um, Senator Faruqi, was that many of these students are renters, and I certainly remember my renting days as a student when you don't have a lot of money. And as I pointed out on a number of occasions this week to the Greens, there's a very simple thing that the Greens could do to assist uh, meet the need for more social and affordable housing in Australia, and that is to back the, the Housing Australia Future Fund that our government is putting forward. Um, the, the hypocrisy of the Greens is yet again on display when it comes to housing. On the one hand, they're out there claiming that we need more social and affordable housing. They're claiming that we need to see support for renters, that we need more housing for renters. And then when there's a government that's actually prepared to do something on this topic, what do the Greens do? They say, no, it's not good enough. They, bat, they vote against it again. So it is actually within your power to do something about this about support for affordable housing, to bring down the cost for students, but instead you'd rather have a protest out the front and yell at people. That's not the way to help people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, students are rushing from job to job, but still barely making ends meet. Nearly a third of students work more than 20 hours a week. They are telling us it is impossible to just be a student and enjoy uni life anymore because they can barely afford to live. Too many students are living in poverty. Will the Labor government show people they are, that there, ha, there has actually been a change of government and raise the rate of income support payments to at least $88 a day? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Faruqi. Uh, again, I've already listed a range of ways that our, the Albanese government is providing cost of living support to support uh, a range of lower income earners, including students. Um, and uh, again, some of the fundamental issues that, that cause student poverty, which is a real issue uh, and has been for a very long time in this country, one of the core, key causes of that is the extra cost that students are having to pay for accommodation. And again, the, the, it is within the Greens' power to do something about this. Maybe just for once, the Greens could think about being part of the solution to deliver on the things that they're complaining about. Uh, rather than thinking much more about having a protest out the front where they yell at people and ask for things that can never be delivered by any government uh, in Australian history. Um, we do recognise that lower income earners need support, need more support than they ever got under the coalition government, and that is exactly what we are doing. But in the meantime, the Greens should reverse their position and back our Housing Australia Fund to deliver you, the housing Minister that Watt. is needed. The time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, on 1 June, millions of Australians will, will be hit with more debt. Average student debt will balloon by almost $1,700. For others, it will soar by $3,000 and even $5,000.
This means many more will be going backwards. They can't keep up because student debts are now going up faster than they can be paid off. Will the government intervene urgently to ensure that people are not hit with an obscene increase in their student debts on 1 June? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, well, as Senator Faruqi may be aware, uh, Minister Clare, the Education Minister, has asked uh, his universities uh, and higher education accord team uh, to look at the issue of student debt. Uh, it's also important to explain the way that HECS and HELP works. It's not like a home loan or a personal loan from a bank where if interest rates go up, then your payments go up. It's built on an important principle that people pay what they can afford and people don't pay more until, unless they earn more. That is the way that the system has always worked. And I remember Senator McAllister and I having debates about this when we were university students, about uh, student fees that should be, should be um, the, the right way of, uh, to charge student fees. It's been an issue for a very long time. I'm not sure we were on the same side necessarily, Senator McAllister, on that. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but we all grow and change our minds on things, even, even people like you and me. Um, but these are serious issues. The Greens should help. The Greens should help and the Greens should provide more social and affordable housing, Thank which is you, what Minister, this Labor government is doing. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pratt. Order in the chamber. Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please tell us what key health services have been left with funding that expires on June 30 this year and what impact that expiry of funding would have on crucial service delivery to Australians that rely on these very services? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the question and for a, a uh, a rare question on health uh, in this chamber, um, but we know after almost a decade of cuts and neglect from those opposite, it's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor. Our government is being upfront with Australians about the state of our health care system because this crisis just didn't spring from thin air or happen overnight. It's the result of decisions made by the former government, a former government whose priority was to cut Medicare. Instead of funding critical health programs, they chose to put hundreds of measures, hundreds of measures in the budget on a timeline to be cut. For example, the My Health Record System, a system that looks after the health records of 23 million Australians, runs out of funding on the 30th of June this year. No money. No money for My Health Record. 23 million Australians' health record. Just switch the money off. No money. No money for public dental, adult dental services beyond the 30th of June. Do those opposite honestly think that adults will not have dental problems on the 1st of July this year? Because that is really the reason why you would budget for them in this way. Remember, and we shouldn't be surprised because the leader of the opposition, I think he was voted the worst health minister in 35 years, off a poll of 1,100 doctors, 1,100 doctors, because he wanted to put in place a GP tax, he wanted to increase the price Order. of medicine, and he even Order. wanted emergency departments to start charging for seeing Order. people. That is what we had under those opposite, and we're getting around cleaning up the mess that has been left behind. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, first supplementary. How is, how is the Albanese government different from the former coalition and Liberal government in its approach to responsible budget management? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we are working through all of these uh, unfunded programs that are ongoing. It has created significant pressure on the budget, which is precisely why they were uh, dealt with in this way, to make the budget look better than it actually was by having ongoing programs terminate and not impact in the later years of the forward estimate. So we are working through those. Uh, but we also know that when it comes to health care, it wasn't a priority for the former government. They, they stopped the indexation of uh, GP visits for six years, and that is what has led to a lot of the crisis facing primary care 
We are seeing GP surgeries close. Uh, we're seeing the GPs close around the country. People are finding it harder to get in, and when they do get in, they are paying more for seeing that doctor because of the crisis that was uh, factored in over a long period Thank of time. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Can the minister explain how the Albanese government is making health care more affordable and rebuilding the trust of Australians in the management of our budget? Thank you, Senator Minister. Uh, and I thank Senator Pratt for the question. And I can inform uh, the Chamber of what we're doing because we are cleaning up the mess, working through carefully, methodically, all of the programs uh, that term that terminate. And we did do. I know you hate the fact we went through line order. by line. We did go through line Minister, by line. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. We started that line by line work in October and we are continuing to go through it. As problems emerge, as departments bring forward their terminating programs, we are working through those. But we are also and implementing our policies we took to the last election to invest in the health care of Australians. So, uh, for example, lowering the price of medicines came in on the 1st of January making a difference on the cost of living for millions of Australians. The Strengthening Medicare Task Force, which has a, sig a significant budget Senator to invest Rustin. in Medicare, and we're getting on with the job of investing in the, and opening those 50 urgent care centres. This is what you do when you're a government that believes in Medicare and believes Thank in you, the strength of the Senator health. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Wong, in question time of September 2022, I asked you a question in relation to immigration. In response to the question, you said Labor had increased immigration to 195,000 per year as a consequence of capacity constraints in the economy. Will the minister please explain to the Australian people why Labor has let immigration blow out to a record 650,000 this financial year and the next, as reported in The Australian Today? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Well, can I first thank Senator Hanson for the question? If she will permit me, can I say how lovely it is to be back? Uh, and to, to thank uh, those, uh, thank the, everyone who sent me good wishes. Oh, fair, fair uh, <laughs> Minister Wong. I thought you liked me. Senator Hanson. Order. No, Senator. the minister asked if I permit her. I don't permit her. Uh, I've got only two minutes Senator for an Hanson, answer, and I want an answer not about seat. how well. Resume your seat, Senator Hanson. Resume your seat. Uh, I think the minister is going to your question. Do, I do endeavour to answer your question, Senator Hanson. Uh, I did want to just acknowledge the, the work of those behind me, particularly uh, Senator Farrell, who I think did very well uh, in my absence. Uh, I think what I, my response to you, Senator Hanson, was to refer to the net overseas migration figures. Uh, I am advised that the uh, increase in net overseas migration is 304,000 for the year ending September 2022. Uh, there is also an increase in planned permanent migration in 2022-23, which of course is a commitment from the Jobs and Skills Summit. I'd make the point, uh, and I assume. Uh, my answer to which you are referring uh, may, was making the same point, that we obviously do have some capacity constraints in the Australian economy, uh, and in fact ensuring that we have an appropriate level, of, uh, particularly of permanent migration, <coughs> is one of the ways we can grow our economy and one of the ways in which we can ensure uh, that um, some of those capacity constraints driving inflation are dealt with. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Rennick? Senator Rennick. <laughs> There's a reference to. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so what I would say to you, Senator Hanson, is that uh, this government, uh, in its approach to net overseas migration, will always be guided by the national interest, and there will obviously be a balance of questions that the government has to address, which both go to skill shortages, but also some of the issues that we've been discussing for some weeks now, including availability of housing supply. Uh, but uh, the government will always make decisions on migration in the national interest. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson. 
Labor's Housing Future Fund plan to build 30,000 new homes in the next five years will obviously do nothing to alleviate Australia's housing and rental crisis in light of the fact approximately 700,000 homes are needed. Minister, will, when will Labor finally commit to making the massive cuts to immigration necessary to reduce demand for housing so that Australians already living here can have a home rather than living in their cars, tents or even on the streets? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, well, uh, I, again, I thank Senator Hanson for the question, and I would make the point that one of the reasons the government wants to bring forward the Housing Australia Future Fund uh, is is to ensure the Housing Australia Fund is to ensure that we can contribute to greater supply. And it is, uh, I think, uh, very deeply concerning that in the face of some of what is occurring in the housing sector, that we have the coalition, those opposite, who I know are struggling with the reality of opposition, uh, very angry, uh, uh, very angry, as, can be de as, as is evinced by the sorts of interjections we get, uh, simply saying no and the Greens saying it's not enough. And as a consequence, there are people in this country uh, who would be benefited by uh, increasing housing supply, uh, which uh, may be left wanting. Uh, of course, always, always more can be done, Senator Hanson, uh, and I think we all understand that. Uh, and as I said, these are some of the Thank issues you, that the, the government will grapple with. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. At least I congratulate you on attempting to answer the question, unlike like, um, Senator Farrell, who didn't have much to say. On the Sunrise Order. program this morning, uh, David Order. Posh Senator interviewed— Hansen. Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. Order. I am not able to hear Senator Hanson's question because of the disorder and noise in the chamber. Senator Hanson, if you wouldn't mind starting the actual question again, please. On the Sunrise program this morning, David Koch interviewed a 16-year-old boy named Caleb who, with his father, has been forced to live in, in a tent in a Brisbane park because they cannot find rental accommodation. What message do you offer homeless teenagers like Caleb while your government makes the housing crisis worse with record high immigration. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, first, in relation to Senator Farrell. My observation of Senator Farrell was outstanding while I was away. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm very grateful. I was very grateful, very grateful for Order. his leadership, as I'm sure Order. all of my colleagues are. Uh, Senator, Senator Hanson, what, what I would say uh, is, is this, that uh, if, if, we, if people in this chamber are really concerned uh, about housing, uh, then they would stop their opposition to our housing fund. Uh, they would recognise that e even if they don't agree with all aspects of government policy. Oh, Senator Hanson. Relevance. We're, we're not talking about the housing and, and backing the opposition backing government policy. I asked what her message is to Kaleeb. Um, about these, uh, what message is she going to give to this uh, teenager? Senator Hanson, uh, Minister Wong is being relevant to your question. Minister, please continue. Well, my message is, yes, we do need to increase the supply of housing. This government went to the election with a very clear policy, a set of policies around increasing the supply of housing, because we on this side of the chamber care about uh, pop, about uh, social housing, we care about improving access uh, to decent housing, and we care about what is happening in the rental market. And we understand that one of the key ways Minister, in which government the can time do that has expired. is to please resume your seat, Minister uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. On Monday and again today in question time, the minister criticised terminating funding for my health record. Uh, given this somewhat pious grandstanding, why, didn't the minister, why did not the minister address this in Labor's budget last October, for which the minister claimed that she went through every single budget item line by line? Uh, thank you, Senator Reynolds. Minister. Thank you. Order. Thank you, President. Order. Stop yelling at me. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat and wait for silence in the chamber. Senator Watt, I've just called the chamber to order. 
Min uh, Minister Gallagher, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Reynolds for the question. And I, is this uh, the best that they've got? That the terminating measures that they put in the budget, the only criticism is that we didn't get to the hundreds of terminating measures, the hundreds, the booby Order. traps, the booby Order. traps, the funding cliffs, the zombie measures that you used to dress up your budget to make it look it was something that it wasn't. Order. Is the best that you've got is that we didn't deal with all of those messes, the entire mess that is the budget, the budget vandals that you had, is that it wasn't all fixed in October, that we didn't fix up all your messes in October. Well, I'll take that. We didn't, because there's so many of them. We dealt with the first bit in October. Just as we did with our spending audit, we did what we could in October Order. and we said we would come back and look at this through the budget in May. And that is what we are doing. But we are also highlighting the fact that those opposite booby-trapped the budget, dressed it up before an election, pretended that they were these fiscal, responsible fiscal managers, when at the very same time they were hiding pressures. They had zombie measures in from 2016 that they still had in their bottom Senator line, Dream. even though they were never going to get through this uh, Senate. $4.1 billion of mess in October that we cleaned up, and you will see more of us cleaning up the mess, more of the results of cleaning up the mess in May, because there was so much mess it couldn't all be done in the first economic Senator update. Hume. Um, Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, President. Uh, this Monday, the minister also criticised terminating funding for the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency, adding, do you reckon they might need ongoing funding to keep their programs going? Now, remember that, colleagues, because given the minister's grandstanding yet again, why didn't the minister address this in Labor's budget last October? For which, remember, what did the minister say? She had gone through the budget line by line. So uh, did you miss you, this Senator one Reynolds. too in your budget thank analysis? You, Senator, order. Order. I've called order. Senator Brown, I've called order. Uh, Senator, Minister, please resume your seat. Minister Scar. Uh, Senator Scar, I've just called order. Um, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you very much. And can I thank Senator Reynolds for highlighting the mess uh, that they left us? Uh, I really appreciate it. I wanted, you know, I've been looking forward to Dorothy's on terminating measures. I didn't expect to get a Dorothy from Senator Reynolds on terminating measures. Uh, but we went through. Uh, and made decisions uh, in the time we could for October. We were elected in May. We went straight into putting forward uh, the October budget. We did what we could. I think we indicated at the time that there was more work to be done, and there will continue to be work to do be done as we uncover these issues, as agencies bring them forward through the processes of the budget. And we deal with them because that's what responsible governments do. Responsible governments don't have zombie measures propping up their budget. Responsible governments don't uh, fail to address pressures that are about to hit the budget. Uh, responsible thank you, Minister, governments the time do it the way we are doing. Has expired. Senator Reynolds, second supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, President. And uh, in light of all of your comments, the dog ate my homework. What have we got? We've got zombies. We've got booby traps. In light of all of your comments on terminating measures, can you guarantee now, in light of all of those comments, that the 2023-24 budget will have no terminating measure? And if not, why not? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, the point I'm making is about ongoing programs, ongoing programs that are clearly going to continue. Uh, there is a place. There is a no. Well, I'm answering Order. the question. Order. I'm answering the question that Senator Reynolds asked. There is a place for um, time-limited measures in a budget. Well, there are. For 
For example, if there's a need to uh, fund Minister, something. Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. Order. Are you uh, seeking a point of order, Senator Reynolds? Could I just uh, ask Senator Reynolds, resume your seat. I'm still waiting. Order. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, those opposite will have to wait to see the budget, but I can tell you that they'll see a budget where responsible decisions are being made uh, about programs that are ongoing, where they've been underfunded, where they've been neglected, where list. they're being used as a way of propping up a budget to pretend those costs aren't coming. You will see the government working carefully to deal with those. And they are a significant pressure on the budget, and they will contribute to a significant expenditure you, in fixing the time them for up. Answering has expired, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the uh, minister responsible for, well, acting for the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Uh, my question is regarding First Nations people targeted by UPLA funeral insurance. Uh, many who now cannot afford to bury their loved ones, many of whom uh, are sitting in morgues. We've had elders sitting in morgues for two months uh, because of the scam uh, insurance company. The Albanese government, through your Minister of Indigenous Australians, committed to providing a resolution to those impacted by this scheme. Uh, and the October budget did include some money, but only uh, affected a small percentage of people, which is now going to run out on November 30. When will the Labor government end the trauma and the suffering of? tens of thousands of Aboriginal people who have been ripped off by this, by this scheme. I understand it is not in the May budget. Why not? Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Thorpe uh, for the question about UPLA and um, the situation that um, thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island families were left in the lurch when that um, funeral insurance scheme uh, collapsed. Uh, we have been working through all of the issues around um, providing, I think, support to those that have been affected. Um, as at the 17th of March 2023, the program has received uh, 220 applications, with 186 of these being approved, and the program has paid out 1. 5 million in grants to 170 recipients to support First Nations families in conducting sorry business. There are a small number of applications currently being processed or awaiting payment. The average processing time for an application from lodgement to payment is, taking, is about six weeks, and they are taking six weeks on average as we are dealing with a company that has collapsed and there are significant record keeping issues. So I would say um, to Senator Thorpe that we are working as fast as we can. Uh, we recognise um, you know, the very the awful situation many people many um, you know people have found themselves in with the collapse of UPLA uh, and we are trying to work as hard as we can to make sure that we can resolve it for all of those that were being placed in this terrible position by the failure of this business. Thank you Minister. Senator Thorpe first supplementary. Thank you Minister that's some small if any comfort to the elders sitting in morgues right now, uh, 170 people you've, you've supported. We've got more than what, 10, 20,000 people that have been affected. Um, what solutions are you actually pursuing to get elders out of these morgues and ensure that a fair, enduring and culturally appropriate resolution is reached for, those, for all of those impacted. Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I, uh, uh, we are working as fast as we can, and we are acutely aware of the need uh, to resolve this as fast as we can. I would say to Senator Thorpe, uh, if there are uh, particular uh, families or individuals that you would like to um, advocate on behalf of or are uh, experiencing you know some um, you know a situation which might be 
we could assist with, then uh, I, I extend that offer on behalf of uh, the minister responsible. Uh, but I can absolutely tell you the, the um, government has had a number of conversations about this UPLA and the collapse and what it means for those who have passed and their families. Um, and that is why we've, we have moved as quickly as we could to provide assurance that we would deal with, um, with the families involved, including those that um, had passed away and were in morgues. Um, um, and thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for the invitation. I will take that up. Um, so, what do you say to those First Nations people who have lost their hard-earned money? Uh, as, you know, we heard today twenty-five thousand dollars has been gone from one family. Some of them now living in debt due to UPLA's collapse, debts that have been enabled and ignored by successive governments for over two decades. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, yeah, look, well, that's why the government has sought to put in place arrangements to provide security to those families, acknowledging that we won't be able uh, necessarily to deal um, with all of the the trauma and um, difficulty and cost associated uh, with the money that's gone into those arrangements. I know that the Minister for um, the Assistant Treasurer, the Minister for Financial Services, is looking at um, you know other issues that had led to this um, the spruiking of these arrangements and and how it's being marketed. Um, but I would say again, I think the focus um, immediately on coming to government and getting the full briefing and understanding of what was happening and the fact that there hadn't been arrangements put in place to deal with it, the priority was to deal uh, particularly with those who had, um, who had loved ones, family members who had passed, and to make sure we put in place a suitable arrangement to deal with that. I would say the average number of days between an application being lodged and a payment Minister, being made time is 28 days has now. Expired. Senator White. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Watt. We know it is, a fundament, it is fundamental that our online world is a safe and inclusive environment. The eSafety Commissioner plays a key role in regulating the online world and achieving these objectives. What challenges does the eSafety Commissioner face in supporting the government's objectives? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Sorry, Sen Sorry, Senator Henderson. Uh, order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Senator Watt, I'll draw you to Senator Sorry, White. Sorry, Senator Henderson was just interjecting. I wasn't quite sure Senator what she was White's saying. Question. Um, I thank Senator White for the question. Recently, when I was in Darwin, my staff and I were following a land cruiser along the Esplanade that had a Do It For Dolly sticker on the back. It reminded me of the harrowing experience of Dolly Everett that no child should endure and the work that has been done since then to improve online safety. I do give the government former credit, uh, sorry, do give the former government credit, as does the Prime Minister, for the work they did in this space. And maintaining online safety is a core priority for the Albanese government. That's why we are supporting the eSafety Commissioner, Australia's independent regulator for online safety particularly as the eSafety Commissioner undertakes critically important work to raise the bar for online safety and hold platforms to account for their actions to keep Australians safe, whether it is online, tackling child sexual exploitation material, combating cyberbullying and harassment or making dating apps safer, I think we can all agree that the work they do is absolutely critical for our society. However, despite the eSafety Commissioner's important role, I think senators would be astounded that eSafety has been operating without funding certainty thanks to decisions taken by those opposite. The fact is, sorry, Senator Henderson, are you interjecting? Senator right. Watt. Senator Watt. The, the fact is, eSafety has been relying Order. on non ongoing Order. or terminating funding. Sorry, uh, Senator Watt. McGrath. Minister sorry, Watt. interjecting. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senators, senators, order, order, order across the chamber. Senator Wong, order. Senator Henderson, order across the chamber. Minister Watt, please. Uh, Senator Henderson. I just wanted to put on the record that Senator Wong did Senator, actually invite me to say Senator something on Henderson, the record you know very about this well. matter. Senator Henderson, you. Senator Wong, 
You and every other senator in this place knows that it is disorderly to call out across the chamber. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, I think senators would be astounding that e-safety has been operating without funding certainty thanks to decisions taken by those opposite. The fact is e-safety has been relying on non-ongoing or terminating funding for years, and this was a deliberate design feature of the former Liberal and National Party government's budget policy. Can you believe that eSafety's base funding of $10.3 million has never been increased since eSafety was established in 2015? Thank you, and that's despite White. The widening time for powers every year. Has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, we know that funding clips, uh, cliffs were a deliberate design feature of the Liberal National Government's budget strategy. What does the funding profile look like for eSafety going forward? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Thanks, Senator White. After the 30th of June this year, it is astounding to know that thanks to funding decisions by the now opposition, eSafety and the eSafety Commissioner would face a funding cliff. In the Coalition's last budget, the overall funding for eSafety was forecast to drop Order. from $53.8 million down to $23.3 million, a more than 50 per cent decrease in funding to the eSafety Commissioner of our country. Like every budget announced in the last government, they went for short-term, non-ongoing measures and never addressed the structural underfunding of key agencies. Did the Coalition really think that once the clock turned over to the 1st of July this year, all the online exploitation material would just vanish from the internet? Did they really think that all of the misuse of dating apps, sorry, Senator Henderson, sorry, Senator uh, Henderson, Senator um, that all Senator the misuse Henderson. of dating apps, Senator Henderson, I've called you to order about three times. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly and they're disrespectful. Minister Watt, please continue. Um, these are the funding cliffs that we find littered throughout the budget, even when it comes to important issues like e-safety, another you, mess Minister, Labor the has time to fix. The answering has expired. As Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, Minister, I guess it's fair to say that Labor has been left to clean up the mess left by those opposite. Yeah. Uh, what is the Albanese Labor government doing to support online safety for Australians? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thanks, Senator White. And you're right. I mean, all week we have highlighted examples. Uh, of the former government's deliberate design feature of funding cliffs throughout the budget in my own portfolios of agriculture when it comes to biosecurity, emergency management, e-safety, my health records, the list goes on and on and on, where this government thought that miraculously the whole world would change on 1 July and important permanent functions were not going to need ongoing funding. And this is another example of it. Uh, the Albanese government is now undertaking the substantive work to ensure that the Online Safety Act is successfully implemented, together with the eSafety Commissioner. eSafety has been undertaking important work in relation to the basic online safety expectations outlined in the Act. Recently, they issued a second set of reporting notices to seven digital platforms on the steps they are taking to tackle online child sexual exploitation material. Every day there will be new challenges that emerge, and the Albanese government is committing to, uh, committed to continuing the important you, work to make Time online activity a safer Senator place. McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. On 9 February this year, the minister categorically ruled out any changes to the diesel fuel rebate in the May budget. Will the minister also categorically rule out further delays to road and rail projects in the upcoming May budget? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, again, we could have a discussion about the funding cliffs that were littered throughout the budget that was run by yourselves in agriculture and infrastructure uh, departments and things like that when it came to funding. But of course, all the future of all projects in, in the infrastructure portfolio will be revealed when the budget is revealed. Uh, and I know we're about to enter that period where we're going to see scare campaign after scare campaign from the opposition about what may or may not happen in the budget. Uh, we've actually got a government in place now that has uh, res a responsible budget practices, rather than funding cliffs, rather than booby traps, rather than mirages uh, of, of, of back-in-black budgets that turn out to be not so back-in-black at all. Uh, we're not out there preparing coffee cups, uh, unlike uh, some. Thank you, Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, on relevance, 
uh, Madam President, the minister was uh, he has already ruled in and ruled out uh, the diesel fuel rebate previously with respect to the May budget. My specific question was around further cuts and delays to infrastructure projects in the upcoming budget. Uh, thank you, and I believe the minister was being relevant. Uh, minister, please continue. Uh, thanks, uh, President. Now, what I can say to add to the comments that I've already made is that the Albanese government is ensuring that infrastructure spending is targeted and aligned with current capacity and resource availability in Australia's construction market. And what, can I, what I can always also tell you is that, unlike certain other people in this chamber and in this parliament, the Albanese government and our ministers will not be using colour-coded spreadsheets when it comes to allocating infrastructure funding. You won't be finding, you won't be finding reports from the Auditor General about that kind of activity. Um, what we will actually be doing is allocating infrastructure Order. funding on the basis of need. And you know what? I know, I know it's a bit of a touchy subject over in that little part of the building. I know it's a touchy subject. Colour-coded spreadsheets and sports rorts and infrastructure rorts and regional rorts, uh, urban congestion rorts, car park rorts. I mean, there's just so many rorts you forget the numbers. Um, but this government actually takes using taxpayers' money seriously. Uh, we, we intend to use it transparently and honestly. And what that actually means is that we will fund projects that are not in Labor seats. What an incredible suggestion that would be. What an incredible suggestion to have a government that is prepared to allocate money on the basis of need rather than on what colour they're coded on a spreadsheet. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mackenzie, first supplementary. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The thin skin. On 1 March 2023, Minister for Infrastructure told the National Press Club that she wanted Infrastructure Australia to, and I quote, produce a more refined, more targeted infrastructure priority list. Will Minister Watt categorically rule out projects being cut from the infrastructure priority list in the upcoming May budget? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister Watt. Um, well, thank you, Senator Mackenzie, for reminding us of the important institution that is Infrastructure Australia, an institution that was created by a former infrastructure of, minister of this country, a fellow by the name of Anthony Albanese. Uh, and the reason that Minister Albanese, as he then was, brought in Infrastructure Australia was to overcome the rorts of the infrastructure budget that we'd seen under the Howard government to bring back independence when it comes to decisions about infrastructure funding. I know um, it's a minister touchy Watt, issue. Minister please resume touch your seat. Uh, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On relevance, again, to cuts to the budget for projects, the minister has gone nowhere near the question, either previously uh, thank or you. now. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Just, I'll just rule on the point of order, Senator Wong, unless you wanted to. No, it, um, if I could make this submission, um, President, the, 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 the senator herself referenced Infrastructure Australia. She can hardly complain when the minister utilises that reference in his response. He's clearly been directly relevant. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Further to the point of order, and this goes back to the change that was made a number of years ago to the standing orders that shifted from answers to questions having to be relevant to answers to questions having to be directly relevant. And I submit, President, that a history lesson on the establishment of Infrastructure Australia just because Infrastructure Australia was mentioned in a question does not make it directly relevant. Order. Direct relevance actually requires turning to the substance of the question asked, not picking one or two words out of it for the convenience of the minister. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 May I suggest to leaders that they allow me to rule on the point of order? Um, I was, uh, indeed, I was going to remind Senator Mackenzie that the minister did reference uh, Infrastructure Australia, and I was going to draw the minister to the second part of your question. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And I can assure Senator Mackenzie and the entire Australian people that they can rely on the Albanese government to make targeted infrastructure investments in a fashion that we haven't been used to over the last 10 years. And as I was saying, it was the Labor government that invented uh, Infrastructure Australia to overcome the rorting of, of infrastructure budgets we'd seen from the Howard government. We've now had to restructure Infrastructure Australia because it had been distorted by the stacking with Liberal and National Party mates under the former government. There's a bit of a pattern here, isn't it? Every time there's a Liberal National government, it's stacking with mates, it's rorts. Every time Labor comes in, we have to clean up the mess and we're doing Thank it all you, over Minister. again. Um, Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. 
Oh, thank you. Um, can the minister categorically rule out any further cuts and delays to regional Queensland road projects to pay for the Albanese government's $7 billion Olympic Games venue deal with the Queensland Labor Premier? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Watt. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, Senator Gallo has, has reminded me that the funding that was going to be provided for Olympic infrastructure uh, that is going to be happening in the great city of Brisbane, in the great state of Queensland, where did that funding first come from, Senator Gallagher? Was there, was there some commitment made by the former government about that? Was it, I, I, was it the Liberal National Government that was going to contribute 50-50 funding Order. to the Olympics? Order. Or was it, so was it just the Liberals who supported the Order. Olympics infrastructure funding and not the Nationals? Or was it some of the Nationals and not some of the Liberals? I mean, re seriously, work out what page you're on. You're now up here asking us about funding uh, that your Watt. own government Minister committed Watt. to do. Please resume your order. Order. Um, Minister Watt, please continue. Yeah. Senator Canavan, no, I have just called the chamber to order. And Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, and I am very proud of the fact that I, Senator Chisholm and Senator Green, played an instrumental role in making sure that the Rocky Ring Road project is going ahead uh, and, and, the, and the contractors have actually supported the actions. Uh, we had a few little people out there in their usual cosplay dress-ups outside the parliament who did absolutely nothing, and a few people have actually got to work uh, and got the job Minister. done. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Order. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. If I could, if the chamber would indulge me, if I could just indicate, in you know, lovely news that while Senate question time was occurring, Senator Farrell's third grandchild arrived. Uh, so welcome to the world, Leo, Leo Farrell Malika, and congratulations to Mary and Jones. Yeah. Oh. I'll just wait for Oh, Senator Farrell. Uh, can I thank uh, uh, Senator Wong for those very kind comments, but uh, also say that in question time yesterday, I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senator Van in my capacity as the minister representing the Minister for Defence relating to the uh, Australian support for Ukraine. I've written to uh, Senator Van to provide additional information and I table my letter to Senator Van for the information of all senators. Well done. Yeah, That's your Hughes. question. What are you talking about? It's questions to the government today. And it is absolutely unbelievable the way that you come in here and just blatantly lie to the Australian people, hiding behind your broken promises and trying to look backwards and rewrite a history that never occurred. Well, it is just that extraordinary one. that you seem to have forgotten that a pandemic occurred. You seem to have uh, just forgotten— Just a point of order, Senator Hughes. Uh, the, 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 the senator is experienced enough to know that she has to withdraw that. So, Senator, Senator Hughes, I didn't hear the comment, but um, on the advice of the clerk, could I just ask you for the benefit of the chamber to withdraw? Ah, it was. All right. Can we just? This is not a conversation. I, the, the, I've had it relayed to me by the clerk that the phrase you the phrase you use with people cannot come in here and lie which means it's a reflection on a group that people may have come and misled the, cha misled the chamber. So for the benefit of the chamber, can I just ask I you withdraw, I withdraw, unlike you. some of my colleagues here, I will withdraw unequivocally. Uh, but I will say that uh, we come in here with an, a government who hides behind a litany of broken promises, uh, untruths told to the Australian people during the campaign, and come in here unable to either answer a question or when they do utter a sentence in any form or format, uh, it is constantly heavy on politics, heavy on excuses and very short on a plan. And I may just like to point out to those opposite, 
For Australians who are about to come off their fixed mortgage rates, who are about to require around twelve to twenty thousand dollars a year, depending on the size of their mortgage, that when they're looking to this federal government to provide them with some guidance, a plan, cost of living support, all they are hearing from you is petty political point scoring that is actually based in falsehoods. That no one opposite remembers the pandemic, no one opposite remembers that our economy actually came out of the pandemic 3.4 per cent bigger than it was going into it, that the cash rate was 0.35 per cent, that we had lower unemployment coming out of the pandemic than we had going into it, that we had strong G GDP growth and, in fact, we were one of the very few economies that maintained a AAA credit rating. So perhaps a history lesson is required, and not even a particularly lengthy history lesson, because it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't until you lot took the helm that the wheels completely and utterly fell off. But instead of putting together a plan, instead of doing some work, there's been a constant cry of government's hard and boo-hoo, we didn't get it right. But you know, the fact that we heard from uh, the finance minister prior to the October budget, and, and just for those listening or any of those in the chamber, uh, this government actually has had a budget. Yeah. So when they talk about budget and they talk about issues in the budget, this is their budget that contains the issues because they've had a budget. It wasn't an economic forecast. It wasn't a statement. It was a budget with lots and lots of budget papers because we all got them delivered to our office and we all went through them and then we had lots of budget estimates uh, in follow-up to Labor's budget. But we did hear from the Finance Minister time and time again and I'm not sure if it was 97 times. We might have to go back and check because during the election we heard 97 times that power prices were going to go down by $275, but we now know that wasn't true. That's not going to happen. To the point of the fact when Senator Farrell was actually asked, can you just say the number 275, he declined. It's not that hard, people. But we don't know if the uh, finance minister said 97 times, but she said an awful lot that she was going through the budget with the Treasurer line by line, line by line. So what does that mean? Does that mean she opened it up and flicked through and had a quick skim? We were told time and again that line by line this was going to be going through. So is it incompetence? Is it an ability to look into detail and understand what's written on the budget papers? How is it now that we have those opposite coming in and talking about mistakes they made in their own budget? Mistakes they made when they were the ones in charge on the Treasury benches, could not go through a budget, didn't know how to look at programs, didn't know what funding through to the forward estimates, which is actually, you know, this whole line you're all now wheeling out uh, of fiscal cliffs. I mean, we know that none of you sort of sat through Economics 101 for maybe more than half a lecture before it all got too hard, um, because that's the level of economic uh, comprehension that's demonstrated after day by day by those opposite. But terminating measures. Uh, they are a common tool used in a budget by responsible governments. It's just the way they work. Um, so I'm sure when we see in the May budget that those opposite may actually be employing similar methods, but when they do it, it'll be completely different because it's just the way the budget needs to be reported. No, it's the way budgets are done. And you have had your budget. Your budget was in October. You missed it. You goofed it. You got it wrong. You're not up to it. You can't get across the detail. And you know who's paying for this? The Australian people. And you're not giving them a plan. You're giving them excuses and petty politics than we saw from your front bench today. Senator Walsh. No, which uh, one? I'm happy to give either of you the call. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Ciccone, for your uh, generosity there. Uh, and uh, we, of course, welcome uh, the opposition's questions. You are indeed a gentleman, uh, Senator. Uh, we welcome the opposition's questions about our government's responsible approach to managing the budget, our approach to cleaning up the mess that was left behind from those opposite. Uh, 
our approach to dealing with the trillion dollars of debt uh, that you left behind with absolutely nothing to show for it. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, about our approach to dealing with all of that while we get on with our plans to build a better, stronger future for all Australians. Uh, our plans to support Australians with the cost of living. Uh, our plans to deal with the energy mess uh, that was left behind after 10 years of complete denial and delay uh, from those opposite. Uh, our plans to build a strong and diverse economy, making more of what we need right here in Australia. An economy that is powered by cheap and clean energy, a decarbonising economy. This week, though, uh, and every week, what we see from those opposite, the former government, uh, is that you are all about saying no. Saying no to the good ideas that we took to the election. Uh, saying no to the good plans that the Australian people supported at the election. Um, no to safeguarding our climate. No to safeguarding jobs in regions in transition. Um, no to even being part of the conversation about how we do that. Um, no to rebuilding Australian manufacturing and making more of what we need right here. No to building more social and affordable homes for those in need. No to homes for 4,000 women and children escaping family violence. Can you believe that the coalition is saying no to that? No to funding for urgent repairs to Indigenous housing. No to capping power prices last year um, after they said no to telling the Australian people before the election that prices were indeed about to rise. Um, so right now, uh, the coalition has just been reduced to being the party of no. No to being a viable party of government, uh, no to even being a viable opposition. Uh, now we know uh, that inflation, uh, and we know from today's figures that inflation uh, is moderating, um, but that it is still high uh, and it's still tough for Australian families and Australian businesses. We really know um, that it is hard out there for people, uh, and that's why our investments are so important. Um, investments in households, investments in industry, investments in the economy, uh, investments in the future of our country. Uh, our investments in cheaper childcare, for example, our investments in cheaper medicines, our investments in fee-free TAFE. Uh, and our investments in putting downward pressure on energy prices uh, and getting more renewables into our grid. Um, these measures are not only things that help households and businesses, um, they are also part of our plan to drive inflation down. Uh, and we've been talking this week as well about our plans to strengthen and diversify our economy, to rebuild manufacturing through the National Reconstruction Fund, a plan that is supported by everyone uh, except for the opposition, um, a plan that is all about creating the jobs of the future, a plan that's all about making more of what we need right here in Australia, a plan that is all about securing our supply chains uh, in critical sectors like medical manufacturing and defence. Um, it's all about making sure that we grab the job opportunities for the future for regions that are in transition. But who opposes that plan? The coalition. The opposition opposes that plan. They oppose the jobs of the future. They oppose jobs in regions. They oppose taking advantage of the jobs in renewables and in low emission technologies that we know are the future for our country. And they also oppose plans supported uh, by the rest of the parliament um, to uh, create the safeguard mechanism. Um, and this is a plan that industry supports, a plan that industry is keen to play its part in. Um, what people want is certainty, what they want is support, all they're getting from those opposite is no. Senator Nampa Chippa Price. Yeah, um, I think, Deputy uh, President. Um, yes, we hear a lot about plans uh, and we see very little action. And yes, we will continue uh, to oppose and say no to bad policy. We heard earlier Senator Colbeck, my colleague, asking 
Senator Gallagher about the October budget's forecast of 56 per cent increase in electricity bills for Australian households over the next two years, and whether the government believed that the actual increase would be higher or lower than that forecast. Senator Gallagher, however, did not simply give an answer to the question, instead informing this chamber that the budget figures would be updated in May and then taking the opportunity to try and lay blame at the feet of anyone else. Telling us that the figures will be released at a later date is not answering the question, but then I don't expect anyone from the other side to answer any questions legitimately. Um, we still do not know whether the government believes that their October budget forecast is in fact accurate. Instead of taking responsibility for the decisions of the Labor government that have contributed to the rising cost of living for Australians now, Senator Gallagher and the Labor government would rather hide the answer from Australians and hide from their responsibilities. This has clearly become the norm for this government breaking promises and then hiding the details while throwing the blame at everybody else. But this government cannot continue to run from their broken promises. They cannot continue to try to lay the blame at the feet of past governments when their own policies simply do not work. At least 97 times before the election, 97 times the government promised that it would cut Australians' electricity bills by $275, and of course they cannot even bring themselves to say the number 275. But the government has not only been unable to deliver on that promise, they've also overseen price increases. They've overseen the contribution of massive pressure and stress on the budgets of Australian families and will continue to do so as they pursue their renewable energy utopia. The reality is that energy prices are predicted to continue to rise at brutal rates that will have real consequences for many everyday Australians come this winter. This is no doubt in part due to the Labor Green attack on cheap and reliable energy sources such as coal, gas and oil, sources of energy that will still be required to back up the green dream of 100 per cent renewables so that when the wind stops blowing and the sun goes down, Australians will still be able to heat their homes and live their lives. While Labor and Minister Gallagher said dreams of becoming a renewable superpower, Australians can continue to struggle with the extreme cost of their decisions. The reality is that renewable energy sources like solar and wind are not cheap. They are not reliable. They are not powering Australians into the future. They are expensive and add extreme cost and pressure to the grid and leave Australians vulnerable to energy poverty and related dangers. Labor needs to acknowledge this cost to the, transi to the transitioning and be upfront with the Australian people about the pressures that will come with it. Instead, the Labor government continues to lay the blame on everybody else and anything else to avoid taking responsibility for their own failures. As was discussed in great detail, in the early hours of this morning, the previous coalition government had reduced emissions by 20 per cent on our 2005 base level and put Australia on track to beat our Paris Treaty commitments. The previous coalition government had met and exceeded Australia's Kyoto targets. The previous coalition government had committed to net zero targets by 2050 while working to ensure the energy security of Australians, delivering cheap and reliable baseload power to reach a cleaner future, while also ensuring Australia remains strong, prosperous and independent. So please, can the government please stop providing all these grandioso plans and can the Australian people see action to reduce Reduce their electricity and power prices. Senator uh, Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I think um, it's fair to say uh, that the very late sitting that we had last night, thanks to the filibustering by those opposite um, till four o'clock this morning, clearly is an indication about the quality of questions 
the quality uh, of questions Mc that Senator we have McGrath, from those opposite. Excuse me. Uh, Senator McGrath has a point of order. A point of order, Act, uh, the Deputy President. Um, the coalition was not filibustering last night. I would ask that Senator Coney withdraw that, uh, that outrageous and hurtful allegation. Well, I'm not sure it gets to outrageous or hurtful, but it's up to Senator Ciccone, but he will reflect on his language oh, if he doesn't feel like As always, right. Deputy President, I mean, I, I don't intend to hurt anyone, but certainly filibustering is an accurate description. But regardless, um, my, my point is the questions, the quality of the questions that we had today in question time by those opposite, uh, you'd expect from some others, predominantly in the crossbench, I must say, with the greatest respects to them, but the quality of the questions that we had from the coalition today were quite outrageous. You know, the fact that we had ministers after minister providing answers to questions that were put to them, particularly around inflation, around the cost of living and spending. But then the responses that we get from them today, from the coalition centres today, is just ignoring the fact that this government, it been in power for less than one year, has had a hell of a job of trying to fix up the mess of the last decade since you've been in. So to be clear, and I'll, it's always important to put facts on the table. And I know those opposite, particularly you know, some of my favourite senators there, three of them, that love facts on the table. So my first question is, who racked up a trillion dollars of debt, Deputy President? Who racked up a trillion dollars of debt and had nothing to show of it? The coalition. The coalition. Who had a spike in power prices and didn't even tell voters about it that did not even tell voters about it just before the last federal election. It was the coalition deputy president. And who spent almost a decade deliberately putting pressure down on wages growth? Who? The coalition. The coalition. And also, senators, who also spent almost a decade of actually telling the automotive industry to go away and not invest in domestic manufacturing here in Australia. That's right, Senator Chisholm, the coalition. So now that the Australian people have decided, well, actually, we want a change of government, we're now voting for a Labor government, an Albanese Labor government that is investing in health and education and in jobs and making sure our sovereign capability gets back up to scratch. Now that the Australian people have made that choice, those opposite come in here every single day that we sit here and lecture us, lecture the government about how why we are trying to clear up their mess and try to pretend that their mess never existed. They always are embarrassed about the problems that they created and don't want to take ownership over it. But yes, it is the case and a very much a fact that we were here till very late like this morning, 4.15 to be precise, listening to the contributions by those opposites on a number of bills that we had before this parliament. And it is also you know, a tip for those opposite, particularly the national and liberal colleagues, you know, being in opposition is hard. I understand that. It is always hard being on the losing side. I get that. I was there for three years. But I learnt a lot. I learnt a lot. And by learning a lot, I'm now on this side of the chamber with my lovely colleagues implementing reforms and changes in the interests of working people. And as a senator, I value working with everyone across the chamber, as you would all know. So I think it's actually much healthier for democracies, for parliaments, for chambers like this Senate, when we are actually all working together in the national interest, rather than this sort of short-term political point scoring that we see by those opposite. But the coalition makes it very, very difficult because I suspect when they get up every morning, go to their tactics and say, right, how are we going to say no to Labor's policy for reforms? How are we going to say no to make the, work, the lives of working people better? Their strategy, their tactics must be fascinating because you're having to deal with not only those on the sensible centre but then on those on the fringes who are constantly against, constantly against the interests of working people. So it is clear. How is it that when this government comes into this place, has an approach, how do we work with senators? Well, I hate to say it to those opposite, the only common sense that we get at the moment is from the crossbench, who are willing to sit down and work with the government to tackle the cost of living issues. 
to, co to, to tackle the investments in manufacturing and, in and also investing in the very people that elected us in this great place. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Deputy President. And, um, in, in joining this very um, illustrative um, and quite deep philosophical debate, I would like to contribute by, by observing that the answers that were given by, by the ministers to the questions asked by, by my coalition colleagues uh, were characterised by their, their lack of detail and their lack of information and, and quite frankly, by just not answering the questions at all. And if, if anything, question time today was a caricature of the government of Australia that we have at the moment. A, a government that is tricky, a government that is, that is not fulsome with the truth, if I'm allowed to say that, a Deputy President. Uh, and and, and I, I will take the interjection um, from Senator Dunham, a, a government who, who run from accountability and run from transparency. And, and if I may, and Senator Coney uh, touched upon the, the very important debate that started last night in relation to, to the, the, the government bill on, on, on safeguarding. And it is disappointing. It is actually quite sad that, that the journalists and, and people in this building were not able to hear my contribution uh, at three o'clock this morning, uh, because it was a very good contribution, if I may say so myself. But this, this, is what, this is what this government is about. They're using the guillotine like, like mad members of, of, of revolutionary France. Uh, and they're guillotining everything because they don't want transparency and they don't want accountability. And they do not want the opposition to be able to use, to use this chamber as the appropriate mechanism in which to analyse and which to, to discuss our views, our views on, on, on a very, very um, challenging piece of legislation. So it was disappointing that, that members of the Liberal National Parties were forced to give their speeches beyond the witching hour. And that is sad, but it shows the arrogance of this government, who will do dirty deals in the dark, dirty deals behind closed doors, dirty deals done behind closed doors with, with, with darkened windows in relation, in relation to the, the governance of this country but also the management of, of, of this chamber. And what is particularly disappointing about Question Time today and the debate last night is the number one issue in Australia at the moment is cost of living. And, and the Labor Party and their coalition partners, the Greens, fail to appreciate how cost of living is hurting Australians. And their solution, their solution, Deputy President, is not just a new tax, carbon, carbon tax 2.0. It is a giant throbbing tax, a massive tax that they're going to pick up in their hands and chase after every Australian and every Australian family and whack them over the heads. What we've seen from this government is they're giving a giant wedgie to Australians through their secret deals with the Greens. And that is wrong. That is wrong that they would treat Australians so poorly. It is wrong that they would treat this chamber so poorly when it comes to allowing opposition members to question, giant to, to question not giant wedgies, because uh, that's what the Labor Party, so that's what uh, the government is doing to Australians, is giving everybody a giant wedgie. But what, but what they're failing to do is the wedgie that is coming with people's power bills. This government promised before the last election 97 times that they would cut your power bills by $275. 97 times. So it wasn't with, with the Prime Minister you know, had a, a verbal burp and accidentally said something. This was a deliberate tactic. They get into power and instead of cutting your bills by $275, what, what the October budget showed was that power bills are going to go up by 56 per cent over the coming, the coming months. This, this is the modern Labor Party. This is the modern Labor Party who, 
who talk about the light on the hill, but guess what? There is no light on the hill because people can't afford the power bill to pay for the light on the hill. This is how the modern Labor Party have sold out working Australians, have sold out businesses across Australia. And this is why we will spend every day and every hour and every minute making sure that you owned what happened last night and this morning in this chamber. Thank you, Senator McGrath. I'll put the question. Those questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. I rise to take note of, the, of Minister Watt's response to my questions. Thank you. Every week I hear heartbreaking stories about students struggling to put food on the table, to pay for medication, to afford a train or a bus ticket, to pay bills. Week after week, students who are already battling to pay their rent are being hit with rent increases from greedy landlords. Students are working multiple jobs, cutting back on necessities and still barely scraping by. We hear about the severe financial stress and mental and physical toll that these daily pressures are taking on students. One 19-year-old QUT student says she hasn't eat, eaten fresh fruit and vegetables for at least a month and relies on instant noodles. She struggles to afford period products. At UNSW, hundreds of students are lining up in queues for free food. Students are trying their best, but they still can't make ends meet. And this government is effectively telling them, we can't afford to support you, but you won't believe what we can afford for the wealthy. $254 billion in tax cuts. This is a government that has turned their back on young people and students. I can't remember a time when students were doing it this tough. And it should be clear to anyone with a conscience how difficult it is to be a student at this point in time. People are electing Labour governments because they desperately want change. But Labour is looking away. Labour could choose to raise the rate of income support payments to $88 a day and lift students out of poverty. Labour plays the big game on housing, but Labour's housing bill does nothing for renters and it will see the shortage of affordable and social housing actually grow. Labour could take immediate steps to relieve the burden of student debt by freezing indexation and raising the minimum repayment income. Student debt is already locking people out of the housing market, stopping them from getting married or starting a family and crushing dreams of further study. Student debt is stopping young people from living the carefree, fun lives that all young people should live. It's stopping them from enjoying university, from pursuing from pursuing hobbies, socializing with friends, and just having a good life. Student debt is having a disproportionate impact on women because they earn less and they have more debt. And it will get much worse in June when student debts are set to be indexed by 7%. Millions of Australians will be hit with more debt. They can't keep up because student debts are now going up faster than they can be paid off. So many people have spoken about rising student debt, and I want to read out some of what they've said. I often wonder how long it will take me to pay off my debt. My husband and I are barely able to keep up with the rising cost of living. Abolishing indexation, at the very least, would help lessen the pressure of living expenses and help me catch up with paying off this burdensome debt. Another one says, I doubt I will be able to keep up with, this, with the indexation. Mostly, I just feel stupid for believing what I was told as a child, that I needed to go to uni for a good job, only to end up with a debt that goes up by $2,500 a year. And another one says, now we are seeing nothing but increase, increase, increase. With those increases, they don't understand that it, is not, only, it not only affects physical health, it removes resources and access to so much, and it stigmatizes low socioeconomic students. Despite this, the government is sitting on its hands and saying it won't do anything because the university accords process is underway. Well, that's not good enough. This process and its implementation will take years. People are struggling now, and they need relief now. This government can abolish indexation and raise income support payments. We have a progressive parliament right here, and that will wave through these measures to support students. Labour is actively choosing not to provide support for those struggling the most, but can give $254 billion to the wealthy in tax cut and commit to another $368 billion on nuclear attack submarines. 
These choices make it clear that when it comes to substance, we still have a neoliberal government which chooses austerity for people and the planet and abundance for billionaires and the war machine. Be better, Labour. I've put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator White, I believe you're seeking the call. I am. I have two matters, President. Uh, first, the uh, President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for two sitting days after Andrew. today, proposing the disallowance of the telecommunications amendment, dis disclosure of information for the purpose of cyber security regulations 2022, and business of the Senate notice of motion number one for five sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission amendment code of conduct and banning orders rules 2022. That's the first matter, uh, President. Thank you. The second matter is um, I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission on proposed recommendations for the appointments to, to the Commission. I still seek leave to make a statement of not more than three minutes relating to the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator White. I rise as chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission to speak about the committee's report on proposed appointments to the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The committee was recently established to provide parliamentary oversight of the forthcoming commission. Under the National Anti-Corruption Commission Act 2022, one of the, commission, uh, the committee's roles is to consider the Attorney General's proposed recommendations for the appointment of commissioner, deputy commissioner or inspector of the commissioner. Uh, commission. On the 10th of March 2023, the Attorney General referred to the committee proposed recommendations for the appointment of the of the Honourable Justice Paul Brereton AM RFD as Commissioner on a full-time basis for a period of five years, Ms. Ms. Nicole Rose PSM as Deputy Commissioner on a full-time basis for a period of five years. Dr Ben Gauntlet as Deputy Commissioner on a full-time basis for a period of five years, and Ms Gail Furness SC as Inspector on a part-time basis for a period of seven years. I am pleased to report that the committee has, has unanimously approved each of these proposed recommendations. This enables the Attorney-General to recommend each of these appointments to the Governor-General. This, this is indeed momentous, as these are the inaugural appointments to the, these positions. Earlier today, the committee wrote to the Attorney-General to inform him of, him of this decision, and I am now tabling uh, this report for the benefit of, all, benefit of all senators. The committee's task, which was to approve or reject them in the Minister's proposed recommendations for certain appointments is uncommon among parliamentary committees. I thank committee members for approaching the task thoughtfully. The committee undertook significant due, due diligence to assure itself of the suitability of the candidates. This, is, this included consideration of the qualifications for appointment that are set out in the Act. To allow committee members to properly carry out their due diligence, the committee notified the Attorney General that it required an additional time to consider his proposed recommendations. Considering the government's intention to ensure the Commission commences operation by mid-2023, I'm pleased that the committee members worked promptly to conclude their deliberations without using all the available time. On behalf of the committee, I wish to thank the candidates for putting themselves forward to lead the Commission when it is established later this year. This is indeed a momentous task, given the crucial role the Commission will perform in Australia's integrity framework. I also wish to thank the Attorney-General and his department for providing information to support the committee's deliberations. The committee looks forward to the commencement of the commission later this year and to providing ongoing oversight in accordance with the Act. Senator White. Um, Senator Slade Brockman. I seek leave to make a short statement. Um, three minutes. I don't think I'll need that time. On the same matter. Senator Brockman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wish to start by thanking all uh, the members of the NAC committee, but particularly the chair of the NAC committee, Senator White. Uh, setting up a new committee uh, in a space such as this is not 
uh, necessarily the easiest process, and there are always matters that do need to be ironed out uh, until committees, to use a very poor sporting analogy, find their line and length, uh, particularly when you are uh, in a quite unique relationship, as Senator White pointed out, uh, with uh, a member of the executive, in this case the Attorney General. So these committees, and there are a number of them in this place, but uh, the one that I'm, I'm closest to obviously as chair is, is Privileges Committee. It is so important that these committees act in a collegiate fashion, but more than that, act in a non-partisan fashion. Uh, matters such as privilege, such as the operations and oversight of the anti-corruption committee, will fail if they become partisan playthings. They will fail if they become partisan playthings. So it's very important that such committees operate in the collegiate manner. Now there were some matters that we discussed, and I want to uh, uh, internally. Uh, I won't talk about what they were. And they were more matters of process, and they certainly had nothing to do with the appropriateness of the candidates. Uh, but there was uh, some issues that needed to be considered by the committee. They were, that was done in a very timely way. And I think in the end we have reached a very positive position and I think the committee has shown it can work very well together. Uh, like Senator White, I do wish to thank all those who put their names forward uh, for positions on the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, these roles are going to be vitally important uh, going forward and they have a huge challenge ahead of them. So we thank all those who put their names forward and congratulate those who have been appointed today. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. I too seek leave to make a short statement in relation to that matter. Uh, leave is granted. Senator Shoebridge, three minutes. Yes, 15 minutes. Excellent. No, three, three minutes, uh, Senator Shoebridge. And the, the clock is ticking. The, um, so the clock is ticking. Thank you, President. Um, I, I, I first of all want to um, thank and commend the chair and the members of the committee for the process we, we undertook over the last two and a bit weeks. Um, I do particularly want to note the, the leadership of the chair, um, who I think um, brought the committee um, to what is ultimately a consensus position to confirm all the appointees to these four important positions in the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, it was essential that we had this as a consensus position because we need to ensure that the NAC um, is established and starts with as broad a political support and consensus as we can have. Um, so I think it's a credit to the committee, um, the, at least the other members of the committee, um, as well as the chair, that we eventually arrived at a consensus position. And that reflects uh, the quality of the candidates who were put forward before the committee. Um, but as, um, as has been touched upon in an earlier contribution, um, there are lessons to be learned from the process that we went through. Uh, the committee required an extension of time to enable it to get appropriate information. Um, there were at times, I, I, I know I, I don't think I was the only member of the committee who was frustrated about the timeliness of the information and the provision of the necessary information for us to do our statutory task um, under section 178. Uh, but what I would note, President, is that from my observation, each member of the committee, regardless of where their politics mm -hmm. lies, government, opposition, crossbench, understood we had an important obligation to fulfil under section 178 of the Act. And I think we worked through those issues together in a collegiate manner um, to get the information we needed um, to exercise that function and scrutinise the appointments. But I, I do want to stress, I think there are lessons to be learned. I think um, a mutual respect between the executive and the parliament when these um, statutory functions cross between the executive and the parliament is necessary. At times I've, I felt that was a little strained, that re relationship in the exercise of the committee's powers um, and, and its role and function. I hope those lessons have been learned. But I, but I end on this. It was a consensus position amongst all members. And again, I think the chair helped map the pathway to that um, over the course of two and a bit weeks. And I hope that this is an indication that when the NAC opens its doors, 
it has, uh, I hope, unanimous or near unanimous support um, for its functions, its roles, and for the officers who undertake those important functions. Uh, Senator Dunningham. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the government's amendments to the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023 as circulated in the Chamber. Is leave granted? No. Leave oh. is not granted. Senator well then, Dunningham. in that case, pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of the Leader of the Opposition, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the Government's amendments to the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and President. I think it is imperative that this chamber focuses in on its role, which is a role to scrutinise the government, its legislation and the dirty dodgy deals it does with its bedfellows, the Australian Greens. We were promised scrutiny, we were promised transparency, and indeed it was something that the Australian Greens also promised and always talk about in terms of integrity and conduct when it comes to legislating on behalf of the people of Australia, the people that send us here to do our jobs. Sadly, though, we are being denied the opportunity to closely examine amendments to a bill, a hallmark piece of legislation that this government has been talking about, singing from the rafters about telling everyone it's going to fix every problem every Australian household and business faces when it comes to the cost of energy and, of course, when it comes to carbon emissions. But during the debate that we've had over the period of time since the bill was in, uh, tabled and introduced in the other place, our friends here in the Greens have been cooking up a secret deal with the Australian Labor Party, the government, to make this bill worse in the name of just getting this bill through this week. It's going to drive up power prices. It's going to offshore emissions. It's going to ensure that people are without jobs. And this crew here, the Labor Green government, the people that run this brave new world of accountability and transparency, and I say that with my tongue firmly implanted in my cheek, don't want us to know about it. We got the amendments this morning just before debate in the committee stage of the bill commenced. That's outrageous. What contempt for the role of this chamber and the people that occupy it. Why can't we see in detail these amendments and what they mean? Why can't we go out and speak to the business community before we are forced to vote on this bill at the end of this week? Why can't we actually go out and talk to the environmental groups about what it means? For instance, the Bob Brown Foundation might have a strong view on this. I'd be interested to know what they have to say about this particular set of amendments that were cooked up in a smoke-filled room somewhere in the bowels of this building between two parties of government, the Labor Party and the Greens. Why won't you let us do this? I would love to delay this bill to enable such scrutiny to occur, because I tell you what, I think it's the very least we owe the Australian people. This is, of course, in response to a government that went to the election promising that they were going to reduce power bills for all of you by $275. Now, that was a promise made 97 times, and despite our best efforts, not a single person on the front bench or any of the back benches will utter that number, because it's a promise they knew they couldn't keep, and it's a promise they know that this legislation that we are dealing with in this chamber at the moment and these secret, dodgy, dirty amendments that have been made to this bill will not help achieve. They knew they were going to con the Australian people at the election. They knew they weren't going to be able to deliver on this promise. They gave everyone false hope when it came to ensuring they could meet their cost of living pressures balance their own household budgets, keep the heaters and lights on during winter, put food on the table and make sure that the economy continued to function, that businesses could remain competitive. But instead what they've done is that they have gone and cooked up this dodgy deal, amendments that have been talked about, and the minister in the committee stage on this legislation said we announced the amendments on the 27th of March, but we're only going to give them to you today as debate in the committee stage is commencing, I've only just been able to read the supplementary explanatory memorandum, and I think it is outrageous that this government would be so arrogant to think, well, you know what, stuff you all. You don't need to understand a single thing in the amendments. You don't need to understand the EM. You don't need to know what this means for the people you represent, because they don't deserve it. We're in government. We will rule. 
and we will tell you what will get through this place, because we've got the numbers with the Greens. That's what happens. And I should know, as should any Tasmanian senator here, when Labor and the Greens get together, this is what they do. They cook up deals, bad deals, and they send the economy backwards. And that will generate bad environmental outcomes too. I might add, and this is why people like former Senator Bob Brown have been so outspoken about this legislation, and people have been tweeting about how bad it is. So I say, please, have a shred of decency, Australian Labor Party. Perhaps the Greens will side with us, and we can send these amendments off to a committee for examination. Perhaps we can have some transparency, some integrity in this process. Perhaps we could make you guys deliver on the promise you made 97 times ahead of the election. It's what you owe them, and you should deliver on it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, President. And I must say Senator Dunningham is the sort of modern face of the Liberal Party, very articulate, um, presenting a different face to what we had as the previous government. wasn't a minister in the previous, previous government. But the reality is, is that the position of those opposite is still the same. At the, at the end of the day, the reason that they are opposed to this and they are using every trick in the book to try and delay and obfuscate is they do not believe in taking action on climate change. That is the fundamental principle from those opposite. They do not want to actually pass this legislation, so that is why he is looking for every delaying tactic in the book. And the fact of the matter is, by doing what he has done now, he is delaying further the ability to get into the committee stage and ask the questions that he wants. So it is um, stunt after stunt, filibuster after filibuster, because at the end of the day, they have learnt nothing from the election last year. They've taken no lessons from that. They've taken no lessons about wanting to take action on climate change because they are so divided in their own show. They are so divided in their own show. So we've seen the federal election result last year. We've seen uh, the New South Wales election result only a couple of days ago, uh, where the Liberal Party, the Liberal government, was defeated there. But they still come into this chamber and want to use every delaying tactic they can, uh, every trick in the book, because at the end of the day they do not want to see serious action taken on climate change. Uh, that is what we took to the election. That is what we intend on delivering in government. Um, people are sick and tired of the games of those opposite. Um, we will not stand for it, and I move that the question be put. Um. Uh, yes, um, he, he may do so, and he's done. Uh, so, am I going to put the question? So, the question is that the uh, suspension motion be put. Sorry, <laughs> the question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Div division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator uh, Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now put the question. So Senator Dunningham moved a motion to suspend. So the question is that those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. And.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the um, motion to suspend is moved by Senator Dunning and be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. There being 27 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. A postponement notification has been lodged as follows. For general business notice of motion 197 in the name of Senator Rice from today to tomorrow. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I will now move to the discovery of formal business. and We will start with um, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. I ask the business of the Senate notice number one, proposing a reference to the Finance and Public Administration Reference Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. I move the motion standing in my name and the names of Senators Little, Napa Jimper Price, McGrath and Thorpe. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. So the question is that Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Cox. Seek leave to make a one minute statement about this motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Cox. Thank you. Um, I want to remind all senators that earlier today there were many conversations about the voice to parliament. Many of First Nations people in this country under 40 will be, have the first time to vote in a referendum. And this motion jeopardises the success of this referendum. It undermines the currency of the conversation that we're about to have. This cooked up terms of reference is being used to overshadow what is the national conversation happening at the moment, using our public funding, Senate resources and procedures, which is not the function of this place. We will not be supporting this vicious attack on our peak organisations and our grassroots organisations, and the Greens will be opposing this motion. Thank you, Senator Cox. So the question, uh, Senator Colbeck. Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is denied, Senator Colbeck. So the question is that uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck and other senators, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
calling you to order, please. occasions. Senator Nampajinka Price. Senator Thorpe. Lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck and others, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 29 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business, notice of motion number 214, standing in the name of Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 214 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Henderson. I move the motion. So, uh, Senator Chisholm? Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Chisholm. As the Senator is aware, the Department of Education has published 24 submissions where the author consented to publication. At the Minister's direction, the Department has now directly contacted each of the remaining 14 authors. So far, two have consented to their submissions being published, and they will be added to the website later today. If the consent of other authors is obtained, their submission will be published in the same way. But it would undermine the future consultation process to publish submissions without their consent. I understand that the Minister has discussed this with Senator Henderson last week and agreed for the bill to be referred to the Senate Standing Committee on Education and Employment for review. That review will take place next month and is open for submissions now. Like the motion before it, this motion is unnecessary. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 214 standing in the name of Senator Henderson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 214 standing in the name of Senator Henderson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I will now move to um, general business notice of motion number 217, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. No, just not. Senator Wish Wilson. I ask that general business notice of motion number 215 be taken as a formal motion. Seven. I called 217. 217 to be taken as a formal yes. motion. 
Thank you. So the question is that a general business notice of motion number 217 be taken as formal. Those of that opinion say aye. Is there any objection? There's no objection. Um, and just move it now. Thanks, Senator Chisholm. I move Shilson. the motion. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The the Senator government will be opposing this motion. Disclosure of material of the nature requested by Senator Wish Wilson would be contrary to Australia's national interests, including for the reasons that it may be prejudicial to the security or defence of the Commonwealth and could prejudice international relations. The nuclear reactors that power submarines are a proven and safe technology. The science and technologies associated with them are highly specialised capabilities that will support classified national security activities across government. Over more than 60 years, the United Kingdom and the United States have operated more than 500 naval nuclear reactors without a single radiological incident. A sophisticated security and safety architecture will surround Australia's nuclear-powered submarine program. Australia is unwavering in its commitment to safely and securely stewarding its nuclear-powered submarines. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 217, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 217, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 15 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 217, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Beg your pardon, 213. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 213 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The Senator government Chisholm. will be opposing this motion. Payments made under these programs are already publicly disclosed through the normal processes. 
This information can be found in the relevant annual, annual returns on the publicly available AEC Transparency Register. I know the Special Minister of State, Minister Farrell, would welcome the opportunity to assist the Senator in finding this publicly available information rather than taking up the Senate's time on this occasion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 213, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 213, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 17 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Now goes